Section One of Travels in Brazil, Volume Two, by Henry Coster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Travels in Brazil, Volume Two, by Henry Coster. Chapter One, Part One. Removal of the author to Itamaracá, the island conception and pillar the festival of our lady of the rosary journey to guiana the toque the cowpox a few days after i had sent the remainder of my people to itamaraca i gave up jaguaribe to its owner and rode to hesife where i remained for some days i had been introduced several months before to the vicar of itamaraca and at the time that i crossed over to the island to agree with the owner of amparo about my removal i made a visit to this priest and was received by him with the greatest cordiality as the plantation of amparo had no cottage unoccupied at that time or indeed that it was fit to be inhabited i requested the vicar to obtain for me a house in the town as it is called of our lady of the conception which stands the parochial church of the extensive vicarage he returned for answer that excepting his own residence of which he was willing to give me up a portion and the prison no dwellings could be met with however he desired that i would send a person to speak to him this i did and on the man's return the offer of the prison was accepted as i had written to mention the day upon which it was my intention to arrive there i was received by one of my people upon the shore of the mainland and the canoe which plies for the purpose of carrying passengers across was ready to take me the saddles were removed from the horses backs we entered the canoe and shoved off from the shore the horses swimming by the side of it the passage across is at this its most narrowest part about half a mile on landing upon the island we saddled the horses and rode for about one quarter of a mile along a sandy path which is bordered to the left by the water of the channel that runs between the island and the main and on the right by cocoa trees until we reached a narrow creek which is not fordable at high water and in this state we now found it i left the horses to the care of manuel until they could be passed conveniently whilst i followed the man who had come to receive me we proceeded over the bridge which was constructed of loose beams and scarcely safe even for foot passengers immediately beyond it we passed by several cottages with mango trees before them and then ascended the steep hill upon the summit of which stands the town built in the form of a square we entered in at one corner and near to my new habitation which was a large stone building much dilapidated with one story above the ground floor in the prosperous days of this settlement when its rank in the province was considerable this edifice was raised as a town hall above and a prison underneath but now that the decay of the place had rendered it unworthy of its former distinction the building was no longer kept in repair and was almost in ruins the island of itamaraca which is in length about three leagues and in breadth about two is situated at the distance of eight leagues to the northward of hesife and is entirely separated from the mainland by a channel of unequal width bearing from one league to half a mile the island does not contain any stream of water but in the neighbourhood of the town water gushes from the hill wherever it is dug for that which is obtained from the springs in the neighbourhood of pilar is not however good itamaraca is perhaps the most populous part of the province of pernambuco taken as a whole the immediate vicinity of hesifi excepted it contains three sugar mills which are well stocked with negroes and many free persons likewise reside upon the lands belonging to them in the year sixteen thirty the island contained three and twenty sugar works besides the lands attached to these works there are other considerable tracts which are subdivided among and owned by a great number of persons of small property the shores of the island are planted with cocoa trees among which are thickly scattered the straw cottages of fishermen and oftentimes are to be seen respectable whitewashed dwellings which are possessed by persons whose way of life is frugal and yet easy 
the salt works upon the island are likewise one great source of its wealth these are formed upon the sands which are overflowed by the tide at high water the long village of pilar situated upon the eastern side of the island is at the present day the principal settlement although that which is called the town of conception where i now resided standing upon the southeast side of the island claims seniority but its better times are gone by its situation was considered inconvenient others are at present preferred and if the parish church did not stand here and render necessary the presence of the vicar the place would shortly be deserted it now has a desolate neglected appearance an unpleasant stillness producing sensations of very different description from those which are excited by the quietude of a place that has never witnessed busier scenes its site is the summit of the southeast point of a high hill which rises almost immediately from the water's edge the square in which are situated the parish church my new residence the vicarage a low long whitewashed building and about fifteen cottages is very spacious but large pieces of ground now remain unoccupied the houses which stood upon them have been removed or have been allowed to decay and fall giving room to banana and tobacco gardens the centre of the square was covered with brushwood and a narrow path went along the four sides of it immediately in front of the houses which afforded to the inhabitants the means of communicating with each other there is one street branching from it and leading down towards the creek over which i passed on my arrival it is formed of small low huts and is closed at the end farthest from the square by a church which is dedicated to our lady of the rosary the patroness of negroes the harbour is good and the entrance to it is commanded by an old fort which is much out of repair the garrison is scanty and without discipline on one occasion i took a canoe and went down to the bar i wished to sound but my canoe man begged that i would not as it might bring him into trouble and indeed we were inside of the fort and the commandant is jealous being an elderly man and an advocate for the old system of exclusion the entrance of the port is formed by an opening in the hesifi or reef of rocks which runs along the whole of this part of the coast this opening is of considerable width and its depth will admit of large vessels but i could not obtain exact information upon the subject from the mainland on one side and from the island on the other two long sandbanks jut out of each side of the channel which separates itamaracao from the continent these banks are dry at low water and at neat tide are not completely covered they shoot out so far that they nearly reach to the surf the bar is easily discovered from the sea as it is immediately opposite to the channel or river into which it leads and as there are breakers to the northward and southward but none are to be seen at the place which is to be entered having entered the bar some small breakers will be seen ahead or rather towards the south side of the channel unless the tide is out and then the water is quite still these breakers are farther in than the outermost point of the south sandbank they are formed by some rocks which lie at a considerable depth below the water's edge i tried to reach them with a pole of two fathoms in length at low water during spring tides but did not succeed and my canoe man said that he doubted whether another fathom and a half would touch them the passage for large vessels is between these rocks and the north sandbank for the passage between them and the south bank only admits of small craft i could not learn that there were any other rocks or banks than these which i have mentioned the anchorage ground is opposite to the fort and on the outside of it but opposite to the town of conception which is farther in than the fort there is considerable depth of water some parts of the ground are rocky but others afford safe riding the magnificent prospect which may be enjoyed from the clumsy wooden balcony of the town hall compensates in some degree for the dismal state of the place in which it stands in front is an extensive view of the sea which is always enlivened by numerous jangadas and canoes sailing to and fro and occasionally by the large craft that trade between maranhão and hesifi and by ships arriving from europe or returning thither to the right is the broad channel immediately below and the bay which it forms on the opposite side with the picturesque village of camboya upon its shores and the pointed hill of the ingenio novo covered with wood 
rising behind it but as this hill does not extend far and rather rises in the form of a cone the river iguata azul runs along the plain and is now and then discovered but oftentimes concealed by the dark green mangroves these however point out its course and lead the eye to the white specks which beautifully mark the site of the higher buildings of the town of Iguarasu, peeping out among the vast expanse of wood of a lighter green which reaches as far as the eye can compass to the left is a narrow and deep dell bounded on the opposite side by a ridge of rising ground of equal height with that upon which the town is situated behind is a flat plain which runs along the hill to the distance of one league it is in places much contracted and in others spreads widely the town of conception was formerly fortified the three sides upon which it is enclosed by the steep declivity to be ascended in reaching it have been rendered still more precipitous even then they would naturally have been as they are cut perpendicularly to the height of twelve feet presenting a wall of earth to those who ascend the hill and as the soil is a stiff clay and the passing and the repassing not considerable the paths which have been formed through the wall are extremely steep on the fourth side entrenchments were made across the plain upon the summit of the hill these were shown to me for it was necessary that they should be pointed out as they were almost concealed by the brushwood and even large trees which were growing in them upon one spot on the quarter nearest the sea and now the side of a cottage is still plainly to be discovered the situation of a fort and a short time ago a gun which appeared to be of six pounds calibre was dug up the distinctions attending the rank of a town were removed some years past from hence to guayana and the only mark which conception still possesses of its former importance is the obligation by which the magistrates of guayana are bound to attend the yearly festival to the virgin at the parish church itamaracá is one of the oldest settlements of the portuguese upon the coast of brazil it was given to pedro lopez de souza who took possession of it in fifteen thirty one the dutch made an attack upon it in sixteen thirty and although they did not succeed in taking conception they built a fort which they called fort orange and this is the fortress which now exists upon the island however in sixteen thirty three the dutch dispatched such a force as rendered resistance hopeless the town of conception was yielded to them and with it the whole island in sixteen thirty seven the dutch deliberated whether the seat of government should be removed to the island this did not take place the opinion of those who proposed the plan were overruled but i cannot avoid thinking that it possesses many advantages of which Hesifi cannot boast the port of itamaraca may not admit of vessels of so much burden as the poso harbour of Hesifi, but the former is much more safe even than the mosquero port if brazil was to be at war with any naval power Hesifi might be destroyed with ease whereas if the town had been erected upon the mainland opposite to the island or upon the inside of the island it could not be molested by shipping for it would be necessary that a vessel should enter the channel before she could bring her guns to bear besides this advantage itamaraca and the neighboring shores of the mainland enjoy wood and water in abundance in the latter of which hesifi is particularly deficient in sixteen forty five joao fernandez vieira the principal hero of the pernambuco war attacked the island but did not succeed in dislodging the dutch the portuguese again attempted to regain possession of it in sixteen forty six they crossed over at a place called os marcos which is now a cocoa tree plantation and a large house is built upon it the property belongs to a portuguese cattle dealer who resides chiefly at iguarasu opposite to os marcos is the shallowest part of the channel the portuguese did not gain their point entirely but the dutch abandoned all their other posts to retire into the fort which was not surrendered to the portuguese until the expulsion of the dutch in sixteen fifty four i happened to arrive at conception upon the day of the festival the eighth of december however as i had many matters to arrange i did not see the ceremony in the church but was invited to dine with the vicar i went at two o'clock and found a large party assembled to which i was happy in being introduced 
as it consisted of several priests who are the men of most information in the country, and of some of the first laymen of the island. The dinner was excellent and elegant, and the behavior of the persons present was gentlemanly. I was placed at the head of the table as being a stranger, and a friend of the vicar took the opposite end of it, whilst he himself sat at one side of me. I never met a pleasanter dinner party. There was much rational conversation and much mirth, but no noise and confusion. The company continued together until a late hour, and indeed the major part of the priests resided in the house. The parish of Itamaraca has now for some years enjoyed the blessings which proceeded from the appointment of the present vicar, Pedro Gisosa Tenorio. His merit was discovered by the governor, whom he served as chaplain, and by whose application to the prince regent was obtained for him the present situation. The zeal of the vicar for the improvement of the districts over which he has control is unremitted. He takes pains to explain to the planters the utility of the introduction of new modes of agriculture, new machinery for their sugar mills, and many alterations of the same description which are known to be practiced with success in the colonies of other nations. But it is not every novelty which meets with his approbation. It is no easy task to loosen the deep-rooted prejudice of many of the planters. He is affable to the lower ranks of people, and I have had many opportunities of hearing persuasion and entreaty made use of to many of his parishioners that they would reform their habits if any impropriety of behavior in the person to whom he was speaking had come to his knowledge. His occasional extempore discourses on subjects of morality, when seated within the railings of the principal chapel, delivered in a distinct and deep-toned voice, by a man of commanding person, habited in the black gown which is usually worn by men of his profession, were most impressive. He has exerted himself greatly to increase the civilization of the higher orders of people in his parish, to prevent feuds among them, to persuade them to give up those notions of the connection between the patron and the dependent, which are yet too general. He urges them to educate their children, to have their dwellings in a state of neatness, to dress well themselves, their wives, and their children. He is a good man, one who reflects upon his duties, and who studies to perform them in the best manner possible. He has had the necessity of displaying likewise the intrepidity of his character, his firmness as a priest, his courage as a man, and he has not been found wanting. He is a native of Pernambuco, and has not degenerated from the high character of his provincial countrymen. He was educated at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. From the state of society and government in Brazil, the individual character of the person who holds any office of importance makes a wonderful difference, but indeed in some districts a man of an active mind with some wealth, but without any appointment, has more weight than a person in office of a contrary disposition, although the situation of the latter might give him great power if he thought proper to exert it. I passed some portion of each day with the vicar and his party. The conversation never flagged, and I often thought how very superior the persons were with whom I associated to any that my friends in England could suppose a country residence in Brazil to afford. I was myself agreeably surprised at the change which I had made from Jaguaribe. Among the visitors at the vicarage was João Ribeiro Pessoa de Melo Montenegro, professor of drawing to the seminary of Olinda, and the friend and disciple of Dr. Manuel Ajuda da Camara. This priest, during his stay at Itamaracá, crossed over to the mainland to say mass at the village of Camboa every Sunday and holiday. I accompanied him on one of these occasions, and we were paddled over in a canoe. We entered the cottage of a man of color, the chief person of the place. A hammock was hanging in the room, and into this my companion threw himself, and three or four children of the house quickly came to him, one or two of whom he took into the hammock to play with. The females made their appearance to greet him upon his arrival. He was a favorite, seemingly, with all parties, great and small. Indeed, I never met with one of more pleasing manners. He is generally beloved wherever he is known, but by the lower orders of people especially he is quite adored. I was long acquainted with him, both before and after the time of which I speak, and I never heard him make use of a harsh word to anyone. 
his manner and his tones of voice always indicate that goodness in him greatly predominated a free mulatto man of the name of bartolomeo once said to me in speaking of this priest if he sees a child fall he runs and picks it up and cleans its face and this he does not do because any one is in sight to see him act in this manner but because his heart so inclines him footnote por que o seu coração assim manda close footnote it is much to be lamented that his exertions have not been directed to obtaining a situation in which his excellent qualities might have a wider field for display but he is satisfied with what has been given to him i was much surprised at the manner in which even the people of color dress themselves to go to mass in all the villages if the family is in a respectable way of life the younger females wear on these occasions gowns of printed cottons english straw bonnets stockings also of foreign manufacture and neat shoes which are made by workmen of the country the young men appear in nankeen pantaloons and jackets of printed cottons shirts of cambric muslin hats of english make stockings and shoes indeed of late years since articles of dress have been cheap and have come into general use since a subject of immolation has arisen and the means of showing it has been afforded every hamlet sends forth its rival bells and bows i was disappointed with a near view of camboa but the country behind it is picturesque being formed of uneven ground which is for the most part covered with wood and cottages and mandioc plants are interspersed the village consists of one street composed of small dwellings the inhabitants are mostly related to each other and the free persons are of mixed blood the clan is large but there does not reside here any wealthy white man they are a quiet inoffensive people the old man at whose house we stayed whilst the neighbors assembled to hear mass was respected by all the rest he had the management of all their weighty concerns as being the richest person of the place though even his property was small and as he was connected in natural or religious relationship with a major part of the inhabitants when the priest and i went into the house we found a large party sitting round a table and playing at cards which these persons continued to do until the church bell rang and the priest went out to prepare for saying mass the majority of people of all classes excepting indians have a great propensity to gaming there lived at this village formerly a poor man who died of consumption dragging on for some time a miserable existence the opinion is general in pernambuco and other parts which i visited that consumption is contagious and from this notion any person so afflicted is immediately separated from the rest of the family a hovel is erected at a distance from any habitation and the miserable patient is removed to it and is shunned by every one even receiving his food without the bearer approaching the hovel i can conceive no situation more wretched than this to be in a weak and helpless state and to be forsaken to be doomed to solitude and to have perhaps for years no thoughts but those of death nothing to relieve the mind and to divert the attention i know not however whether the opinion of contagion respecting this disorder is totally founded on prejudice or whether there is some truth in it for i have heard from persons who are not liable to hasty decisions many stories which seem to indicate that there is some reason for the precautions which are taken they are doubtless carried too far they are insisted upon to a savage excess which fails not to bring to the recollection the custom of some tribes of indians who forsake their aged their infirm and their dying kinsmen i frequently visited the plantation of amparo which is conducted in the manner that i had attempted at jaguaribe but here it was performed with more system the owner of this place employed constantly great numbers of free workers of all castes but the indians form the principal part of them and as their master i suppose finds it impossible to keep them under due control for the wish to do so he must of course have the disturbances which are raised upon the estate which are entered into at other places by his men are very numerous footnote one of these indians was selling crabs at pasmado when a purchaser began to pick out those which he preferred but the indian stopped him saying don't begin to pick my crabs for i belong to amparo thus even the crabs which were caught by the dependents of this great man were to be respected Close footnote. but this person would have done much service to the country in general 
if he had managed to keep them in due order for in that case he would have proved the possibility of the introduction of free men as daily laborers without the opinion of their unruliness being unavoidable having been adopted by great numbers of the planters the state of amparo is often mentioned as an objection to hired laborers from the want of reflecting that in the instance in question the evil proceeds not from the plan itself but from its execution it is too true that the lower orders of people are unruly and upon slight provocations murders have been committed but does not this proceed from the propensity which the higher ranks show to protect those who reside upon their lands thus they display their influence with men in office when they plead for the pardon of a criminal and feel a considerable degree of gratification or of self-importance in the idea that an individual should have been preserved from punishment by their means even though he had only been treated according to his deserts if he had not been screened where government exists in a state similar to that of brazil wealth will meet with few obstacles in the accomplishment of its purposes whatever these may be footnote the dependents do not always show the respect which seemingly they ought to render to their patron one of the indians of amporo not he of the crabs met his master the owner of the place in the field near to the dwelling-house the indian took off his own hat to speak to his master but the same was not done by his superior however the fellow quickly performed this for him saying when you speak to people take off your hat quando se fala gente tira se o chapéu the master took this quietly and when the conversation ended his hat was returned close footnote in the month of january eighteen fourteen the vicar summoned me to accompany him to pilar to which i agreed with much pleasure the master of the grammar school ignacio de almeida fortuna who is likewise a priest was of the party he is a man of considerable talent and information his advantages have been very few for he has resided almost entirely upon this island and yet his knowledge is far from being limited and his love of it is unbounded we crossed the narrow creek which has been already mentioned and proceeded along a path under the shade of the cocoa trees until we made for the sands the sea has made great encroachments for about two miles in this part of the island we passed the mouths of two natural dikes into which the tide enters with great rapidity and is discharged again with increased velocity after a ride of an hour and a quarter we reach pilar which is distant from conception two leagues the village is composed of several irregular streets formed of small houses of various descriptions they are constructed of brick of mud and of cocoa leaves it is a place of some trade and is likewise frequented by the small craft which sail between hesifi and guayana the inhabitants support themselves by their fisheries by the hire of their jangadas and canoes and lately by the preparation of the outward husk of the cocoa nut for the manufactory of cordage which has been recently established in the vicinity of hesifi the fishery of pilar is of considerable importance the largest portion of the fish which is caught upon this and the adjacent coast is obtained by means of pens that are generally constructed near to low water mark two spaces of greater or less magnitude are marked off and stakes are driven into the sand at given distances in quadrangular form to these stakes are fastened large mats esteras of basket work made of thick twigs an aperture constructed in a similar manner to that of a trap for catching mice is left in the enclosure farthest from the shore opening into the second or smaller enclosure which is likewise an entrance on the land side from which it runs a fence of basket work to high water mark thus the fish that come in contact with this fence naturally continue along it in expectation of finding an opening by which to escape until they unintentionally enter the pen the jangadas also go out to sea and fish with the hook and line and many kinds of nets are used yet there is at times a great scarcity of fish which is rendered by the ordinances of the romish church an absolute necessary of life i was introduced at pilar to a portuguese gentleman of great respectability from whom i received in the sequel much civility the vicar also made me acquainted with a gentlemanly brazilian priest who was a young and well-educated man 
the former of these persons had been the juiz ordinario or mayor of pilar in the year eighteen twelve he had seen how dreadfully the want of due attention to the duties of this office had been felt on former years and now he was determined to act in the manner which his situation required he said that in building great cities the first public edifice which has or ought to be raised was the prison and therefore as pilar was becoming daily of more importance it was fit that it should have this requisite edifice he ordered a number of trees to be cut down and in a few days a roof was built of small but adequate dimensions and supported by some of these trees the remainder of the timber was to form the walls of the building after the manner of a stockade a rude door was likewise made and a pair of stocks was put into the place now he said pilar will thrive he apprehended some unruly fellows with his own hands he is a large and powerful man and the requisite though dangerous task of arresting the men who created disturbances was performed by him with apparent unconcern and as if he was occupied in any common occurrence of his life notwithstanding the acknowledged benefit which was produced by the administration of this man such is the state of government that interest was made to prevent his reappointment to the office on the following year and this influence was successful he was too upright a man to be liked by those who wished to have upon their estates a number of turbulent dependents the inhabitants of the island had entered into a subscription for building a bridge over the creek near to the town this work was undertaken through the zeal of the priests who resided in itamaraca and was about to be executed under the direction of the master of the grammar school i was much surprised in the beginning of the month of february at the arrival of the mulatto slave who had absconded in november he came alone and without the customary note from some person of my acquaintance requesting him to be forgiven he ascended the steps of the place in which i resided with perfect unconcern and with his knife in view and a stick in his hand begged to be pardoned i desired that some food might be given to him and he remained in the kitchen during the night however i could not help suspecting some evil intentions for i knew he had been staying upon the estate of a man who bore me no good will he went off by my order in the morning to assist three free laborers in the work of cutting up some trees that had been felled i followed him to the ground about ten o'clock as was my usual custom i called him to me under the pretense of wishing to have the curb chain of my bridle loosened he came and then i put one hand upon his head and with the other drew a pistol at the same time desiring him to throw down his hatchet and his knife which he did then i called to two of the freemen that they might secure him the mulatto's hands were tied behind his back and i followed him and his conductors to amparo from whence i wrote to my new friend at pilar forwarding the slave to that village he was there placed in the stocks until i could dispose of him which i immediately entered into measures for effecting I never saw him again. He was a bad fellow and had twice attempted the life of the persons under whose orders he was placed. He had run away in November from having drawn his knife and having threatened to stab the manager with it. There is another road to Pilar besides that which the vicar has taken me. It is through a place called Ingenio Velho, the old mill. Sugar works were formerly established here, but the lands are poor and the large red ants upon them are so numerous as to render their cultivation almost impossible so much so that scarcely any persons reside upon them many individuals of the lower classes first obtaining leave from their proprietor have attempted to rear crops of mangiac and maize upon them but their exertions have seldom enabled any one to prevent the plantations from being destroyed by the ants huts are to be seen out of which the inhabitants have been driven by these tormentors the shelter which the roofs afford is convenient to the ants, and under them they like to form the chief entrances to their cities. I never saw another situation in which this pest of Pernambuco had so completely taken possession of the land. Footnote. I do not know whether I might not almost say of Brazil, regarding Itamaracá, there exists the following adage. What is it that persecutes the island? The answer is, the being an island, the ants in Gales. Que te persegue Ilia? Ilia, Formiga, Gales. 
or in other words the inconvenience occasioned by being obliged to cross the channel from the mainland the ants which sufficiently explained for themselves and gave us these were a family of unquiet spirits who resided in the island and kept it in perpetual turbulence from their quarrels the remains still exist but now they are good and peaceable subjects close footnote the hillocks under which they had formed their nests were innumerable some of these were four feet in height and ten or twelve in circumference others were of less dimensions and some of them might be larger some ruins of the mill are still to be seen at ingenio Velho, and there is a pond near to them of considerable depth of which tradition says that great riches lie concealed at the bottom i also heard of an old african negro who has been manumitted and now practised the arts of a mandinguero in this neighbourhood among the lower orders of people i have heard his powers discussed it is said that he can cause the death of any one who is pointed out to him the unfortunate person will linger for a long time but his destruction is inevitable this old man is likewise a fortune teller and is applied to in cases of unrequited love End of section one section two of travels in brazil volume two by henry coster the sleeper recording is in the public domain chapter one part two in march took place the yearly festival of our lady of the rosary which was directed by negroes and at this period is chosen the king of the congo nation if the person who holds this situation has died in the course of the year has for many cause resigned or been displaced by his subjects the congo negroes are permitted to elect a king and queen from among the individuals of their own nation the personages who are fixed upon may either actually be slaves or they may be manumitted negroes these sovereigns exercise a species of mock jurisdiction over their subjects which is much laughed at by the whites but their chief power and superiority over their countrymen is shown on the day of the festival the negroes of their nation however pay much respect to them the man who had acted as their king in itamaraca for each district has its king for several years was about to resign from old age and a new chief was to be chosen he who had been fixed upon for this purpose was an old man and a slave belonging to the plantation of amparo the former queen would not resign but still continued at her post the old negro who was this day to be crowned came early in the morning to pay his respects to the vicar who said to him in a jocular manner well sir to-day i am to wait upon you and to be your chaplain at about eleven o'clock i proceeded to the church with the vicar we were standing at the door when there appeared a number of male and female negroes habited in cotton dresses of colors and of white with flags flying and drums beating and as they approached we discovered among them the king and queen and the secretary of state each of the former wore upon their heads a crown which was partly covered with gilt paper and painted of various colors the king was dressed in an old-fashioned suit of divers tints green red and yellow coat waistcoat and breeches his sceptre was in his hand which was of wood and finely gilt the queen was in a blue silk gown also of ancient make and the wretched secretary had to boast of as many colors as his master but his dress had evident appearances of each portion having been borrowed from a different quarter for some parts were too tight and others too wide for him the expense of the church service was to be provided for by the negroes and there stood in the body of the church a small table at which sat the treasurer of this black fraternity Hermandage and some other officers and upon it stood a box to receive the money this was produced but slowly much too slowly for the appetite of the vicar who had not breakfasted although it was now nearly midday for he and his assistant priests were to chant high mass therefore he approached the table and began to expostulate with these directors declaring that he would not go to the altar until every expense was paid I was much amused to see him surrounded by the blacks and abusing them for the want of punctuality in their contributions. There was soon an uproar in the church among the negroes. The vicar had blamed some of them, and now, when he left them to themselves, they called each other to an account, and the consequences were 
that many high and angry words passed between them and the church. It was a most entertaining scene to me and a few other persons who stood by and heard what was going on. However, at last their majesties knelt down at the railing of the principal chapel, and the service commenced. As soon as this was over, the new king was to be installed, but as the vicar was hungry, he dispatched the matter without much ceremony. He asked for the crown, then went to the church door. The new sovereign presented himself, and was requested, or rather desired, to kneel down. The insignia were given to him, and the vicar then said, Now, sir king, go about thy business. Footnote. Agora, senor he, vai te embora. Close footnote. As the king belonged to Amparo, the eating, drinking, and dancing were to be at that place. Consequently, in a short time our town remained quite quiet, and I little thought that I should soon be disturbed. About four o'clock in the afternoon, Francisco, one of my negroes, came running from Amparo, and he said that the people at the place were killing Manuel, who was fighting against a number of persons, by whom he had been attacked. I mounted my horse and proceeded to the plantation with all possible haste. I found Manuel tied to the middle of a long cord, of each end of which one man had hold, and these persons were standing in opposite directions for the purpose of keeping the negro at a distance from anyone. His face was covered with blood, and his clothes were much torn. I rode up to him and spoke to him. He turned round, as if to strike me, but when he discovered who it was, he cried out, It is my master, and now I care for no one, and then he again proceeded to his abuse of those who had maltreated him. Francisco soon arrived, and I sent Manuel home with him. The overseer of the plantation, for the owner was not at home, chose to take umbrage at some of my people who now arrived, because they were armed. I told him that they were perfectly right in coming prepared for the worst, but that I felt quite confident that not one person present would think of insulting me or any other white man, and therefore I sent my people away. He said that I judged correctly of his feelings, and some others stepped forwards to confirm the words of the overseer. The negro who had acted improperly had been provoked so to do by the behavior of some of the free persons toward him, but the affair would not have occurred if the overseer had done his duty, or if any man of weight and importance had been present. About this time I agreed to take a cottage with a small piece of land attached to it in the neighborhood of Conception. It was situated upon a shelf of the hill, immediately below the town and opposite to the village of Camboa. The break in the hill had only space sufficient to admit of the cottage in breadth, so that on either side it must be reached by an ascent or descent. The view from it differed little from that which was to be obtained from the town hall, save that now to the left the town and the church were to be seen half concealed among the banana plants and trees. All the hands in this neighborhood were subdivided among persons of several castes. That which immediately joined mine on two sides belonged to the vicars, and on the third side it was enclosed by the channel, whilst on the fourth a numerous family of free negroes possessed a small spot covered with cocoa trees. These latter people had been much impoverished by the obstinacy of the chief of the family, now deceased, in maintaining a lawsuit for many years about the boundaries of his plot of land. As soon as I took possession, one of his sons wished to commence law proceedings with me, in spite of several awards which had been given against his father. I began to make a fence around the piece of land which I had taken, and he immediately did all in his power to prevent me from accomplishing my object. However, as he saw that whatever he said was of no avail, he set off to Guyana to seek redress by law. This I discovered accidentally in the evening. In the morning at four o'clock I mounted on horseback and followed him to Guyana, accompanied by Fidelis, a Creole negro in the place of Manuel, who was disabled for some time by the occurrence which has been related. I proceeded through the plantation of Amparo, and reached the spot at which passengers embark in the canoe that plies between the island and the mainland. The tide was out, and we entered among the mangroves, through which a path has been made in the mud. It is dangerous to allow the horse to step out of this, as the slime is deep on either side. We stood at the water's edge, just beyond the mangroves, and hailed the ferryman, until he shoved off and came towards the island. The mosquitoes persecuted us unmercifully, 
during this delay and it was difficulty we prevented our horses from treading out of the path the channel is here much broader than near to conception but there is a bank near to the centre of it upon which when the tide is out the horses regain their footing but still the passage is distressing to the beasts however we reach the opposite bank in safety footnote in 1646, after the Portuguese had taken possession of the guardship at Os Marcos, they proceeded to that which was stationed at Itapisuma or Tapisuma, and this was burnt by the Dutch. History of Brazil, Volume 2, page 177. Close footnote. Here stands the village of Itapisuma, which consists of a long street, situated near the water's edge, and running parallel with the channel it is composed of small low houses a narrow path took us to the village of pasmado a distance of two leagues where we entered the great cattle road we crossed the river of arta ipe passed through the village of bu and about midday stopped at the hamlet of fontaninas here i put up a cottage and on inquiry found that there was some dried meat to be sold at a neighboring hut some of this was purchased and was cooked for me by the good woman of the cottage the people of Pasmado are famous for their proficiency in the working of iron. The knives which are made at that place are in great request all over the country, and although these are a prohibited article, as I have before mentioned, still they are made publicly at Pasmado, and indeed at many other places in the country. Whilst I was at Fontainas, three armed men came to the door with a fourth person whom they had taken into custody under a suspicion of his being a horse-dealer. It was proved that he had been seen in company with a man of this description, but he made it appear that he had been hired by him to assist in conducting some horses, without his having any knowledge of their being obtained irregularly, and therefore they set him at liberty. During the whole of my stay in Pernambuco, I only heard of two or three instances of houses being broken into, and scarcely of any murders that were not occasioned by quarrels or had been committed in revenge but cattle stealing is common i constantly heard of thefts of this description footnote a man of color with whom i was acquainted possessed several tame oxen some of which with a cart he used to hire to the planters by the day and one or other of his sons attended to drive them two of these animals were stolen and a suspicion falling upon a man of reputed respectability in the country who had rented a sugar plantation not far distant one of the sons of the owner of the oxen determined to try to ascertain the fact he dressed himself in leather as a disguise and rode to the dwelling of the person in question where he arrived at dusk the master of the house was not at home but he spoke to the housekeeper saying that he had just arrived from the sertam with cattle on sale which would reach the neighborhood on the following morning. He requested to know if she thought her master would purchase his drove. She answered in the affirmative, but said that he had better stay all night for the purpose of seeing the intended purchaser, who would arrive the next day. The false Sertanejo told her not to be uneasy about his accommodation, as he would sleep in the mill to which he rode. And there he remained very quietly during the early part of the night, when all was still he began to search for the hides or horns of his oxen the former would be recognized by the private mark which was made as is usual with the red-hot iron upon the right haunch and the latter he knew from the peculiar bore of their tips by which they were in part harnessed to the cart for he had bored them himself and was in the constant habit of driving these oxen besides tame oxen are so seldom killed that if he found any horns which were bored he might presume that they were those of his beasts he had given up his search and almost all hope of finding what he sought when as he lay in the hammock he happened to cast his eyes upward and saw two fresh outstretched hides hanging to the higher woodwork of the mill he scrambled up the timbers with a lighted piece of wood in one hand and moving this to and fro near the hides that it might give a better light he discovered that they bore his father's mark. He lost no time in cutting from both of them the pieces which contained the mark, and carefully preserving these, he mounted his horse about two o'clock in the morning and rode home. He kept the bits of leather as trophies, 
and showed them in proof of his former assertions respecting the person who had stolen the oxen but neither did he obtain nor did he expect to obtain any redress these transactions occurred in eighteen eleven and within five leagues of hesife close footnote in the afternoon i reached goyana and on the following day presented my papers to the juiz gifora as soon as i had accomplished the end for which i had come i returned to itamaraca whilst i was at goyana an english merchant vessel called the elizabeth had been on shore about the south sandbank of the harbour of itamaraca she had been chased by an english ship of war under the supposition that she was an american and the merchant vessel acted under the same idea regarding the pursuer the master made for the harbour of itamaraca and ran the vessel ashore and the mistake under which both of them had been acting was not cleared up until the ship of war sent a boat on board she floated at the height of the tide and proceeded to hesife without much damage many of the people of itamaraca put off in their jengadas for the purpose of rendering every assistance in their power but were very indignant at the crew refusing to admit them on board this i supposed proceeded from the fear of being plundered and of salvage being claimed as occurs frequently upon the coast of ireland in cases of distress but far from any mischief being intended i am confident that a mere trifle a few gallons of rum for instance would have satisfied those who went to offer to assist after my removal in april to the toke for so my new dwelling was called i led a life of quietude and to one who has not known other countries and does not feel that a residence in brazil is a species of banishment it would be a life of great happiness i went out young and therefore had few unpleasant feelings of this kind to conquer but when i reflect upon the line of life in which i had taken my station i am happy that i was removed the climate in particular fascinates every one the heat is scarcely ever disagreeable and the power of the sun is rendered less perceptible by the freshness of the sea breeze the coolness of the night too removes all lassitude if any should have been felt i have often sat at my door when the moon has been so clear as to render reading by her light though somewhat irksome still not difficult when the night has been dark i have watched the lights which were to be seen upon the sandbanks that proceed from the land on each side of the entrance of the harbour they were frequently at low water by numbers of persons in search of shellfish the appearance was singular for the light seemed to float upon the water the house in which i now dwelt was a long low building situated as i have before observed upon a narrow break in a steep hill it was constructed of timber and mud and the eaves of the cottage were on one side about five feet from the ground and on the other they were only three feet the door and window were in the gable end and fronted the sea the principal apartment was furnished with a few chairs and a table a trunk containing my books and also a large chest in which were deposited the farina and the beans for the weekly consumption of the establishment in one corner likewise stood a large jar of water and upon a peg immediately above the jar was hung the usual ladle of the country this is formed of the half of the inner shell of a cocoa-nut and it has a long wooden handle fixed to it some rich persons make use of silver cocos as these ladles are called the room which i have attempted to describe two cabins or very small bedchambers and a kitchen included the whole building at one side were erected a stable and two apartments which remained unfinished when i came away beyond the cottage was the shed which covered the apparatus for making the farina and yet farther back in the same direction the negroes had formed their huts of mud and cocoa leaves i was now still nearer to the channel and so immediately above it as to see every canoe or raft which passed to and fro the land about the house was covered with brushwood and tall cocoa trees and there was likewise a few acajou trees however the small wood was soon cleared away and the view on every side remained unobstructed the first business of the morning was to see that the people went out to work at the proper time then the stable and other matters of the same kind were to be attended to 
for in everything which is to be done by slaves the master or his deputy must keep his eye as much upon what is going forward as possible after this i breakfasted and then either read or rode or mounted my horse and rode to the spot upon which my people were at work i dined about two o'clock and afterwards sat in my hammock smoking any of the secondary people or of those in the lower ranks of life would sometimes about three or four o'clock come to speak to me upon business or to ask or communicate news and so forth soon after four o'clock i usually rode out again to see the work and returned about five or half past the remainder of the daylight was often expended in reading and at times the vicar or someone else would come and sit with me until seven o'clock sunset in retired situations usually produces melancholy feelings and not less unpleasant was this period under the circumstances in which i was placed the negroes were coming home straggling from their work fatigued and dirty the church bell tolled dismally at intervals that all catholics should count their beads the sea looked black and the foliage of the trees became rapidly darker and darker as the sun sank behind the hills there is scarcely any twilight in those regions the light is in a few minutes changed into darkness unless the moon has risen her light is not afforded gradually but her power is perceived very shortly after the setting of the sun in the evening i sat and smoked in the open air and if it was at the time of spring tides i had a fire made to the windward on account of the mosquitoes and of a very diminutive species of black fly which is called the maroim of which the bite is as painful as that of the mosquito the last species of insect is there called morisoka the maroim is usually to be seen near to mangroves if these tormentors were too troublesome to be endured or if i was so inclined i would close my door and window and, and read or write until ten or twelve o'clock and then go to bed but frequently i would lie down in my hammock and rest in it unintentionally during the greater part of the night my time passed less pleasantly during the months of june and july owing to the rain and to the removal of the vicar of hesife during that period through his persuasion and from the gradual disposition of the feelings of the people in favor of the measure two boys resident at conception were sent to hesife for the purpose of being inoculated with the cowpox as soon as they returned the surgeon of iguara Asu, a young man of considerable merit who had been educated at lisbon came over to the island to inoculate any persons who might be inclined to undergo the operation among the children it was almost general their parents and friends were told that the disorder was not infectious and consequently no precautions were taken in separating those who were under its influence from the other inmates of the same cottage soon afterwards an elderly woman the attendant of a child who had been inoculated fell sick and died and other persons were likewise afflicted with the same disorder the infection spread and ten or twelve persons died of it in the island the evil indeed was stopped only by the inoculation of great numbers of the inhabitants it was observed that none of the individuals who had been inoculated had been in danger and therefore it was soon seen that the wisest plan was to undergo the operation a few however were so much alarmed at the fate of some of their acquaintances that they lived for many days in the woods scarcely visiting any habitation of man in the dread of infection it was proved that the smallpox did not exist at that time upon the island for every inquiry was made much pains were taken by many persons of zeal and activity to certify that this was the case and indeed when that dreadful malady appears in any neighborhood the whole country around is alarmed and every precaution is taken to prevent communication now it is generally said that either the boys who had been sent to hesife were inoculated with the smallpox instead of the cowpox or that the cowpox degenerated and became an infectious disease the boys received the matter from a newly imported negro who had it is true been inoculated with the cowpox but he might have had the smallpox upon him at the time though it had not made its appearance it is from the newly arrived africans that the smallpox is often spread abroad about the country after the country has had a long respite from this dreaded disorder one man who resided near conception 
caught the disease and died he had only sat for a short time in an outward room of a house in the interior of which some children were confined who had been inoculated the unfortunate result of this trial of the new disorder riveted many persons in their prejudices against it and others who had strenuously recommended its adoption began to stagger and to fear that they had been deceived however as none of those who were inoculated had been in danger the people did not appear to have taken a thorough dislike to it to me this was a most anxious time my establishment of slaves and free people consisted of twenty-five persons of whom scarcely any had had the smallpox they were too many to inoculate at once and therefore i cut off all communication with my neighbors this was done without much difficulty manuel was armed and was ready to prevent any one from approaching the place and this i could do without injustice for the path led only to the house i had several fierce dogs which were all let loose on this occasion notice being given to the neighborhood of such a measure having been adopted considerable zeal has been shown by the supreme government of brazil in the introduction of the cowpox into the country an establishment has been formed at recife consisting of a physician and two surgeons for the inoculation free of expense of all persons who apply for this purpose the inoculation is expressly confined to the matter of the cowpox the establishment has not however yet fixed upon any settled plan for having a constant supply of the matter and therefore the medical men belonging to it are often obliged to remain inactive for several weeks at a time end of section two section three of travels in brazil volume two by henry coster the sleeper box recording is in the public domain chapter two part one ants snakes and other reptiles river of iguatasu building a house several species of timber trees the pinyon mutamba and gamileja trees the whale i have said that the lands of the ingenio value were much infested by the red ants but indeed scarcely any part of the island of itamaraca is free from these most noxious insects they are of a dusky red color and vary from one quarter of an inch to one inch in length their bite is painful and they will sometimes fix themselves so firmly with their antennae as to leave the points of them in the wound which they have made their food is entirely vegetable i found them extremely troublesome during the continuance of the rains they would often make their way between the bricks of the floor of my house and pick up any article of flour or any grains of maize which might chance to be strewed upon it on one occasion two large bags of maize of equal size were placed in the room at night but in the morning one of them was considerably lower than the other for this i could not account until on a nearer examination i saw one of the red ants coming out of a small hole which there was at one side of the bag with its load upon his back and soon another followed and so forth i now accidentally put my hand upon the bag and it fell still lower so that an arch must have been formed within either by a very singular chance or by the management of those most extraordinary insects upon another evening they made their appearance in such great numbers as to darken the floor of the corner of the room from which they proceeded i sent for some dried leaves of the cocoa tree and only got rid of the enemy by making in the house a bonfire upon the spot of which they had taken possession i had some pomegranate trees at the back of the cottage which i was preserving with great care and i had one evening particularly admired the beauty of one of these plants which was covered with red blossoms in the morning the flowers were still upon the tree but scarcely any leaves remained these were upon the ground and some of the destroyers were cutting off the few which still were left whilst their companions were occupied below in conveying away the spoil i could not avoid watching them for some minutes and admiring their ingenuity and systematic manner of going to work but soon i vowed vengeance upon these enemies and immediately commenced operations there was a steep bank a little below the cottage which had every appearance of harboring these insects for the red earth which lies at some distance below the surface of the ground 
was thrown up all around i placed four negroes below the bank to cut it away perpendicularly they had not worked long before the war commenced for a war it was when some of the nests were laid open the ants came out in great numbers but torches of dried coca leaves were made ready and a large fire and with these weapons we had much the advantage of them the bank contained a vast number of circular holes of about six inches diameter which were placed at unequal distances from each other and many of them were without subterraneous communications from one to the other every one had a passage to the surface of the ground and some of them had more than one leading upwards these nests or holes contained a substance of a gray color which bore the appearance of thick cobwebs pressed closely together and on being squeezed in the hand it had a liquid feel that is the skin was moistened by it when put in water it swam upon the top we had placed a large brass basin upon the fire and filled it with water for the purpose of putting the substance into it in some of the circular holes there were no ants but others were crowded with them great numbers were destroyed and the cottage and its neighborhood enjoyed for a short time some respite but another horde from a different quarter discovered that the place was untenanted and we were again persecuted there is another method of destroying the ants which has only of late years been introduced but this is more particularly adapted to their destruction when they are undermining a building a mixture of brimstone and any other substances which create a considerable degree of smoke is burnt at the entrance of the ant hill a hole being in the first place dug around it that the combustible matter might be laid rather lower than the surface of the ground immediately surrounding then a large pair of bellows is made use of to blow the smoke down the aperture now it is necessary to observe that all the crevices by which the smoke is again ejected should be stopped up if the operation is conducted with due attention it is found successful it is likewise a means of discovering the several communications of the same ant hill and thus being able with less uncertainty to judge of the situation of the chief pot panela or nest the red ant is particularly destructive to the manjuk plant and in many parts it is almost impossible to preserve the plantations of it from them footnote it has obtained the name of formiga jehosa the word hosa means literally a piece of land that has been planted of which the native wood has been cut down and cleared away but at the present day in pernambuco the word hosa is applied to the manjiac plant exclusively thus a peasant will say un bon hosada jehosa a good field of manjio the word hosado is used in speaking of any kind of field as for instance a fine hosado for cotton a fine hosado for cane etc close footnote i recollect having planted a considerable quantity of it in some low marshy ground upon hillocks and the land was so moist that water remained in the furrows round the bottom of each hillock after the manner of dykes on this account i thought it superfluous to desire that any precautions should be taken against the ants however i rode one afternoon to see the field was surprised to find that the plants upon some of the hillocks were deprived of their leaves i knew by whom this must have been done but could not for some minutes discover how the insects had been able to reach the manjak i soon saw an ant track and a few of the ants going into it i followed the track and observed that they had formed a bridge of leaves across one of the furrows upon which they were going over some of them crossed to and from the hillock as i stood watching them there were several other species of ants of less bulk which were occasionally seen the small red ant and the small black ant both of which feed on animal substances would crowd around a fly a spider a small lizard or any other small animal or insect which might lie upon the floor and by degrees a number sufficient to move their prey would assemble and they would convey it slowly along even up a whitewashed wall if the load was not heavier than usual it was a most unpleasant sight to watch these insects clinging to their burden on all sides of it and so closely packed as to appear to be one shapeless mass of moving substance all species of ants have a disagreeable smell 
but the carnivorous small red ant is the most offensive there is also another kind of small black ant that makes its nest in trees and not near to and among the timbers of the houses though the size of this ant is very diminutive being smaller than any other species it is a dreadful enemy to the large red ant owing to its numbers and determined courage these small insects are sought after and encouraged to build upon orange and other fruit trees which are liable to destruction from the large red ant and they effectually defend their appointed posts from the dreaded invaders if time has been given for their numbers to be equal to the task i have sometimes seen the entrance to the nest of the red ants surrounded by the dead of both parties but notwithstanding that the number of black ants which are engaged is always much greater than that of the red ant still i observe that the slain of the latter always outnumber the former footnote in the nouvelle relation de la france equinociale by pierre beret i find that the great ant is as troublesome in the neighbourhood of cayenne as in the part of south america which i visited page sixty Close footnote. the house in which i resided at jaguaribe had been in former times a barn in which the sugar was put into chess for exportation and i had heard from the neighbours that the ants about it were numerous and particularly a small black ant called the formiga doida or foolish ant owing to its not appearing to have any track but to wander about the spot upon which the horde has appeared running fast to and fro and irregularly these are distinguished from the black ant of the orange trees by this name of doida one evening i had been asleep in my hammock and was not a little surprised on waking to see that part of the wall opposite to me which was whitewashed appeared to be covered with a piece of black cloth i got up and approached it with the lamp in my hand i soon saw what it was and found that myriads of these ants were marching along the wall and their numbers were rapidly increasing i had scarcely recovered from the first surprise when on looking round i saw that the other side of the room was in the same state i left the place quickly and calling to some of the negroes desired them to bring cocoa and palm leaves in abundance this was done and operations being actively set on foot against them by applying lighted leaves to the walls we soon got rid of the major part of them however many of them escaped by retreating into the numerous cracks in the walls the next morning the walls were again whitewashed and as many of the crevices filled up as possible on another occasion i was awakened in bed in the middle of the night by a sensation in my feet as if they had been pricked gently by many pins i jumped up and as there was a light in the room i soon perceived what had caused the uneasy sensations several of these black ants were running about my legs and upon the bed and floor they were every moment becoming more and more numerous i escaped and as soon as the bedclothes were removed the scene of burning the host of enemies was re-enacted there yet exists another description of ants called the dioca these are black and on the whole are even larger than the destructive red ant but i never saw the dioca in great numbers and when i have observed them it has been near to where sugar is kept running to and fro without any settled path and seemingly without any plan of operations their bite is still more painful than that of the red ant the ants were not my only persecutors at ita maraca for these were assisted by the copim termes arborum who build their enormous nests called in brazil panelas pots among the rafters of houses which they destroy in the course of time and they likewise formed their settlements upon trees they oftentimes made their covered ways along the whitewashed walls of my house or up the doorposts but i took every precaution against them which was more particularly necessary in this instance as my dwelling was not built of the best kinds of timber i was advised to besmear with treacle the places in which they persisted in attempting to build and i found that this was successful in making them alter their proceedings it is well known in that country by all those persons who have paid any attention to the subject that there are certain kinds of timber which are more liable to be attacked by these insects than others however a person who was about to build a house chose to think that the distinction which the carpenters made in the several kinds of timber which they recommended him to obtain 
either proceeded from some sinister views in the men or from prejudices which they had imbibed therefore contrary to the advice of his workmen and of his friends he purchased any kinds of lumber which were presented to him for sale not attending to the quality but to the price the house was built and he had already either removed it or was upon the point of so doing when it was discovered that the copim had attacked some of the principal timbers and at last it was judged expedient to pull down a considerable part of the building without which the whole would have fallen a sacrifice to the insects a solution of the substance of which the nest of the copim is formed is used as an injection by the peasants in aguish disorders i have not yet mentioned all the persecutors for besides those which have already been here named and the famous chiguas of which i have already spoken there are the moribondos a black insect resembling somewhat the large red and the tioca ant in shape the morobundo is supplied with wings and it has a most powerful sting in the tail it forms its nest upon the trunks and branches of trees and in clearing lands the negroes always proceed with much care that they may not be taken unawares by these insects for on a nest being disturbed they fly out in great numbers notwithstanding every precaution this will occasionally happen and i have known a negro to be unable to work for several days after he had been stung by them the parts which are affected swell and become inflamed and the sufferer experiences for a day or two the alternate sensations of violent cold and burning heat similar to the symptoms of aguish disorders when the negroes discover the nest without disturbing its inhabitants dried palm leaves are lighted and the nest is destroyed by fire the insects are not often all killed but those which escape appear to be stupefied by the fire and smoke and do not leave the nest i have handled them when they have been in this state for they become harmless however after a short time their activity returns there are three species of morobondo the black which i have treated the white which are so called although they are only partially white and the morobondo formiga which are distinguished from the black morobondo in bearing a still greater resemblance to the large black ant the bats also fail not here to annoy me for they persecuted my horses they fasten upon the ears of the beasts or upon their backs if there is any spot from which the skin has been rubbed i have in travelling sometimes been made particularly uneasy at their attacks upon the horses for unless we had some animals above the requisite complement it was necessary to load them with a wound open the skin of an owl is often hung up in a stable for the purpose of scaring the bats in laying open the anthill which i have mentioned above we discovered a couple of the cobras duas cabezas or two-headed snakes or worms each of them was rolled up in one of the nests these snakes are about eighteen inches in length and about the thickness of the little finger of a child of four or five years of age both extremities of the snake appear to be exactly similar to each other but when the reptile is touched both of these are raised and form a circle or hoop to strike that which has molested it they appear to be perfectly blind for they never alter their course to avoid any object until they come in contact with it and then without turning about they crawl away in an opposite direction the color is gray inclining to white and they are said to be venomous this species of snake is often found in ant hills and i have likewise killed them in my house they frequent dung hills and places in which vegetable matter has been allowed to remain for a length of time unremoved the island of itamaraca is said to be less infested with snakes than the mainland and perhaps this opinion is founded on experience but some of those which are generally accounted venomous certainly exist upon it a rattlesnake was killed at amparo two years previous to the period of which i am speaking a horse died one night in my neighbourhood and his death was attributed to the bite of a snake there was a wound upon him and his body was much swollen manuel killed a cobra de vialo or antelope snake boa constrictor which he brought home to show me it was a young one of seven feet in length and about the thickness of a man's arm the name which it bears of antelope snake proceeds from the destruction which it causes among these animals 
the full-grown snake of this species lies in wait for the antelope and other animals of the same size it entwines its tail around a tree and patiently expects that its prey will pass within its reach when this occurs it encircles the unfortunate animal with its enormous body thus securing it i never could discover after much inquiry that it had ever been found in a torpid state digesting its food men have sometimes been caught by them but if the person so situated can draw his knife his escape is very possible though he will probably receive several wounds the opinion is general in the country that the person who receives the bite of one of these snakes has nothing farther to fear from that of any other snake of whatever description one of the negroes whom i had hired with a plantation of jaguaribe had one leg much thicker than the other this was occasioned as he told me by the bite of a rattlesnake he said that he had been cured from the bites of snakes by a curador chicobras or mandiguero and had therefore not died but that as the moon was strong footnote como a lua era forte close footnote he had not escaped receiving some injury from the bite he had frequent violent pains in his limbs at the full and change of the moon particularly and sometimes the wound opened and remained in the state for weeks together but if he was careful in not exposing it to the early dews of the morning it would again heal without any medicinal applications being made use of the most beautiful reptile which i saw was the cobra jicorao or coral snake or worm it is about two feet in length and of the thickness of a man's thumb it is marked with black white and red stripes transversally the general opinion is that it is venomous footnote i have seen piso's account of the snakes in brazil and all the description which i have given of those which i saw and of which i heard differed somewhat from his i have allowed mine to remain as it originally stood piso mentions the root of the jurupeba plant as being efficacious in curing the bites of snakes is this the jurupeba if so it is surprising that it should not now be used for this purpose the jurobeba is to be found in almost all situations a small shrub which yields a fruit resembling the potato apple a decoction of the root is taken frequently at the present day for coughs and colds piso likewise speaks of the caatia or caatia or caasica plant which he says has deservedly obtained the name of the erva jicobras his description of it in page one o two agrees in some respects with that of the erva cobrera of which i have spoken in chapter twelve but it can scarcely be the same for mine would have been more plentiful if it had been indigenous close footnote but the snakes do not cause so much annoyance as the smaller species of vermin which i am about to mention because the former seldom enter the houses nor are they very frequently to be seen in the paths or roads but the aranja caranguejera or crab spider aranquea avicularia the larcaia or scorpion and the piolio jicobra or snake louse scolopendra morsitans are to be met with in the houses and in all situations they should be carefully avoided for their bites are painful and are said to cause inflammation an instinctive recollection of the chance of meeting with these or other vermin of less importance became so habitual with me and indeed it is so with most persons that when i was about to begin reading i closed the book in the first place violently so as to crush anything that might have crept in between the leaves when my hat or boots or clothes were put on some precaution was taken as a thing of course this was not done from a direct idea of the likelihood of finding anything unpleasant in that immediate instance but the precaution was entered into from habit unconsciously i was one day bit by a lacraia i had mounted my horse and had taken my umbrella in my hand for the purpose of shading me from the sun when i had advanced farther upon my ride when i was in the act of opening it i felt suddenly a violent pain upon the fleshy part of the inside of one of my hands on looking down i soon saw what it was that had bitten me upon which i turned back and rode home i applied the juice of lemons to the part and in about a half an hour 
not finding any particularly disagreeable sensations, again mounted my horse. The only effect which I experienced from the bite was a numbness in my hand for the remainder of the day, and a redness about the point which was immediately affected. But on the following day, the former was removed, and the latter did not last long. Labat mentions an instance in which the bite of the scorpion caused as little inconvenience as that which I have related. When I mentioned to some of my neighbors the slight consequences of the bite, they ascribed it to the state of the moon. End of section 3section four of travels in brazil volume two by henry coster this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two part two in the month of september i went up the river in a canoe to iguarasa the distance from my residence was two leagues the river or creek has two mouths which are situated in the bay of the village of cambo which is immediately opposite to conception in the river there are several islands which are covered with mangroves and are too low to be cultivated the banks of the river are likewise lined with the same description of plant excepting at one point to the left in going up where the bank is high and perpendicular and projects considerably at this place the forest trees come down to the edge of the bank near to the town of iguarasu the mangroves have been destroyed and perhaps upon some particular spots they did not originally grow. When the tide is out, the quantity of water which remains in the river is trifling, and in some parts it is nearly dry. Indeed, were it not for two places of inconsiderable breadth, where the water is always deep, a man on foot might walk across its bed from about one mile above Camboa to the town. I came down from Iguarasu one day at the ebb of the tide in a small canoe, which held one man besides myself. It was with difficulty that he could find a channel in which there was sufficient water to float our vessel. It was to conception that the Portuguese came down from Iguarasu for provisions, during the siege of the latter place by the savages in 1548, as is related by Hans Stad. I also observed one of the spots at which the savages attempted to sink the boat as it returned, by means of letting a large tree fall upon it. The town of Iguarasu was plundered and the inhabitants slaughtered by the Dutch in 1632, under the direction of the dreadful mulatto, Calaba. The mangroves entirely destroy the beauty which is natural to suppose that the rivers of the country of which I am treating would possess. Until they are destroyed, a dull sameness presents itself, for the eye cannot penetrate beyond them. Upon the banks of the Capiparipe they have given place to houses and gardens, and the alteration is most pleasing. Upon the banks of the Maria Farina, the mangroves are beginning to give way to cultivation at the settlements, sitios, of Jarjim and Olaria. But the Iguarasu is without any break, and the Guayana is, I understand, in the same state. There are plantations along these rivers, but the owners content themselves with merely cutting a path through the mangroves down to the water's edge. So, to a stranger who goes up the rivers, the country appears to be uninhabited until he passes some of these small openings at which a canoe or a jangada is moored. But the openings are very narrow, and are only to be seen on coming immediately opposite to them. The mangroves grow as far down as low water mark, and when the tide is out, their entangled roots and sprouts and their stems covered with oysters and besmeared with mud are left uncovered. But at the height of the tide, these are concealed, and the water reaches up to the branches of the trees, so that those which bend downwards are partly wetted, presenting to the beholder the view of a forest growing in the water. This species of mangrove sometimes attains the diameter of fifteen or eighteen inches, and the height of twenty-five or thirty feet. There are two species with which I am acquainted, the mangue vermelho, or red mangrove, of which I have been speaking, and the mangue bravo, or wild mangrove. The bark of the former is used for tanning, and the timber is much esteemed for beams and rafters and buildings, but it cannot be used as posts, for underground it decays very quickly, nor as railings, for it does not bear exposure to the weather. A considerable trade is carried on from Itamaracá 
and from some other parts to Hesife in the wood of these plants, which is used as fuel. The tree grows again as often as it is cut down, if the root is not injured, and with such rapidity that the supply of the wood will, for a length of time, I mean unless the destruction of the plant becomes more extensive than it is at present, be fully adequate to the demand for it. The fish forsake those parts to which the trees are brought to be cut up for firewood. This may be judged to proceed from the properties of the bark. In a fish pen, Corral de Peche, near to my place, no fish was caught after the fuel cutters had established themselves at the bridge hard by. Of this I heard much, as there was some squabbling upon the subject. The ashes of the mangrove plants are used as temper in the sugar boiling houses. As I did not, in 1814, suppose that on the following year I should be recalled, I began to make some addition to my cottage, for it was too small for me, and besides it was old and was constructed of bad timber, which caused it to be much infested by the ants in the copim. I had a considerable quantity of timber of excellent quality at Jaguaribe, which had been prepared by me for building there, and therefore I determined to send for it. Permission was also obtained from the owner of the Ingenio Novo to cut down some trees in his woods, for which he ultimately refused to be paid. The woods of his plantation came down nearly to the water's edge near to Camboa, and were consequently very conveniently situated for my purpose. The building was to be constructed of wood and mud, that is, of thick posts supporting the roof, and smaller posts at fixed distances between the principal ones, and the openings between each of them were filled up with mud. I could not help regretting that such beautiful woods as those which were used should be employed in purposes so much beneath their worth. The pau ferro, or ironwood, which is also called the corazão de negro, or the negro's heart, was the most valuable of those which I employed. Footnote. I once asked an African negro the name of this tree, and he answered corazão de homem, or man's heart. Thus he did not choose to use the name of negro's heart. The man knew the usual name perfectly well. Close footnote. The outward coat of the wood of this tree is not particularly hard, but the heart destroys many hatchets. I have seen some of this timber taken out of the ground after standing for many years as a supporter to the roof of a house, and though the outward coat was crumbling into dust, the black heart seemed to be literally of iron, or to have increased rather than decreased in hardness. This wood admits of considerable polish, but the black wood, which is most esteemed for furniture, is the jacaranda. This is also hard, but is much more penetrable than the pau ferro, and the polish to which it may be brought is more complete. The pau jarco is another valuable wood, and is so called, I imagine, from the use which the Indians made of it for their bows. It is much used in building, and is accounted almost as durable as the pau ferro. It admits of being cleft into splinters, which are flexible without breaking. The pau jarco has the property of retaining fire for a long time without being stirred, and of yielding a bright light if the log be occasionally touched. The peasantry take advantage of this and cleave the logs into several narrow splinters, of which they form a bunch. This being lighted serves them as a flambeau. Formerly, likewise, when everything was in a ruder state even than it is now in Brazil, the sugar works were lighted with logs of pau jarco instead of oil. Indeed, I have heard that some of the mills in the back settlement still continue this practice. The ashes of this tree are used as temper in the boiling houses of the mills. The number of fine species of timber in Brazil is very great, but I am myself acquainted only with a few of them. The loro is a large tree, and of it there are three species, all of which are used principally for the beams of houses, for the timber of them rots quickly underground, or if it be exposed to the weather. The most esteemed timber for doors, window shutters, floors of houses, etc., is the pau amarelo, or yellow wood. This is a large tree, and the name which it has obtained continues to be sufficiently appropriate for the first six months after it has been cut down but the yellow color after this period is lost, and the wood becomes a dirty brown. The canoes are almost exclusively made of the pau amarelo. The pau santo, or holy wood, is scarce, and is much sought after for certain purposes. 
as it is not liable to split, bend, or break. It is particularly required for the teeth of the sugar rollers. The wood is beautifully veined with yellow and brown, but becomes after some time of a dusky brown color. There is likewise a tree which is called cedro, but whether it is the cedar or not I cannot determine. The wood is hard and is much esteemed for building. I cut down all the mangroves which grew along the borders of my piece of land, and likewise some other kinds of trees which grew just beyond the reach of the salt water. Among these was the aroeira, a small irregular tree, of which the wood is soft and not even fit for timber. The only use to which the plant is put is that, as the leaves have an aromatic smell, they are used in curing fish, to which they impart a slight portion of their odor. They are placed upon the giran or bocan, and the fish is laid upon them. Fish is likewise packed in the leaves of the aroeira when about to be sent to a distance. Footnote. Piso says that its small clustering red fruit has the property of curing meat, owing to its acidity and astringency. Close footnote. The tree only grows in situations near to the sea. Good fences might be made of it, for the stakes take root. I use some of the trees for this purpose. The molongo and the piñon have likewise this last property, and as the former is supplied with strong, sharp thorns, this advantage renders it preferable to the aroeira. The molungo grows spontaneously in moist situations, but the stakes take root even if the soil is dry, unless no rain falls for some time after it has been planted. Great numbers of the molungo grew near to my house, just below a spring of water which oozed from the side of the hill. The cowich was also found here in abundance. It is called by the peasants machuan. The piñon requires less rain and grows quicker than the molongo, but it is without thorns, and the plant is not nearly so large. The seed of the piñon is used as an emetic by the peasants, and is violent in its operation, a very small quantity being sufficient even for an adult. The fruit encloses three seeds and is about the size of the common hazelnut. During the third attack of agu, which I had whilst I was at Jaguaribe, I placed myself under the direction of an old mulatto woman, than whom I never saw any one more like a witch, and indeed poor old Antonia had the reputation of being somewhat of a mandinguera. However, she gave me a dose of piñon, which I think consisted of four seeds, but they were picked out from the heap of others for their superior size. The dose acted most violently, and effectually produced vomiting, and although excessive weakness followed, the disorder was removed. I begged her to give me a quantity equal to what she had administered, that I might take it to Hesifi. This I showed to a practitioner, who answered that he should have imagined that such a dose would have killed anyone. But the old reputed sorceress knew full well that a dangerous disease requires to be severely attacked. After the ague left me, my nurse would not be satisfied until she applied the bark of the mutamba tree to my stomach or rather the application was made just below the ribs, which she said was to prevent dureza. This she described as a hardness immediately under the lower rib of each side, which sometimes was produced by the agu, and which, if precautions were not taken in time, ended in dropsy. I did not suffer her to continue the mutambo for many days, for I found that I was well and wanted no more nostrums. The mutamba is a small tree, having a straight stem, it grows to the height of eighteen or twenty feet, and to the diameter of twelve or eighteen inches. The bark is easily torn off and is extremely glutinous. The gamaleira preta, black, so called from the dark color of its bark, is a large tree which grows in low marshy grounds. The stem contains a white juice which is much sought for as a medicine in all eruptive complaints and in dropsy. It is likewise given inwardly. The juice is obtained by making an incision in the stem, and leaving a vessel into which the liquid may drop. This is another species of the same tree, which is distinguished by the name of white gamalera, and this is useless. I was obliged in September to forsake my house for three days from a most unexpected cause. A whale was stranded upon one of the sandbanks at the mouth of the harbor this being the third time that the inhabitants of Itamaracá had been favored with visitors of this description. Jangadas were sent out to it, and when the tide came in, it floated. 
and was towed into the harbor, where the persons who were employed in the business landed it as near as they could at high water mark, in front of and distant from my house about three hundred yards. Many of my neighbors were occupied in making oil, for anyone who pleased was at liberty to take as much of the blubber as he could make use of, and one man fairly got into the whale and ladled out the fat which was melted by the heat of the sun. When the people left the carcass, either at midday or at night, it was attacked by numerous flights of urubus, and was literally covered by them. The trees round about the spot were occupied by these enormous birds, which were waiting for an opportunity of satisfying their boundless appetites. The urubu is nearly twice the size of the common crow of England. It is quite black, excepting at the point of the beak, which is white, as I have been told, but this I did not observe. Wherever there happens to be the carcass of an animal, these birds assemble shortly after the death of the beast, and they seem to arrive in greater or less numbers according to the size of the carcass. The peasants tell many stories about the king of the Urubus, who has a tuft of red feathers upon his head, but I never heard any coherent account of this sovereign. The stench proceeding from the whale became in a few days so intolerable as to render a removal necessary. I therefore applied to an old Creole black, a carpenter, to allow me to reside in his cottage, which was neat and clean. To this he agreed, whilst he went to live with some of his friends. End of section 4section five of travels in brazil volume two by henry coster this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three part one recruiting images animals maracas apalinario mandinga and poultry hieroglyphics festival of our lady of conception fandangos the fort a christening the intrudo the author leaves brazil in the months of august and september i was fully employed in planting cane i hired a number of free laborers and was under the necessity in a great measure of attending to the work myself of this i shall take another opportunity of speaking about this time were issued orders from the governor for recruiting the regiments of the line the men who are required are pressed into the service. The orders were forwarded to the Capitones Mores, who again distributed them to the captains. The directions were on this occasion, and indeed always are, that men of bad character between the ages of sixteen and sixty shall be apprehended and sent to Hesife for enlistment, and that every family containing two or more unmarried sons shall give one for the service of the country but it is on these occasions that tyranny has its full sway that caprice and pique have their full vent that the most shameful partiality prevails that the most intolerable oppression is experienced in fact now it is that the whole country is seen in arms against itself and that every means of entrapping each other are used by the nearest neighbors it is one of those impolitic arrangements which are sometimes practised by governments without perceiving their pernicious effects, and by which, as in the present case, the bad qualities of mankind are drawn forth, instead of everything being done for their correction. Revenge, violence, deceit, and breach of trust are excited, and instead of suppression, they meet with encouragement. The mildness of the provincial government of Pernambuco, under the present captain-general, is in none of its proceedings more apparent than in this, although this nobleman has for so many years held the situation of chief of the province now for the first time were issued the orders for recruiting but not until they had become absolutely necessary from the state of the regiments and even now the directions of the governor to the officers who were to execute his commands were dictated by a spirit of gentleness if this word may be used when despotism sends forth such mandates as these the official letter recommended impartiality and threatened punishment in case wounds were inflicted without the most evident necessity but many were the instances of injustice which were committed and could not reach his knowledge petitions were sometimes made to the governor 
in particular instances of injustice but these were often of no avail for the custom is that the recruit should be returned as being unfit for service as soon as possible after their arrival at hesife and their names placed upon the rolls from which none can be removed without an order from the sovereign although the provincial governor should be aware of the true state of the case a young man of respectability was carried before a certain capitan moor and the alternative was put to him either to marry a young woman whom he had never seen but who happened to be a burden to those persons under whose care she was placed or to become a soldier he of course preferred the latter was sent to hesife and was obliged to enlist i heard of many instances of young men being pressed into the service upon whose exertions depended the support of their parents and of others whose lives were spent in idleness but to whom the protection of the captain was extended and some of these were unlawfully employed in apprehending others i was in the daily habit of seeing a young man who led an idle life and who had no duties to perform lying in wait for some of his former companions that he might give notice to the captain of the place of their concealment for some weeks the whole country appeared to be afflicted with a civil war parties of armed men were to be seen in all directions in search of those who had concealed themselves an individual who was not well known could not stir from home without a pass from the captain of the district in which he resided stating him to be a married man or naming some other cause of exemption nor is a man who is liable to be pressed safe in his own house for the tropa or troop would surround the cottage in which any of these persons were suspected to have taken refuge and they would demand admittance and if this was denied no scruple would be entertained of breaking down the door and entering by force this occurred to my knowledge in many cases in several parts of the country married men ought to be exclusively employed in the apprehension of those who are liable to be pressed militiamen are free from acting as oppressors and from being hunted down unless the governor applies to the colonels of the regiment to which they belong it is among the ordenanzas that the recruiting of which i am treating is carried on negroes and indians are excluded from the regiments of the line the former on the score of color and the latter from their caste white men and mulattoes of all shades being alone admitted the great repugnance which is generally felt towards the service is occasioned by the smallness of the pay and by the want of proper clothing whilst the almost incessant duty precludes any hope of working at a trade or pursuing any employment that is not connected with the life of a soldier several elderly persons told me that in former times the service was arranged in a manner totally different that then no difficulty was found in obtaining the number of men required but rather that interest was made for the situation of a soldier of the line each of the forts upon the coast was garrisoned from the inhabitants of the neighborhood to a certain number these enlisted as soldiers of the line were embodied and performed the duty of the forts receiving the usual pay but they were not liable to be removed to any other post and from their numbers the duty was easy by which means they were enabled to have around them their wives and families and to follow any trade to which they might have been brought up thus these men had something for which to fight if the service required that they should act against any enemy of the state they had homes to defend they had comforts of which they might be deprived they had ties which produced local attachments but the regiments of the present day are filled up with vagabonds and unmarried men who could not be expected to fight with the same ardor as those who had to provide for the safety of their families and these unsettled men might perhaps follow him who gave the highest wages the soldier of south america ought to be a being of far different stamp from the professed soldier of europe any war which it might be necessary for brazil to wage against a foreign invader should indeed must be carried on with a direct view to the peculiar advantages of the country it would be a guerrilla war a war under the cover of woods and hills therefore although it may be as well to have a few disciplined soldiers who may be preserved for the purpose of forming the basis of a large force if circumstances should require it 
still it is not by discipline that success will be ensured it is through the affection which the soldiers feel for their government and for their country that the result will be propitious or the contrary but the limited population will not allow of considerable numbers of men comparatively speaking being cooped up uselessly in forts without being of any service to the state whilst the lands are covered with woods and indeed whilst every branch of industry is requiring additional hands besides if you train a large force to military service who being so taught become superior to their countrymen and yet form it of the worst of men if you bring them up without any affection for the government and without any hold upon the rest of the inhabitants excepting that of being able to injure them the likelihood is that when you require their aid they will be found wanting and perhaps for higher pay may act against those whom they were expected to defend if the soldier and the peasant can be combined usefully in the same person it is in brazil that such a system should be followed the foundation of a church which was commenced at the expense of the pes de castelo as the fixed soldiers were called are to be seen near to the town of conception the building was given up when the order arrived from the supreme government then at lisbon directing this change of system during the recruiting i went to hesife and in going along by the seashore saw at several cottages parties of armed men who were waiting to see if they could entrap any one who might be liable to be pressed at the ferry of maria farina there was a large company which was stationed there i happened to be obliged to wait during a shower of rain at a cottage in which some of these fellows were watching for their prey they were talking in high glee of the stratagems which they had made use of to entrap several recruits and of the blows which they had been obliged to give to make some of them surrender the men who were stationed here received no pay and yet they were poor they would probably have been quietly at work at home without the thoughts of violence or barbarity which they now entertained if the perverse institutions of their country did not bring them forward and teach them to be ruffians at first lawfully but bad habits are not easily conquered and the chance is or rather there is a certainty that most of those who had been so employed were rendered worse subjects than they had been before the tract of coast between the mainland opposite to conception and the hill dulce is within one district and it was upon this part of the road that the chief disturbance seemed to be going on the capitan moore had taken it for granted that no one would give his children for the service and therefore had without asking immediately commenced operations of violence taking the people unawares that as many recruits as possible might be obtained and his zeal in the service made manifest from the dulce to alinda the coast is in the district of alinda and here all was quiet the capitan moore had followed the orders of the governor strictly and things were as regularly conducted as the system would allow these facts are mentioned to show that the performance even of the orders of the provincial governor who resides within a few leagues depends upon the individual character of the person to whom they are forwarded god grant that i may soon see such a system altered that the eyes of those who have the power of effecting this alteration may be open for their own good as well as for that of the people over whom they rule the river maria farina is that which runs up to jaguaribe its mouth is wide and the bar will admit of craft of some size but the port cannot be considered as being worthy of attention the horses swim across but the passage is distressing to them for the tide runs rapidly in my way to hesife along the beach i passed the fort of pau amarelo distant from that place four leagues it is small and built of stone the garrison is little more than nominal but affords a comfortable residence for a captain of the olinda regiment the port opposite to which the fort is situated is nothing more than a slight curve which the coast makes at this spot by which vessels at anchor can scarcely be said to receive any shelter but the landing place is good wartenberg the commander of the dutch forces which invaded pernambuco in sixteen thirty landed at pau amarelo 
i was in the habit of conversing with several of the people of color who resided in my neighborhood one man particularly amused me much he was a short and stout creole black and a shoemaker by trade i was greatly entertained with his pompous manner exalting in terms of extravagant praise the advantages which itamaracatha enjoyed and the excellencies of conception which was his native spot in particular he lamented much the removal of the mayor and chamber to guayana giving me to understand that undue influence had been employed forgetful of the insignificance of one place and the importance of the other he also told me with much vehemence of voice and action that the late vicar had wished to remove the image of our lady of conception from the parish church to pilar but the inhabitants assembled and prevented the accomplishment of the plan no he said if that image was to leave us we should consider ourselves unprotected and then indeed would our town be utterly destroyed the vicar of whom the man spoke might have gone to reside at pilar if he pleased but he too had his prejudices in favor of the image and did not like to say mass before any other in his own parish thus images cease to be regarded as the representations of those to whom prayer is to be addressed a value is placed upon the wood itself and religion degenerates into unveiled idolatry footnote the following story was current at conception and i knew all the persons of whom it was related a young man was intimate in a family of rank inferior to his own and he frequently made presents to several individuals of it which was generally thought strange as it did not contain any young female therefore to account for this predilection it was reported that the good old woman to whom he was so kind possessed a small image of saint antonio which was concealed in a bit of old cloth and it had several scraps of ribbons and i know not what else tied to its neck legs and arms and with this she was said to perform certain mysterious rites which secured the continuance of the young man's affection towards herself and family close footnote another instance of the same description of feeling occurred at pilar our lady under that invocation was represented by a small image which from age had become very dirty a priest who used to officiate at the chapel of the village in question preferred purchasing a larger image in the place of directing that the old one should be painted afresh he did so and quietly removing the old image to a house in the neighborhood placed the new lady upon the altar in its stead but lo many of the inhabitants would not hear mass when they perceived the change that had been made however the priest went through the service and then returned to his own residence which was at some distance the people discovered that the image still remained in their neighborhood and presently the house in which it was concealed became known the owner sent for the priest being afraid that some disagreeable consequences to himself might ensue the priest came and without ceremony wrapped up our lady in a handkerchief and rode off with her to his own house from whence she was transferred to one of the other side altars of the parish church even at the time of which i am speaking some of the inhabitants came to say their prayers before this image unmindful of the inconvenience of the distance footnote when i resided at jaguaribe i was once standing by and hearing the conversation of a man and woman who were laughing and joking upon several subjects but i was more particularly amused when the man answered to something that had been mentioned saying i will ask our lady of the conception the woman replied but she will not grant what you ask he then said well i will apply to our lady of the o thus entirely forgetting that the same person is intended under another name Close footnote. the sexton of the parish church who was a mulatto man had much peculiarity of character he had a great deal of penetration but was extremely cautious in what he said and when questions were asked relating to any affair in which he thought he might become implicated he usually answered where white men are concerned negroes must be silent footnote in negocio di branco negro now se meshi close footnote this fellow was once holding a candle in the hand of a dying person and repeating the word jesus as is customary the patient began to move restlessly but gonzalo quietly went on with his dismal work 
and at it with perfect unconcern. Come die and have done with your nonsense. Footnote. Moha videshi chipopajams. Close footnote. The Creole Negro of whom I have above spoken was fond of shooting the larger kinds of game, such as antelopes, which are called in the country vialos and pacas, cavia paca. This was done in the following manner. A platform of thick twigs was made among the branches of a tree, and the height of several feet from the ground, near to some of those plants upon whose leaves or fruit these animals feed. At night two men placed themselves upon this platform, and when the footsteps of the animal were heard, one of the men would light a small taper prepared for the occasion, and the other, with his gun ready, looked round for the game. The animal was allowed to come as near as it seemed inclined to do unmolested, and was then fired at. The men immediately descended, and oftentimes did not attempt to find their prey until the morning, returning to the spot for the purpose. This is the usual manner of obtaining these animals. The tatu verdadero, or legitimate armadillo, was also sometimes caught by him. I requested him to obtain for me a tamandua, which is a small species of anteater. He brought me one, of which the body was about six inches in length, and the tail about twelve, and the hair of its skin was extremely soft. The animal was clinging closely to the bough of a tree, and its tail also was entwining the branch. My black friend, the shoemaker, told me that he had been ordered to eat the flesh of the tamandua after having had an eruptive complaint, and that it was very beneficial for persons who were recovering from the bobas, or yaws. He said that it had a taste which was like unto the smell of ants. The sloth was to be seen here occasionally, also the cochia, cavia gaudata, the porco de india, the guinea pig, I've only seen in a tame state. At Jaguaribi, the capivara, cavia capibara, was often seen among the mangroves. The Indians sometimes eat it, but few of the Negroes will. There is also another mangrove animal, which is called in that country gauchinin. It feeds on crabs, and from what I could hear, has much resemblance to a cat, but the tail is much longer. However, I never saw it. Neither did I see the lontra, or sea otter, but the skins of this animal are much valued for saddle cloths, bearing a higher price even than the skin of the jaguar. I heard accidentally, in conversing with persons of the lower ranks in life, of an instance in which the Indians continued their heathenish customs. A family resided at a plantation in this neighborhood, which had much intimacy with many Indians, but none of the members of it were of that caste. When the heads of the families were from home, the young females were in the habit of meeting to amuse themselves. On one of these occasions, an Indian girl carried one of her companions into the hut in which she and her parents dwelt, and on this playmate questioning her, from girlish curiosity, about several gourds which were hanging up in the room, she appeared much alarmed and said, You must not look that way. Those are the maracas which my father and mother generally put into their chest, but they have today forgotten them. Notwithstanding her entreaties to the contrary, her companion took hold of one of the gourds, and moving it quickly, discovered there were pebbles within. They had handles to them and tufts of hair upon the top, and they were cut and carved in divers' unusual forms. Here this matter ended, but soon afterwards several of the mulatto women agreed to watch the Indians, for they knew that they often danced in their huts with closed doors. This was an uncommon practice, and inconvenient too, for the open air is much pleasanter. They had soon an opportunity of witnessing one of these meetings. The huts are constructed of cocoa leaves, and through these they managed to obtain a view of what was going forwards. There was a large earthen pot in the center, and round this both men and women were dancing. A pipe was handed occasionally from one to the other. Soon afterwards one of the Indian girls told one of her companions of a different caste from her own, as a great secret, that she had been sent to sleep at a neighbor's hut a few nights before, because her father and mother were going to drink jurema. This beverage is obtained from a common herb, but I could never persuade any of the Indians to point it out to me, though when they positively asserted that they were unacquainted with it, their countenances belied their words. 
i had a visit in october from a strange old man whose age was generally supposed to border upon ninety years he was a creole black and had been a slave upon the plantation of santos cosmo y damion in the varzea to the southward of Recife. he had settled at iguarasu after he obtained his manumission having married when he was about seventy years of age a young woman of his own colour and he was now surrounded by a young family this man did not reckon his age by years but by the governors and as each of these with few exceptions remained at the head of the province only three years something near the truth could be collected this mode of computation is very common i have often on asking the age of any person received for answer that the individual concerning whom the inquiry was made had been born in the first second or third year of such a governor the dreadful famine of seventeen ninety three is also an era from which the peasants date many circumstances old palenario was staying at conception with a friend and i requested him to come down to my place every evening for the purpose of teaching some of the young persons their prayers a task of which i knew him to be fond as he considered this to be a meritorious action one by which he would have still further services to plead in his favour with the virgin and st peter as he himself told me when he came to give his report to me of the progress of each negro i liked much to keep him that i might converse with him he often spoke of the jesuits under the name of the padres da compania he was fond of them but he added i must not speak well of them for our prince does not like them and yet they did a great deal of good too he said that they were true and saint-like padres very different to those of the present day he was much surprised at my knowing anything about them he said you were not alive at the time that they were here and even if you had been alive you could not have been in pernambuco therefore how is it that you know of their existence at the time of which i speak i never could make him perfectly comprehend how i obtained my knowledge of them but he was not the only person whose comprehension thus taken by surprise could not contain the new ideas which were imparted by the knowledge of the existence of books spread all over the world and of men who wrote for the instruction of others some of these people with whom i conversed were much puzzled when i spoke of the variety of languages and countries in the world then they would say how is it that people understand each other to this i answered that these languages were to be acquired by study yes i understand you they would rejoin you are all much cleverer than we are here we could never learn any language but our own footnote a sua gente e mais sabida que a nossa close footnote these people were invariably humble and always ready to receive instruction the peasantry of the sugar plantation districts near to the coast and the fishermen are of characters nearly similar but the former are more favourably spoken of than the latter and i cannot avoid saying that i should prefer as a servant a man who had been brought up as a planter of mangiac to one whose life had been passed upon a jangada these people are said to be less courageous less sincere less hospitable than the certanejos but they are likewise less vindictive more obedient more easily guided and more religious and though their knowledge is very confined still their frequent communication with hesifi and other towns renders them of course less unacquainted with what passes in the world than the inhabitants of the interior the free schools which are established in many places are of much service and although reading for amusement is totally beyond the comprehension of many persons of the secondary rank still the acquirement of the rudiments of knowledge prepare them for improvement when books begin to make their way some of the neighbors both at itamaraca and at jaguaribe chanced at times to come in whilst i was reading and would be curious to know how it was that i could find amusement in being so employed i remember one man saying to me you are not a priest and therefore why do you read is that a breviary in which you are reading on another occasion i was told that i had got the character among the people of colour in the neighbourhood of being very holy for that i was always reading footnote dicen que vosé es muito santo close footnote a person who can read write and keep accounts has attained the height of perfection and is much respected 
or rather of late years one who does not know how to do these things is looked down upon the women particularly pride themselves upon the superiority which they enjoy by this means by which they are brought to an equality with their husbands in the above general character of the free people i do not include the planters of large property for their acquirements are oftentimes considerable and the indians too are quite separate owing to their degraded state however i include the white persons of small property it is surprising though extremely pleasing to see how little difference is made between a white man a mulatto and a creole negro if all are equally poor and if all have been born free i say surprising because in the english french and dutch colonies the distinction is so decidedly marked and among the spaniards lines are even struck between the several shades of colour i recollect apollinario telling me of his distress on one occasion when he resided in the varzea he met the vicar of that parish on horseback with the sacrament which he had been taking to some sick person the rain poured in torrents and the mud in the road was halfway up to the knees but yet it was necessary to pay the usual respect consequently the old creole went down upon one knee and as the priest passed he cried out pardon me sir vicar for this one knee but if i was to put both to the ground i could not again rise he told me this with perfect gravity and i perceived that he thought this circumstance would be recorded against him as one of his heaviest sins one day the old man came to me with a face of dismay to show me a ball of leaves tied up with cipo which he had found under a couple of boards upon which he slept in an outhouse for he had removed from the house of his friend in the town to my place the ball of leaves was about the size of an apple i could not imagine what had caused his alarm until he said that it was mandinga which had been set for the purpose of killing him and he bitterly bewailed his fate that at his age any one should wish to hasten his death and to carry him from this world before our lady thought fit to send for him i knew that two of the black women were at variance and suspicion fell upon one of them who was acquainted with the old mandiguero of ingenio velho therefore she was sent for i judged that the mandingo was not set for apollinario but for the negroes whose business it was to sweep the outhouse i threatened to confine the suspected woman at pilar and then to send her to para unless she discovered the whole affair this she did after she heard me tell the manager to prepare to take her to pilar she said that the mandingo was placed there to make one of the negroes dislike her fellow-slave and prefer her to the other the ball of mandingo was formed of five or six kinds of leaves of trees among which was the pomegranate leaf there were likewise two or three bits of rag earth of a peculiar kind ashes which were of the bones of some animal and there might be other ingredients besides but these were what i could recognize the woman either could not from ignorance or would not give any information respecting the several things of which the ball was composed i made this serious matter of the mandinga from knowing the faith which not only many of the negroes have in it but also some of the mulatto people however i explained to every one that i was angry with her for the bad intention of the scheme and not from any belief that it would have any effect there is another name for this kind of charm it is fetiso and the initiated are called feticeros of these there was one formerly at the plantation of st juan upon the island who became so much dreaded that his master sold him to be sent to maranon old apalinario was useful to me in taking care of my poultry i had great quantities of the common fowl and as i cleared the land to a considerable distance around the house the fowls had a good range without being molested by the foxes i had ducks turkeys and pigeons the young of these last were frequently destroyed by the timbu this animal is about the size of a small cat and has a long tail which is scaly and whitish the color of the body is dark brown with two white stripes from the nose to the tail down the back the head is long and the snout is pointed it has an abdominal pouch which is large when pursued it soon surrenders by coiling itself up in its tail i give the description as i received it for although we watched oftentimes for the purpose of catching one of these animals we were not successful i had some geese at jaguaribe and at itamaraca but from what cause i know not the young ones were scarcely ever reared 
many other persons had found equal difficulty in this respect with myself guinea fowls are esteemed but give much trouble for their unaccommodating disposition renders it necessary to keep them separate from all other kinds of fowl there is only one pair of peacocks in pernambuco they are in the garden of the widow of a merchant in the neighbourhood of hesife snipes and wild ducks are to be found in low marshy grounds and upon the island at certain times of the year there were great numbers of wild doves the bees which i have seen at some of the farmhouses are preserved in part of the trunk of the tree in which they had originally been found the tree is cut down and the portion containing the nest is brought home the bees are black and much smaller than those of europe nor is their bite nearly so painful the log of wood in which they are preserved is sawed or cut in some particular manner which i cannot exactly describe by which means the honey can be taken out the honey is always liquid it is used as a medicine rather than as food for the small quantities of which are to be obtained render the demand of it for the medical men fully equal to the supply in the month of november there arrived a priest upon a visit to the vicar whose exertions are incessant on every subject which relates to the improvement of his country he had now been staying with a friend in the province of paraiba and had made a drawing of a stone upon which were carved a great number of unknown characters in several figures one of which had the appearance of being intended to represent a woman the stone or rock is large and stands in the middle of the bed of a river which is quite dry in the summer when the inhabitants of the neighborhood saw him at work in taking this drawing they said that there were several others in different parts of the vicinity and they gave him the names of the places it was his intention to return again the following year and seek them out i should have brought with me a copy of this curious drawing if my departure from pernambuco had not been hastened from unavoidable circumstances i was invited about this period to attend the funeral of a young married woman of respectable family i went about five o'clock to the house of the vicar that i might go with him and three other priests from hence we adjourned at dusk to the church where the priests all of whom were already in their black gowns put on over these the short lace rocher and the vicar took in his hands a large silver cross we walked to the house in which the body was laid this was habited in the coarse brown cloth of the franciscan order for the deceased had belonged to the lay sisterhood of the third order of st francis the face was uncovered and the body was laid upon a bier the room being lighted with many torches the habits in which the bodies of the deceased lay brothers and sisters of the third order are dressed are obtained from the convents of st francis and are said to be the habits of deceased friars but probably the worn-out dresses of those who still live are likewise sold and thus arises a considerable source of revenue to the convent there were assembled in the room several of her male relations and others who had been invited after a good deal of chanting a wax taper was given to each person present and these being lighted we proceeded to the church which was hard by walking in pairs the bier followed carried by four persons and there was chanting as we went along in the middle of the body of the church a scaffolding was erected of about four feet from the ground and upon this the bier was placed the attendants standing round whilst the priest chanted the body was soon put into the grave which was in the church and there was lime in it the friends of persons deceased aim at having as many priests at the funeral as they can collect and afford to pay though on the occasion of which i speak the priest served without any remuneration for the young woman was the near relative of a priest with whom the others were intimate likewise all the neighbors who were of an equal rank with the deceased are invited to attend that the ceremony may be as splendid as possible notwithstanding the manifest inconvenience and the mischief which the unwholesomeness of the custom might and perhaps does cause all bodies are buried within the churches indeed the prejudice against being buried in the open air is so great that even the priests would not dare to alter this mode of proceeding supposing that they wished to do so end of section five
Section six of Travels in Brazil, Volume two by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three, part two. Towards the end of the same month, November, it is customary for the vicar to determine upon those persons who are to sustain the expenses of the nine evenings previous to the festival of Our Lady of Conception, that is, to supply the bonfires, gunpowder, oil, etc. Each evening is provided for on all these occasions by one or more persons of the immediate neighborhood, and a greater or less expense is incurred according to the means and the inclination of the individuals who have been named. It was my general practice to accompany the vicar to church on Sundays and holidays, returning with him to his house to breakfast. I was in the church when he read over the list of the names of those who were to provide for the nine evenings, and was somewhat surprised to hear my own, in conjunction with that of a neighbor, for the ninth night. I had, however, some suspicion that this would be the case, for I had heard some whisperings upon the subject among the secondary people. The custom is thus to keep the individuals who are to be concerned ignorant of what is intended. We began on the following morning to make preparations for the occasion, and sent to Hesifi for the colors of several ships, some gunpowder, and a few of the musicians at the band of the Olinda Regiment, applying through a friend for the consent of their colonel. We likewise sent for Nicolau, a Creole black and a tailor by trade, but whose merry tongue and feet made him like dancing and singing better than the needle. And we agreed with him to bring over from the village of Pasmado a set of fandango performers. The colors were raised upon long staffs very early in the morning of our day, in two rows along the area of the town, and as the sun rose several guns were fired, of those which are usually made use of at festivals. They are composed of a small and short iron tube, which has a touch-hole of disproportionate dimensions. They are placed upright upon the ground, and the match is then applied. In the course of the day the band played, and in the evening were kindled about twenty bonfires in the square of the village. The houses were illuminated with lamps, which were made of the half of the rind of an orange, each containing a small quantity of oil and cotton. There were likewise great numbers of large crosses, lighted up in the same manner, in several parts of the square. The church was crowded, and the noise of the people was great. The guns were fired at intervals. The musicians of the festival, with violins and violoncellos, played within the church, and the Olinda men on the outside, and the rockets were let off occasionally. Indeed, the confusion was extreme. Some of the numerous horses, which stood in all quarters, tied to railings or to doorposts or held by little children, whilst their masters were amusing themselves, took fright and broke loose, adding not a little to the noise and bustle. All the affairs in and about the church ended at so late an hour that the fandangos were deferred until the following evening. The band had been playing close to the door of the vicar's residence, which was much crowded with several of the first families of the island, and in front of the house a great concourse of people was assembled. At the moment that the music ceased, an improvisatore, or glosador, as these persons are there called, set up his voice, and delivered a few verses in praise of the vicar. He then praised Our Lady in a strange style, giving her every fine epithet, whether appropriate or not, which came to his recollection. Then he rung changes upon every body he could think of, and I heard the name of Henrique da Costa, to which mine was metamorphosed thrown in every now and then among the rest. I was praised for my superior piety in giving so splendid a night in honor of Our Lady. On the following morning every arrangement was made for the fandangos. A spacious platform was erected in the middle of the area of the town, and in front of the vicar's dwelling, raised about three feet from the ground. In the evening four bonfires were lighted, two being on each side of the stage, and soon afterwards the performers made their appearance. The story which forms the basis of this amusement is invariably the same. The parts, however, are not written, and are to be supplied by the actors, but these from practice know more or less what they are to say. The scene is a ship at sea, which during part of the time is sailing regularly and gently along. 
but in the latter part of the voyage she is in distress the cause of the badness of the weather remains for a long time unknown but at last the persons who are on board discover that it has arisen from the devil who is in the ship under the disguise of the mizzen topmast man the persons represented are the captain the master the chaplain the pilot or mate the boatswain the hassam or distributor of the rations and the vazora or sweeper of the decks are portrayed by two clowns the gajero dagata or mizzen topmast man alias the devil twelve men and boys who are dancers and singers stand on the stage six of them being on each side of it and the leader of the chorus sits at the back of the stage with a guitar with which he keeps the time and this person is sometimes assisted by a second guitar player a ship is made for the occasion and when the performers stepped on to the platform the vessel appeared at a distance under a full sail coming towards us upon wheels which were concealed as soon as the ship arrived near to the stage it stopped and the performance commenced the men and boys who were to sing and to dance were dressed in white jackets and trousers they had ribbons tied round their ankles and arms and upon their heads they wore long paper caps painted of various colors the guitar player commenced with one of the favorite airs of the country and the chorus followed him dancing at the same time the number of voices being considerable and the evening extremely calm the open air was rather advantageous than the contrary the scene was striking for the bonfires threw sufficient light to allow of our seeing the persons of the performers distinctly but all beyond was dark and they seemed to be enclosed by a spacious dome the crowd of persons who were near to the stage was great and as the fires were stirred and the flames became brighter more persons were seen beyond on every side and at intervals the horses which were standing still farther off waiting for their masters when the chorus retired the captain and other superior officers came forwards and a long and serious conversation ensued upon the state of the ship and the weather these actors were dressed in old uniforms of the irregular troops of the country they were succeeded by the boatswain and the two clowns the former gave his orders to which the two latter made so many objections that the officer was provoked to strike one of them and much coarse wit passed between the three soon afterwards came the chaplain in his gown and his breviary in his hand and he was as much the butt of the clowns as they were of the rest of the performers the most scurrilous language was used by them to him he was abused and was taxed with almost every irregularity possible the jokes became at last so very indecent as to make the vicar order his doors to be shut the dancers came on at each change of scene if i may say so i went home soon after the vicar's doors were closed and did not see the conclusion but the matter ended by throwing the devil overboard and reaching the port in safety the performers do not expect payment but rather consider themselves complimented in being sent for they were tradesmen of several descriptions residing at pasmado and they attend on these occasions to act the fandangos if requested so to do but if not many of them would most probably go to enjoy any other sport which the festival might afford we paid their expenses and gave them food during their stay they were accompanied by their families which were all treated in the same manner to the number of about forty persons i here take the opportunity of mentioning another common amusement at festivals which is known under the name of comedias but this i did not chance to see a stage of the same kind is erected and regular farces are performed but i believe that women do not even appear upon these stages though they do upon the stages of the theatre at hesife i slept one night at pilar and in the morning following accompanied the chaplain to the fort who was going to say mass at his chapel as it was a holiday the fort is situated upon a projecting sandbank and was formerly quite surrounded by water but the channel for small craft which ran between the fort and the island is now nearly closed by the accumulation of sand at its mouth footnote i have seen a print in barleus representing this channel as still being open and the fort situated upon an island which is almost entirely covered Close footnote. 
when we dismounted at the gate our horses were taken into the fort and were put into the commandant's stable the sentinel desired me to take off my spurs and we then passed through the gate and along the covered way until we entered the area in the centre with the chapel and other buildings along two sides of it the commandant is a captain of the olinda regiment an elderly and most formal man full of etiquette and all the other officers are of the same standing i was introduced to the chief and we then proceeded to the chapel forgetful of necessary forms i had placed myself next to the wall on the right hand side of the chapel but the commandant would not give up his right and therefore reminded me to move that he might take that place as soon as the mass was ended we took our leave some idea of the state of the works may be formed from the following anecdote a former chaplain was dismissed from his situation owing to the non-observance on his part of established regulations the gate was open for his admission and that of any other person who might wish to hear mass on sundays and holidays but on one occasion he unfortunately espied the commandant standing in the area of the fort through a breach in the walls upon which instead of going round to the gate he rode unceremoniously through the breach in his anxiety to greet the commandant who was much disconcerted at the occurrence at the time i was there the garrison consisted of militiamen and the idea of the discipline of these may be formed from the following circumstance which took place only a short time before my visit to the fort the adjutant who was between seventy and eighty years of age threatened to strike or gently touched with his cane one of the men who had refused to hear mass the fellow waylaid the old officer one evening and gave him several blows of which he died the soldier absconded and was not again heard of the guns were in a very bad state and the usual supply of powder was merely sufficient for the salutes on days of gala there were indeed some heaps of balls upon which the rust surpassed the quantity of sound iron in the course of this year some of my friends from hesifi came to see me i had been often at amparo and at the houses of several other planters but i do not particularly mention any of these visits for they did not discover anything new i went to hesifi three or four times after the commencement of the rains in eighteen fifteen i left itamaraca with manuel about four o'clock one afternoon having been detained thus late by unforeseen occurrences the weather was fine and as the moon would rise early i thought that the evening would be pleasant but when we were about three leagues from the island the rain began to pour and when we reached the plantation of inyaman which is half a league farther we were completely wet through immediately beyond this place the road is on one side bordered by a steep hill from which the water ran down in such great quantities that the horses were nearly up to their knees in it however we gained the great cattle track and stopped at a liquor shop by the roadside i bought a considerable quantity of rum which i threw over my head and shoulders and into my boots and manuel did the same each of us likewise drank a good dose of it this practice is very general i had for some time followed it and although i had been much exposed to the rain in the course of the preceding year had not suffered from it not having experienced another attack of ague but perhaps this is not attributable to precaution but to being seasoned to the climate when we arrived at the village of paratibi night had nearly closed in i met with antonio the man who was waylaid when i resided at jaguaribe and he wished me to stay at his cottage but i preferred going on now that we were completely wet through as we were ascending the hill beyond paratibi i was in hopes of a fine night for the moon was clear but she did not afford us light for many minutes in the valley of meruera the rain again came on with vivid lightning and in going through the wood beyond the valley the darkness was so great as to prevent me from seeing manuel's horse excepting now and then during the flashes of lightning although the animal upon which he rode was of a gray color approaching to white and mine was sometimes touching his for he rode in front when we arrived near to the hill which descends on the side nearest to hesifi i reminded him to keep to the left for the precipice is dangerous on the right hand side but he did not understand me or his horse was restive and was going too much to the right when he slipped and 
fell on one side within a few yards of the place which he was to avoid i dismounted to assist manuel but only saw his situation by the flashes of lightning i asked him after himself his horse and his pistol and to each question received for answer that all was well i then said to him where is the road for i had turned round in different ways so frequently in assisting him that i had no notion of the direction which we ought to take to find the road and indeed at one moment i had formed the idea of remaining where we were until the break of day but on again asking manuel if he was certain respecting the right direction his answer was in an angry voice for he was wet and bruised i see the road don't be afraid sir he led and i followed him each leading his horse we descended sideways for the ground was too slippery owing to the rain to allow us to advance in any other manner my horse struck me with his head several times and he too every now and then narrowly escaped falling the width of the road is about six feet there is on one side a precipice of great height which has been formed by the torrents in the rainy season these have caused the ground to fall in and have now worn it quite away on the other side the declivity is less perpendicular but it is covered with the short stumps of trees among which there is no possibility of treading safely without a sufficient light we reached the bottom without accident and when we entered the village of beberipe the rain nearly ceased and the night likewise was clearer but the moon had set we crossed the hill beyond beberipe very slowly and arrived at agua fria the residence of one of my friends distant from hecife two leagues between one and two o'clock in the morning if the weather had been fine we should have arrived between eight and nine o'clock in the evening preceding the instinct if i may so call it which is possessed by the indians by a great number of the negroes and indeed by many individuals of mixed castes in finding out the right roads often surprised me but never more than on this occasion i could not see anything but manuel certainly did feel that he was quite sure of being in the right path else he would not have spoken so positively he had a considerable stock of courage but was always cool and collected at agua fria i passed some of the pleasantest hours of my residence in brazil the owner of the place is an english gentleman to whom i owe many obligations we were on most intimate terms indeed i felt as much at home at agua fria as at itamaracá the spot was in the rudest state when he took possession of it but although the soil was not propitious the sitio settlement was advancing he had built a good house and was erecting outhouses making fences and planting useful and ornamental trees the place had been infested by red ants but with much labor they had been destroyed by digging into the ground for the nests behind the house there was a lake of considerable extent which had been formed by the course of a rivulet having been stopped through the accumulation of loose white sand in the part which is now the road so that the road is higher than the lake on one side and the land along which the river formerly ran on the other side when the waters rise in the winter the lake overflows and runs across the road but during the greatest part of the year the road is dry or nearly so if the lake was drained the settlement of agua fria would be worth ten times its present value for the boundaries of it are the channel of the rivulet this lake is covered over with reeds rushes and coarse grass and the roots of these plants have formed a thick coating over the water which would not support the weight of a man but much labor is required to cut through it there were numbers of jacares or alligators in this lake footnote i've been much blamed by one of my friends for not having eaten of the flesh of the jacare and indeed i felt a little ashamed of my squeamishness when i was shown by the same friend a passage in a french writer whose name i forget in which he speaks favorably of this flesh however if the advocate for experimental eating had seen an alligator cut into slices he would i think have turned from the sight as quickly as i did the indians eat these creatures but the negroes will not no not even the gabum negroes who are said to be cannibals Close footnote, which rendered it dangerous to work in cutting away the rushes which it was necessary to do for the purpose of forming an open space in which the horses could be watered and washed 
and indeed the grass was eaten by them when other kinds failed in the dry season i may here mention some others of the lizard tribe the camaleon la certa iguana is often to be met with also the tijuasu which is i believe the la certa teguishin this is very common there is likewise the calango which is smaller than the other two these three species are all of them eaten by the lower orders of people the vibra and the lagartixa are two small species of lizard which are continually to be seen in all situations in and upon the houses in the gardens and in the woods they do good rather than harm for they eat flies spiders etc and they are to my eyes very pretty creatures their activity and at the same time their tameness made me fond of them in my rides to hesifi through the maruera wood i always heard the hoarse croaking of the sapo kururu rana ventricosa and also of the sapo boy or ox toad both of which made a most disagreeable and dismal noise they were particularly active on the rainy night which i have above described the constant noise which the crickets make as soon as the sun sets fails not to annoy those persons who have recently arrived in the country and i recollect that on the first evening which i spent in the country on my arrival at pernambuco i stopped several times when conversing as if waiting to let the noise cease before i proceeded but this wore off as it does with every one and latterly i did not hear the noise even when it was spoken of in my presence however if one of them gets into a house there is no resting until it be dislodged owing to the shrillness of its whistle the body of the insect is about one inch or one inch and a half in length and the legs are long the whole of the insect is green there is another species which is distinguished by the name of grillo branco or the white cricket it is likewise a sharp whistle may not this be the same insect as the former in a different state there is likewise the grillo de feijon or bean cricket which is so called from the destruction which it makes in the plantations of the french bean it is a dusky brown color approaching to black i was invited in january of eighteen fifteen to attend a christening at the sugar plantation of Macacheira, which is the largest and the most valuable in every respect of the three in the island the vicar another priest a captain of the ordenanzas and myself set off early on the morning of the day appointed we rode through the plantation of st juan and spoke to the owner who was preparing to follow us with all his family he is a portuguese who has accumulated a large fortune in brazil and has married one of the daughters of the owner of the place to which we were going this person and his immediate relatives will in the course of a short time probably possess one half of the island of itamaracá we were received at macacheira by the father and uncles of the child and afterwards the grandmother who is a widow lady and the owner of the estate made her appearance and by degrees we saw the younger ladies of many of the neighboring families as soon as the christening was over the day was devoted to eating and drinking and playing at cards when the men had left the table after dinner the cloth was again laid and the ladies sat down to dine but one of the priests declared that this separation was barbarous and seating himself again was followed by several other men and thus they dined a second time the evening ended rather boisterously but good-humouredly the wine was poured out into tumblers and these being as frequently emptied as if they had been smaller only a few of the guests returned home the same night but those who remained crept off early and quietly on the following morning i accompanied the vicar to pilar to pass the intrudo at that place we set off on saturday afternoon and on our arrival found that the whole clan from macacheta and st juan had taken up their quarters close to the house which we were to inhabit in the evening a tightrope dancer was to exhibit in the open air and at the appointed hour he took his station and went through several of the common feats of activity with considerable neatness he was paid in a singular manner before he began to dance the clown cried out here goes to the health of the vicar then after the performer had danced for a few minutes he stopped and the clown came to a party 
and with many jokes and much pretended ignorance of the vicar's person he found him out and asked for a donation as is the custom this being acceded to and the vicar having given what he thought proper the clown returned to the rope dancer upon which a shout was set up by those who were round about him which was intended as an acknowledgment for the generosity then the clown mentioned the name of some other person and so forth after the dancer had exhibited to the help of several persons a slack rope was hung between two cocoa trees and at a great height from the ground to this the man removed where he continued dancing until a late hour to the help of every one whose name his clown could think of on the following day after the service of the church was over the intrudo jokes and tricks began and before the conclusion of the sport in the evening each person had been obliged to change his clothes several times the ladies joined with heart and soul and particularly the good old lady of Marcachera, who was wet through and through and yet carried on the war the priests were as riotous as the rest but their superiority of manner even here was perceivable their jokes were well timed and were not accompanied by any brutality of behaviour there was a seeming deference in their manner when they were drenching the person upon whom they made an attack and they took care that what they threw was clean which with others did not always happen on monday morning every one rose fresh for action and to work we went until three o'clock in the afternoon scarcely finding time for eating we then adjourned to the seashore for the purpose of witnessing the christening of the king of the moors on this day all the jangadas and canoes were put in requisition the owners of them and others of the inhabitants of the neighbourhood were divided into two parties christians and moors a stage was erected at low water mark upon high poles and this was intended to represent a moorish fortress the affair was so timed that the tide should be at the height of the commencement of the sport by which means the stage was surrounded by the water upon the seashore were two high thrones with canopies made of counterpanes etc these were at the distance of about three hundred yards from each other and were placed immediately above high water mark the christian king sat upon one of them and the moorish king upon the other both of them being habited in fine flowing robes the affair began by the former dispatching one of his officers on horseback to the latter requiring him to undergo the ceremony of baptism which he refused to do several other couriers passed from each side all of whom were on horseback and fantastically dressed in loose garments war being declared the numerous jangadas and canoes of each party were soon in motion making towards the fortress in the water some were going to assist in protecting it and others to obtain possession of it the persons who were in the fort were now seen preparing for its defence there was much firing and at last after many struggles on both sides it was taken by the christians the moorish vessels however escaped and landed their crews the opposite party doing the same the armies met on shore and fought hand to hand for a considerable time but in the end the moorish king was taken prisoner hurled from his throne and forcibly baptized the whole affair was very gay for the sands were crowded with people who were all in their best clothes finery of many kinds being displayed silks satins muslins and printed cottons ornaments of gold and of precious stones bonnets of straw and of silks and ribbons of all colours in great quantities shoes white black and of various tints then there were coats that had not for many a day seen the light cotton and cloth jackets made for the occasion embroidered waistcoats and others more general of less costly materials pantaloons of nankeen and of various other light materials cocked hats a few of beaver and of straw and round ones many half boots and shoes and buckles there appeared at pilar one of the valentoines who had often created great disturbances in many parts and although his apprehension was much desired he trod the soil of pilar with great confidence as if he was aware that his person was secure owing to his great reputation of intrepidity but his safety proceeded from my friend of the stockade prison not being the chief magistrate of the place for the year on the morrow all parties were preparing to return home we saw the ladies set off on horseback and according to a strange custom a number of metal pans were collected and as they went away from the door 
the persons who remained beat the pans against each other so as to make a jingling noise this practised as a joke and on this occasion as is usual created much laughter shortly after this period i received advices from england which rendered necessary my return home i gave up my plan of residing in brazil with reluctance but i am now much rejoiced that it so happened yet at that time it required some resolution to leave the people the place and the things in which i had taken deep interest my negroes and free people my horses and my dogs and even my cats and fowls the house and the garden which i had been improving and forming and the fields which i had cleared and was cultivating all this believe me cost me much pain in leaving but thanks to those who desired that it should be so i should have soon become a brazil planter the state in which a man who rules over slaves is placed is not likely to make him a better creature than he would under other circumstances have been i should perhaps shortly have become totally unfit to become a member of any other society i was young and was independent and had power although i am fully aware of the evils which attend a feudal state of society i like to have dependence i might have become so arbitrary so much a lover of a half savage life i might have contracted so great a relish for rambling had become so unsettled as to have been dissatisfied with what is rational and to be desired in this world until lately i cherished the hope of being able to return to that country with the means of crossing the continent of south america but i have now given this up from unavoidable circumstances and even my wishes have taken another bias but god only knows whether it may not yet be my fate to enter into the scheme accident and inclinations over which i have no control may so direct england is my country but my native soil is portugal i belong to both and whether in the company of englishmen or portuguese or of brazilians i feel equally among my countrymen my constant and fervent prayers are offered up for their prosperity and for a continuance of that friendship which has borne the test of so many years fresh causes have lately occurred for riveting the links which bind the two united nations their people have fought together and neither have been found wanting End of section six. Section seven of Travels in Brazil, volume two by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four, part one Agriculture, Sugar Plantations. Agriculture in Brazil. Footnote in making use of the word brazil it must be understood that i mean to denote that portion of the country which i have had opportunities of seeing the agriculture of the provinces of rio de janeiro and bahia is doubtless in a more forward state than that of pernambuco and of the line of coast to maranhão close footnote had not for many years till very lately received any improvement and even now it is only slowly and with much difficulty that innovations are made it is quite hopeless to expect a rapid change of system among men who had not even heard that there existed other agriculturists besides themselves who were astonished to learn that brazil was not the only country in which sugar was made who know not or at least did not know until very lately that there was any other nation than their own who imagined that portugal had possession of everything worth having in this world in fact whose ignorance was extreme most of the planters of the inland country and even most of those near to the coast who reside entirely upon their estates were and many still are in this state they continue year after year the system which was followed by their fathers without any wish to improve and indeed without the knowledge that any improvement could be made but the freedom of commercial intercourse with other nations has here as in everything else had its effect and the benefits which are derived from this policy are increasing most rapidly one of these is to be perceived in the wish which many of the planters display to obtain information respecting the management of the british and french plantations in the columbian islands the persons who thus in enriching themselves are likewise doing the greatest good to their country 
are the proprietors of sugar mills who reside in hesifi altogether or who make frequent visits to it these men enter into company hear what is going on in the world read the few books which are to be obtained and soon assent to new ideas many of the merchants now possess this kind of property which has fallen into their hands either in payment of debts or by purchase and these men have no prejudices to conquer respecting any particular plan of operations some of the improvements which are proposed are of such self-evident utility as to carry with them conviction as soon as they are mentioned planting the sugar cane the lands in brazil are never grubbed up footnote i insert here a description of a machine for rooting up the stumps of trees by citizen saint victor member of the society of agriculture for the department of the seine it consists of a bar of forged iron about two feet eight inches long one inch thick towards the handle and of two inches toward the breech or platform the platform which is circular is fourteen inches in diameter this platform serves as the base of the chamber or furnace of the mine which is three inches in diameter and three inches eight lines in the length of its bore the stopper or tampion which serves as a plug to the mine is of the same diameter to enter within after a slight paper or wadding it is attached by a chain to the gun or mortar which last is eight inches in diameter about two inches above is added a small touch hole and pan the hole is directed in at an angle of forty five degrees and is primed with powder to communicate with the charge with which the chamber is filled up to the stopper this engine may be cast even with more facility in brass or bronze and in this case it must be a little thicker in all its dimensions in order to afford a resistance equal to that of forged iron use of the machine when the machine is charged with powder a small excavation is made with a pickaxe in the centre of the stump the machine is then placed in it so that the plug immediately touches the wood care must be taken to fill all vacancies either with stones or pieces of iron or wood more especially beneath the platform of the machine in order that the explosion of the powder may have its full effect on the stump of which if necessary the principal roots should first be cut if any appear on the surface of the ground near the stump that is to be eradicated when the machine is firmly fixed in its place the priming is put into the pan a slow match applied the length of which is sufficient to allow time to retire to a proper distance from the explosion journal of natural philosophy etc by w nicholson volume four page two forty three to two forty five in pernambuco the only means of rooting up the stumps which is known is that of digging deep trenches round about them close footnote either for planting the sugar-cane or for any other agricultural purposes the inconveniences of this custom are perceivable more particularly in high lands because all of these that are of any value are naturally covered with thick woods the cane is planted among the numerous stumps of trees by which means much ground is lost and as the sprouts from these stumps almost immediately spring forth such is the rapidity of vegetation the cleanings are rendered very laborious these shoots require to be cut down sometimes even before the cane has forced its way to the surface of the ground the labor likewise is great every time a piece of land is to be put under cultivation for the wood must be cut down afresh and although it cannot have reached the same size which the original timber had attained still as several years are allowed to pass between each period at which the ground is planted the trees are generally of considerable thickness the wood is suffered to remain upon the land until the leaves become dry then it is set on fire and these are destroyed with the brushwood and the small branches of the trees heaps are now made of the remaining timber which is likewise burnt this process is universally practised in preparing land for the cultivation of any plant i've often heard the method much censored as being injurious in the main to the soil though the crop immediately succeeding the operation may be rendered more luxuriant by it i have observed that the canes which grew upon the spots where the heaps of timber and large branches of trees have been burnt 
were of a darker and richer green than those around them and that they likewise overtopped them after the plant canes or those of the first year's growth are taken from the lands the field trash that is the dried leaves and stems of the canes which remain upon the ground are set fire to with the idea that the ratoons that is the sprouts from the old roots of the canes spring forth with more luxuriance and attain a greater size by means of this practice footnote it has been discontinued of late years by some persons and i have heard it said that the ratoon canes do not grow so well but that the land requires to be laid down for a much shorter period close footnote the ratoons of the first year are called in brazil socas those of the second year hesocas those of the third year terceiras socas and so forth after the roots are left unencumbered by burning the field trash the mold is raised around about them indeed if this was neglected many of these roots would remain too much exposed to the heat of the sun and would not continue to vegetate some lands will continue to give ratoons for five or even seven years but an average may be made at one crop of good ratoons fit for grinding another of inferior ratoons for planting or for making molasses to be used in the stillhouse and a third which affords but a trifling profit in return for the trouble which the cleanings give i have above spoken more particularly of highlands the low and marshy grounds called in brazil barzeas are however those which are the best adapted to the cane and indeed upon the plantations that do not possess some portion of this description of soil the crops are very unequal and sometimes almost entirely fail according to the greater or lesser quantity of rain which may chance to fall in the course of the year the varzeas are usually covered with short and close brushwood and as these admit from their rank and nature of frequent cultivation they soon become easy to work the soil of these when it is new receives the name of pau it trembles under the pressure of the feet and easily admits of a pointed stick being thrust into it and though dry to appearance it requires drainage the masape marl is often to be met with in all situations it is of a greenish white color and if at all wet it sticks very much to the hoe it becomes soon dry at the surface but the canes which have been planted upon it seldom fail to revive after rain even though a want of it should have been much felt the white marl bajo branco is less frequently found it is accounted extremely productive this clay is used to making bricks and coarse earthenware and also for claying the sugar red earth is occasionally met with upon the sides of hills near to the coast but this description of soil belongs properly to the cotton districts black mould is common and likewise a loose brownish soil in which a less or greater proportion of sand is intermixed it is i believe generally acknowledged that no land can be too rich for the growth of the sugar cane one disadvantage however attends soil that is quite new which is that the canes run up to a great height without sufficient thickness and are thus often lodged before the season for cutting them arrives i have seen rice planted upon lands of this kind on the first year to decrease their rankness and render them better adapted to the cane on the succeeding season some attempts have been made to plant cane upon the lands which reach down to the edge of the mangroves and in a few instances pieces of land heretofore covered by the salt water at the flow of the tide have been laid dry by means of draining for the same purpose but the desired success has not attended the plan for the canes have been found to be unfit for making sugar the syrup does not coagulate or at least does not attain that consistence which is requisite and therefore it can only be used for the distilleries the general mode of preparing the land for the cane is by holding it with hoes the negroes stand in a row and each man strikes his hoe into the ground immediately before him and forms a trench of five or six inches in depth he then falls back the whole row doing the same and they continue this operation from one side of the cleared land to the other or from the top of the hill to the bottom the earth which is thrown out of the trench remains on the lower side of it 
in the british colonies this work is done in a manner nearly similar but more systematically footnote besides the usual mode of holing mr edwards mentions the following method the planter instead of stocking up his ratoons and holing and planting the land anew suffers the stoles to continue in the ground and contents himself as his cane fields become thin and impoverished by supplying the vacant spaces with fresh plants history of the west indies volume two page two o seven close footnote the lands in brazil are not measured and everything is done by the eye the quantity of cane which a piece of land will require for planting is estimated by so many cartloads and nothing can be more vague than this mode of computation for the load which a cart can carry depends upon the condition of the oxen upon the nature of the road and upon the length of the cane such is the awkward make of these vehicles that much nicety is necessary in packing them and if two canes will about fit in a cart lengthwise much more will be conveyed than if the canes are longer and they double over each other the plough is sometimes used in lowlands upon which draining has not been found necessary but such is the clumsy construction of the machine of which they make use that six oxen are yoked to it footnote a plough drawn by two oxen constructed after a model which was brought from cayenne has been introduced in one or two instances close footnote upon high lands the stumps of the trees almost preclude the possibility of thus relieving the laborers the trenches being prepared the cuttings are laid longitudinally in the bottom of them and are covered with the greatest part of the mould which had been taken out of the trench the shoots begin to rise above the surface of the ground in the course of twelve or fourteen days the canes undergo three cleanings from the weeds and the sprouts proceeding from the stumps of the trees and when the land is poor and produces a greater quantity of the former and contains fewer of the latter the canes require to be cleaned a fourth time the cuttings are usually from twelve to eighteen inches in length but it is judged that the shorter they are the better if they are short and one piece of cane rots the space which remains vacant is not so large as when the cuttings are long and they by any accident fail the canes which are used for planting are generally ratoons if any exist upon the plantation but if there are none of these the inferior plant canes supply their places it is accounted more economical to make use of the ratoons for this purpose and many persons say they are less liable to rot than the plant canes in the british sugar islands the cuttings for plantings are commonly the tops of the canes which have been ground for sugar but in brazil the tops of the canes are all thrown to the cattle for there is usually a want of grass during the season that the mills are at work footnote the author of the nouveau voyage tome three page two eighteen mentions having covered the claying house belonging to a mill the property of his order with the tops of the sugar cane i never saw this practised in brazil and indeed labat says that they were not commonly put to this purpose in the parts of which he writes he says that a species of reed was usually employed in brazil there is a kind of grass which answers the purpose and is durable and this quality labat says that the cane tops possess however in brazil the leaves of the cocoa and other palms are generally used although it was the general custom to employ the cane tops for planting labat objects to them from his own authority upon the score of these not possessing sufficient strength to yield good canes the same opinion is general in pernambuco Close footnote. in the british colonies the canes are at first covered with only a small portion of mould and yet they are as long and forcing their way to the surface as in brazil though in the latter a more considerable quantity of earth is laid upon them i suppose that the superior fatness of the brazilian soil accounts for this upon rich soils the cuttings are laid at a greater distance and the trenches are dug farther from each other than upon those which have undergone more frequent cultivation or which are known to possess less power from their natural composition the canes which are planted upon the former throw out great numbers of sprouts which spread each way and although when they are young the land may appear to promise but a scanty crop they soon close and no opening is to be seen 
it is often judged proper to thin the canes by removing some of the suckers at the time that the last cleaning is given and some persons recommend that a portion of the dry leaves should also be stripped off at the same period but on other plantations this is not practiced the proper season for planting is from the middle of july to the middle of september upon highlands and from september to the middle of november in lowlands occasionally the great moisture of the soil induces the planter to continue his work until the beginning of december if his people are sufficiently numerous to answer all the necessary purposes the first of the canes are ready to be cut for the mill in september of the following year and the crop is finished usually in january or february in the british sugar islands the canes are planted from august to november and are ripe for the mill in the beginning of the second year thus this plant in brazil requires from thirteen to fifteen months to attain its proper state for the mill and in the columbian islands it remains standing sixteen or seventeen months i did not discover nor hear it mentioned that the cane is liable to destruction from the blast which is spoken of by mr edwards as doing much injury to the plantations in the british colonies the cane is subject certainly to several pests but they are of a nature which may be remedied the rats destroy great quantities and the fox is no less fond of it and when he gets among it he makes great havoc for he is only satisfied by cutting down great numbers of canes taking only a small portion of each there is also a strange custom among the lower orders of people they scruple not in passing a field to cut down and make a bundle of ten or a dozen canes from which they suck the juice as they go along or preserve some of them to carry home the devastation which is committed in this manner is incalculable in the fields that border upon much frequented paths it is a custom and many persons think that the owner has scarcely a right to prevent these attacks upon his property the planters of brazil have not yet arrived at the period which however is not far distant of being under the necessity of manuring their lands i heard of very few instances in which this is the practice the cane trash that is the rind of the cane from which the juice has been extracted is thus entirely lost with the exception of the small part of it which is eaten by the cattle the manure of cattle is likewise of no use lands are not yet of sufficient value to oblige each planter to confine himself to certain pieces of ground for certain purposes with any sort of regularity the population of the country is yet too scanty to make every man husband of what he possesses or to oblige him to draw in and give room for others as imperceptibly these others require that he should do so for the present the planter finds that it is more convenient to change from one piece of land to another as each becomes unfit to be cultivated he allows the wood to grow up again as soon as the ratoons no longer spring forth and yield him a sufficient profit to compensate for the trouble of cleaning them the otahetan or the bourbon cane has been brought from cayenne to pernambuco since the portuguese obtained possession of that settlement i believe the two species of cane are much alike and i have not been able to discover which of them it is its advantages are so apparent that after one trial on each estate it has superseded the small cane which was in general use the cayenne cane as it is called in pernambuco is of a much larger size than the common cane it branches so very greatly that the labor in planting a piece of land is much decreased and the returns from it are at the same time much more considerable it is not planted in trenches but holes are dug at equal distances from each other in which the cuttings are laid this cane bears the dry weather better than the small cane and when the leaves of the latter begin to turn brown those of the former still preserve their natural color a planter in the varzea told me that he had attained four crops from one piece of land in three years and that the soil in question had been considered by him as nearly worn out before he planted the cayenne cane upon it its rind is likewise so hard that the fox cannot make any impression upon it the business of the boiling house is in general so slovenly performed that i could not obtain any exact information respecting the returns in the manufacturing of it but most persons were of the opinion that here too some advantage was to be
perceived. The mill. A sugar plantation is doubtless one of the most difficult species of property to manage in a proper manner. The numerous persons employed upon it, their divers advocations, and the continual change of occupation give to the owner or his manager constant motives for exertion, innumerable opportunities of displaying his activity. A plantation ought to possess within itself all the tradesmen which are required for the proper furtherance of its concerns, a carpenter, a blacksmith, a mason, a potter, and others which it is needless to name in this place. It is a manufactory as well as a farm, and both these united must act in unison with each other and with the seasons of the year. The mill ought properly to commence grinding the cane in September, but few of them begin until the middle of October for the planting scarcely allows that they should set to work before the latter period. This is the time of merriment and of willing exertion, and for some weeks the negroes are all life and spirit, but the continuance of constant work for the whole of the day and part of the night at last fatigues them, and they become heavy and fall asleep wherever they chance to lay their heads. Footnote. Dormen oco como negro de ingenio. As sleepy as the negro of a sugar mill is a common proverb Close footnote. the mills for grinding the canes are formed of three upright rollers which are made of solid timber entirely cased or rather hooped in iron and the hoops are driven on to the wood before they become quite cool footnote in a few instances the upright iron plated rollers used in the columbian islands have been erected these have been sent from england and are much approved of particularly for mills that have the advantage of being turned by water. Close footnote. The improvement of the circular piece of framework called in Jamaica the dumb returner has not been introduced. Two men and two women are employed in feeding the mill with cane. A bundle of it is thrust in between the middle roller and one of the side rollers, and being received by one of the women, she passes it to the man who stands close to her for the purpose of being by him thrust between the other side roller and that of the center. This operation is continued five or six times until the juice has been extracted. There appears to be some mismanagement in this part of the work, for in the British colonies a second compression squeezes them completely dry, and sometimes even reduces them to powder, and the same occurred in Labat's time in the French islands. The dumb returner tends very greatly to prevent accidents, which occasionally occur in Brazil, through the carelessness or drowsiness of the slaves. The negroes who thrust the cane in between the rollers have sometimes allowed their hands to go too far, and one or both of them have been caught, in some instances, before assistance could be given. The whole limb, and even the body, has been crushed to pieces. In the mills belonging to owners who pay attention to the safety of their negroes, and whose wish it is to have everything in proper order, a bar of iron and a hammer are placed close to the rollers upon the table, mesa, which supports the cane. The bar is intended to be violently inserted between the rollers in case of accident, so as to open them, and thus set at liberty the unfortunate negro. In some instances I have seen lying by the side of the bar and hammer a well-tempered hatchet for the purpose of severing the limb from the body, if judged necessary. On these unfortunate occasions the screams of the negro have the effect of urging the horses which draw the mill to run with increased velocity. I am acquainted with two or three individuals who now work their mills with oxen, and they gave as the principal reason for this change the decrease of danger to the negroes who feed the mill, because such is the slowness of these animals, that an accident of the above description can scarcely happen, and indeed they are stopped rather than urged to proceed by noise. Some of the mills are turned by the water, but many more would admit of this improvement than take advantage of it. Most of the mills are worked by horses. There are no windmills in Pernambuco or in the other provinces which I visited. The expense which is incurred in making dams and in other alterations is doubtless considerable, and few persons can afford to lay out the money which these works require, but the conveniences of working by means of water are various. 
the number of animals required upon a plantation is reduced to less than one half less pasture land is necessary and fewer persons need to be employed the animals likewise which are thus rendered superfluous are those which are of the most cost the most liable to disease and the most difficult to feed great care and attention is requisite in preserving the horses or rather the mares for these are mostly employed in this description of work in a condition to go through with the crop and quantities of cane are cut up and given to them as well as molasses oxen are usually employed in drawing the carts and it is seldom thought necessary to afford any expensive food to these animals they pick up as much as they please of the cane trash which is thrown out of the mill and the cane tops are likewise given to them End of section seven. Section eight of Travels in Brazil, Volume Two by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four, Part Two. The Boiling House. In the Boiling House, the manufactory of sugar in Brazil requires great alteration the work is done in a slovenly manner very little attention being paid to the minutiae of the business the ovens over which the boilers are placed are rudely made and they answer the purpose for which they are intended in an imperfect manner enormous quantities of fuel are consumed and the negroes who attend to the ovens are soon worn out the juice runs from the cane as it is squeezed between the rollers into a wooden trough below and is from thence conveyed into a cistern made of the same material standing in the boiling house it is received from this cistern into the great cauldron as it is called which is a large iron or copper vessel the cauldron has previously been heated and when nearly full the temper is thrown into it and the liquor is suffered to boil it is now scummed with considerable labor the work of scumming is usually performed by free persons which is owing to two causes it demands considerable skill to which slaves seldom attain and the exertion which it requires induces the planter to pay a free man rather than injure one of his own people from this first cauldron or clarifier if i may so call it the liquor is ladled out into a long trough or cistern which is generally made of the trunk of one tree and in this it remains until it becomes tepid footnote in the french islands the liquor was passed through a cloth when conveyed from the first cauldron into the second of the trough i find no mention nouveau voyage etc tome four page twenty four close footnote the labor which the operation of ladling requires is excessive the heat and smoke of a boiling house in a tropical climate increases greatly the violence of the exertion from this trough which holds the whole contents of the great cauldron the liquor when sufficiently cool is suffered to run into the first copper and from this it is removed into a second and a third copper and some boiling houses contain a fourth from this it is ladled into large jars called formas when the master of the boiling house judges from the touch that the syrup has arrived at a proper consistence the jars are afterwards taken into the adjoining building in which the sugar is to undergo the process of claying the sugar after being clayed is invariably dried in the sun the management of the boiling houses in the british sugar islands is arranged in such a manner as to render the labor much less violent and much greater nicety has been introduced in the preparation of the juice the boilers are fixed at a considerable height over the largest ovens within which the fire is made each boiling house has two ovens one for heating the cauldron and the other for the three or four coppers the mouths of these are about half as broad as the ovens themselves enormous rolls of timber and branches of trees are prepared for the purpose of supplying these ovens with the fuel the negroes sometimes find it almost impossible to approach them owing to the excessive heat they throw out footnote the long improved ovens such as are used in the columbian islands are beginning to be introduced Close footnote. the manner of conducting the manufacture of sugar was from what i can collect very similar on the whole 
in the columbian islands about the beginning of the last century to that which is practised at present in the parts of brazil which i visited the temper which is usually made use of is the ashes of wood calcinated of which there are certain species preferred for this purpose lime is commonly used in the columbian islands and a few planters of pernambuco have lately introduced this alkali into their boiling houses but there exists a general prejudice against lime under the idea that the sugar with which it has been made is unwholesome and this has prevented many persons from adopting it no difficulty would be found in introducing it among the planters themselves because the ease of which it is obtained would soon urge them to give it a fair trial some plantations sell a great portion of their sugar and rum upon the spot and several of the lesser ones grind all their canes for the purpose of making molasses which they distill themselves or sell to the distillers of small capital who are very numerous therefore to the owners of these plantations in particular the opinion of the people of the country is of considerable moment the planters of brazil invariably follow the system of claying their sugars but the process is too generally known to require any account of it in this place the stillhouse the brazil planters are more backward in the management of their stillhouses than in any other department of their business the stills are earthen jars with small necks and likewise small at the bottom widening upwards considerably but again straightening on approaching the neck the foundation of a circular oven is formed and two of these jars are placed within it one on each side of it in a slanting position with the bottom within the oven and the neck on the outside and being thus secured the walls of the oven are built up against them and the top is closed in these stills have round caps carapuzas which fit on to the mouths of the jars and are rendered perfectly tight by a coat of clay being daubed round the edges after the wash has been into the still and the fire has been lighted underneath these caps have on one side a pipe of six inches in length attached to each of them and into this is inserted the end of a brass tube of four feet in length this tube is placed in a broad and deep earthen pot or jar containing cold water and the opposite end of it reaches beyond the pot the tube is fixed with a sufficient slant to allow the liquor running freely through it the liquor which is obtained from the first distillation is usually sold without undergoing any further process a second distillation is only practised in preparing a small quantity for the use of the planter's house the wash ripens for distillation in earthen jars similar to those which are used for claying sugar but they are closed at the bottom instead of being perforated as must necessarily occur with the latter no exact rules are followed in the quantities of each ingredient for making the wash because the distillers who are usually freemen differ much in the proportions of each ingredient until lately only a small number of the planters had any apparatus for distilling for it was their practice to sell the molasses which were produced to the small distillers many of the persons in the lower ranks of life possess one or two of these rude stills by which they derive a small profit without much trouble fuel is at hand for the pains of fetching it and scarcely any man is without a horse the women often attend to the still whilst the men are otherwise employed however since the opening of the ports of brazil to foreign trade considerable quantity of rum has been exported to north america and likewise the demand for it has been greater for lisbon than it was formerly the price has consequently risen which has induced many of the planters to distill their own molasses but although this plan has been adopted the stills are so totally inadequate to the distillation of large quantities of rum that few persons erect a sufficient number of them to consume the whole of the molasses with which the sugar furnishes them Footnote a few of the more wealthy planters have sent for large stills from england and have of course found their infinite superiority over those in common use even in the time of labat his countrymen were much before the pernambuco planters respecting the arrangement of the still houses they had copper stills close footnote lands a sugar plantation of pernambuco or paraiba 
does not require the enormous capital which is necessary in purchasing and establishing an estate of the same description in the Columbian islands but a certain degree of capital is requisite otherwise continual distress will be the consequence of entering into such a concern the instances of persons having purchased sugar plantations without any advance of money are however by no means rare and even the slaves or at least the major part of them have sometimes been obtained on long credit at exorbitant prices this plan was of more frequent occurrence at the time that the exclusive trading company existed at pernambuco its directors found that it was for the interest of those concerned to advance everything which the agriculturist required receiving in payment a certain proportion of his produce yearly although the company has for many years been abolished its accounts have not yet been wound up and it is astonishing to learn how considerable a number of plantations are yet indebted to it the reputed owners of many of those which are so circumstanced have oftentimes given to their predecessors only half the purchase money paying interest to the accountant of the company for the other half if they can raise a sufficient sum of money for the purpose they may strike off the principal of the debt but if this is not practicable they remain in perfect confidence that they will never be molested for it provided the interest is paid there are a few morgados or entailed estates in pernambuco and i believe in paraiba likewise and i have heard that in bahia there are a great many there are also capelados or chapel lands these estates cannot be sold and from this cause they are sometimes suffered to decay or at any rate they yield much less profit to the state than they would under other circumstances the capelado is formed in this manner the owner bequeaths a certain part of the produce or rent of the estate to some particular church for the purpose of having masses said for his own soul or for pious uses of a less selfish nature on this account the estate cannot according to law be sold so that if the next heir is not rich enough to work the mill himself he lets it to some one who possesses a sufficient number of negroes the portion which is due to the favored church being paid the owner then remains with the residue of the rent as his share of the profit now lands even with buildings upon them are let at so low a rate that after the church is paid and the tenant has deducted what he has expended in repairing the edifices of the plantation but a poor pittance remains for the owner the ingenio of Catu, near to goiana is placed in these circumstances the owner lives in the neighborhood of the great house or principal residence and the only advantage which he derives from the possession of this most excellent and extensive estate is that of residing rent-free upon one corner of it and now and then receiving a trifling sum of money whereas if it could be sold he would immediately receive a sufficient sum to place him in easy circumstances and the estate would undergo improvement for the occupier would then have a direct investment in its advancement i might mention several other plantations which are situated in like manner the property of sugar planters which is directly applied to the improvement or to the usual work of their plantations is not subject to be seized for debt this privilege was granted for the encouragement of the formation of such establishments but it may have a contrary effect the planter is allowed many means of evading the demands of his creditors and everything is permitted to act in his favor but thus it is that the government legislates the revenue is thought of instead of equity being regarded as the primary consideration nor does the plan act in the manner which the establishers of it imagine that it would for the estates which are laboring under the disadvantage of being held by men who require such a law as this to enable them to keep possession of the property would doubtless nine times out of ten yield a greater profit if they passed into other hands they could not be in worse and they might fall into better the government need not fear that good estates will in the present state of brazil remain long untenanted besides the rulers of that kingdom may be very sure that the merchants will be more careful how they lend their money and this may sometimes prevent an honest man from obtaining what he requires for the due advancement of his labors footnote 
the alvara was passed the twenty first of january eighteen o nine one to the same effect had been passed on the twenty second of september seventeen fifty eight for the captaincy of rio de janeiro this was extended to other captaincies at first as a temporary law but it was afterwards several times renewed and it was at last allowed to be in force in all the ultramarine dominions of portugal by the alvará of the sixth of july eighteen o seven however as there were some restrictions attached to the law that of eighteen o nine was passed by this last in the first place upon sugar estates which are in working state and do work regularly and that have under cultivation that quantity of ground which is requisite for the carrying on of the work of the mill and for the support of the slaves executions can only be carried into effect upon one-third of the net produce of such plantations the other two-thirds being left for the expenses of cultivation and for the administration that is for the support of the owner secondly executions can however be made if the debt is equal to or above the value of the estate but the whole of the slaves the cattle the lands and the implements belonging to the ingenio must form one valuation nor can they be separated but they must all be taken as parts of the ingenio thirdly if there are more debts than one and these together make up the sum which may cause the plantation to be subject to execution still some law proceedings must be entered into by which these several debts may be placed in such a form as to be considered as one debt thus the government does those things which ought not to be done and leaves undone those things which ought to be done Close footnote. most of the plantations of the first class are however in the hands of wealthy persons and this is becoming more and more the case every day the estates which may be said to constitute this class are those which are situated near to the sea coast that is from two to sixteen miles from it which possess a considerable portion of lowland adapted to the planting of the sugar-cane another of virgin wood good pasture land for nature must do everything and the possibility of being worked by water the rains are more regular near to the coast than at a distance from it this and the facility of conveying the produce of the estate down some of the small streams or creeks to a market are the particular advantages which are derived from the vicinity of the sea the slaves are fed with more ease and less expense and the quantity of food which they themselves have the means of obtaining from the sea and from the rivulets enables them to be less dependent upon the rations of the master than the slaves of the mata or districts between the coast and the sertão in a country that is without roads upon which a wheeled carriage can be drawn with any degree of regularity of pace or of safety the difficulty of removing the large chests in which the sugar is packed is a most serious consideration and this inconvenience alone decreases the value of lands however productive they may be which are so situated if a person wishes to purchase property of this description he will discover that the plantations which are conveniently placed are only to be obtained at high comparative prices and by a considerable advance of money mata may be purchased even without any advance and under the agreement of small yearly payments of eight to ten per cent upon the price the lands of sugar plantations are appropriated to five purposes these are the woods the lands for planting canes those which are cleared for pasturage the provision grounds for the negroes and the lands which are occupied by free people the woods occupy a very considerable portion of the lands belonging to a plantation in most cases more than half the estate is yet covered with wood but still i do not think from what i saw and heard that these forests contain so much fine timber as has been imagined a tree of any species of valuable timber must now be purchased very little consideration is given to the quality of wood that is destroyed in the works of a plantation and in many cases very unnecessarily the fences are made of stakes which are formed of the trunks of trees driven into the ground and to these are fastened horizontally the stems of younger plants the best timber rather than that of inferior quality is selected for this purpose that it may last the longer under exposure to the heat of the sun 
and to the rains the fuel likewise is another most enormous source of destruction and although for this purpose some selection might be made of the qualities of timber which are less valuable no thought is given to the matter the havoc which is committed in bringing out of the woods a tree that has been felled for any particular purpose is likewise immense for many trees are cut down to make a path from the usual road to the spot upon which the tree which is to be brought out is laying that the oxen may enter to convey it away it will be said that the great object is to get rid of the superabundant quantities of wood and this is no doubt the case but according to the present system very little land is radically cleared of wood and yet the large and valuable timber is undergoing rapid destruction virgin woods however do certainly yet exist to a great extent it is said that those of ape Pucos, which is near to hesifi are connected with the woods in the neighbourhood of guayana a distance of fifteen leagues of the lands for planting canes i have already treated each sugar plantation has one large field in which the buildings are placed it is very rarely that estates are supplied with a second enclosure consequently the cattle or at least that part of them which are required before and after crop time for the work which is necessary to be done during the whole of the year always remain upon the spot these fields are sometimes of considerable extent i have seen some of three miles in circumference or even more few owners of estates can manage to preserve the field free from brushwood the horses which work the mill are usually removed from the plantation as soon as the crop is finished and are often sent to the sertão to pass the winter and return again just before crop time on the following year indeed such is the importance of having good pasturage for these animals between the crops and the advantage of allowing some of them to rest two years that every plantation should have a cattle estate in the interior of the country as a necessary appendage the oxen are often driven to the seashore after the crop is over if the estate is conveniently situated for this purpose and are left to graze under the cocoa trees until the following season but they are fond of the young cocoa plants and therefore it is not in every situation that this can be done as the planters commonly feed their slaves instead of allowing them a certain portion of each week for the purpose of supplying themselves the lands which are set apart for raising their provisions are of great importance for it does not answer to the planter to purchase the vegetable part of the food the root of the mangioc and the kidney bean are the two plants which are chiefly cultivated of the first of these i shall soon treat more at large maize is not much used in this part of the country an estate contains in general much more land than its owner can manage or in any way employ even under the present extravagant system of changing from one piece of ground to another i call it extravagant because it requires so much space for its operations and performs these with more labor than is necessary this overplus of land gives room for the habitations of free people in the lower ranks of life who live upon the produce which they raise by their own labor the tenures by which these persons hold the lands which they occupy are most insecure and this insecurity constitutes one of the great engines of that power which the landholder enjoys over his tenants no agreements are drawn out but the proprietor of the land verbally permits the peasant who applies to him for a place of residence to inhabit a cottage upon his lands under the condition of paying him a trifling rent from four to eight mil hayes one to two guineas or rather more and he is allowed to cultivate as much ground as he possibly can by himself but the rent is increased if he calls in any one to assist him sometimes the verbal arrangement which is entered into is that the tenant shall perform some service in lieu of making his payment in money the service required is for instance that of going upon errands or seeing that the woods are not destroyed by persons who have not obtained permission from the owner to cut down timber or other offices of the same description the buildings the buildings which are usually to be seen upon the plantations are the following the mill which is either turned by water or by cattle some of the plantations possess both of these 
owing to the failure of the water in the dry season and indeed there are few estates upon which the crops are so large as to require that there should be both the boiling house which is usually attached to the mill and is the most costly part of the apparatus for the coppers etc must be obtained from europe the claying house or casa de porgar which is oftentimes connected with the boiling house it is generally made use of as the still house or distillery the chapel which is usually of considerable dimensions this building and all the foregoing are almost universally constructed of brick the dwelling house for the owner or manager to this is usually attached a stable for the saddle horses the dwelling houses are frequently made of timber and mud the row of negro dwellings which i have described in another place as looking like neglected almshouses in england and are made of the same materials as the house of the owner from the appearance of the negro huts an idea may usually be formed of the disposition of the owner of a plantation all these buildings are covered with tiles the estates have no regular hospital for the sick negroes but one of the houses of the row is oftentimes set apart for this purpose the stocks in which disorderly slaves are placed stand in the claying house stock of those estates which i have seen i think that the average number of negroes sent to daily labor in the field does not reach forty for each for although there may be upon a plantation this number of males and females of a proper age for working still some of them will always be sick or employed upon errands not directly conducive to the advancement of the regular work an estate which possesses forty able negroes male and females an equal number of oxen and the same of horses can be very well worked and if the lands are good that is if there is a fair proportion of low and high lands fit for the culture of the sugar-cane such an estate ought to produce a number of chests of sugar of fifteen hundred weight each equal to that of the able slaves i speak of forty slaves being sufficient because some descriptions of work are oftentimes performed by freemen thus for instance the sugar boilers the person who clays the sugar the distiller the cartman and even some others are frequently free only a very small proportion of the sugar will be muscovado if the business is conducted with any degree of management i have heard it said by many planters that the molasses will pay almost every expense and that if rum is made the proceeds of the molasses are rendered fully equal to the usual yearly expenditure the negroes may be valued at thirty-two pounds each oxen at three pounds each and horses at the same but by management the last two may be obtained at lower prices a sugar plantation of the first class with suitable buildings may be reckoned as being worth from seven thousand to eight thousand pounds and some few are valued as high as ten thousand pounds but an advance of one-sixth of the price would probably be accepted the remainder to be paid by yearly installments the inland plantations may be reckoned at from three thousand to five thousand pounds and a few are rather higher but a smaller advance would be required than upon the purchase of prime plantations and the installments would be more moderate plantations of the first class ought to have eighty negroes at least and an increased number of animals owing to their capacity of employing more hands footnote the following is a statement of the number of cases of sugar exported from pernambuco from the year eighteen o eight to eighteen thirteen eighteen o eight four thousand two hundred and seventy one cases eighteen o nine twelve thousand eight hundred and one cases eighteen ten nine thousand eight hundred and forty cases eighteen eleven seven thousand seven hundred and forty nine cases eighteen twelve eight thousand five hundred and seventy seven cases eighteen thirteen nine thousand and twenty two cases i obtained it from my friend mr i c pagan who resided at hesifi during a considerable portion of the time close footnote the only carts which are used upon the plantations are very clumsily made a flat surface or table mesa made of thick and heavy timber of about two feet and a half broad and six feet in length is 
fixed upon two wheels of solid timber with a movable axle tree a pole is likewise fixed to the cart these vehicles are always drawn by four oxen or more and as they are narrow and the roads upon which they must travel are bad they are continually overturning the negroes who drive the carts have generally some indulgencies with which their fellow slaves are not favored from the greater labor which this business requires and from the continual difficulty and danger to which they are exposed owing to the overturning of the carts and the unruliness of the oxen in the whole management of the concerns of a plantation the want of mechanical assistance to decrease the labor of the workmen must strike every person who is in the habit of seeing them and of paying any attention to the subject i will mention one instance when bricks or tiles are to be removed from one place to another the whole gang of negroes belonging to the state is employed in carrying them each man takes three or perhaps four bricks or tiles upon his head and marches off gently and quietly he lays them down where he is desired so to do and again returns for three or four more thus thirty persons sometimes pass the whole day in doing the same quantity of work that two men with wheelbarrows would have performed with equal ease in the same space of time End of section eight. Chapter five of Travels in Brazil, Volume two by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five Agriculture, Cotton. This most valuable plant has now become of more importance to Pernambuco even than the sugar cane owing to the great demand for the cotton of that province and of those adjoining to it in the british markets new establishments are forming yearly for the cultivation of the cotton plant notwithstanding the great inconveniencies which must often be experienced in accomplishing this object the districts which are chosen for the purpose and universally allowed to be the best adapted to its growth are far removed from the seacoast arid and oftentimes very scantily supplied with fresh water. Absolute distress is felt from a want of water in some of these situations, at the time that other parts of the country are enjoying perfect ease in this respect. The opinion is very general that the cotton plant will not thrive in the neighborhood of the coast. Footnote. I have seen some fine cotton shrubs at the distance of one or two leagues, and even less from the sea coast but the attempts that have been made to cultivate it to any extent in such situations have not from what i have seen and heard met with the desired success might not the sea island seed be sent for and a trial of it be made the pernambuco cotton is superior to that of every other part excepting the small quantity which is obtained from those islands bolingbroke in his voyage to the demarari says that on the sea-coast the british settlers also commenced the culture of cotton and found that land to answer much better than the soil up the river in phillips collection etc page eighty one the cotton of the settlements upon the part of south america of which he writes is very inferior to that of pernambuco in the third report of the directors of the african institution page twenty three i find it stated that the saline air of the seashore which generally destroys coffee is favorable to cotton in page twenty seven it is said that cotton never fails to degenerate when it has been propagated in the same ground for many years without a change of seed Close footnote. and that frequent changes of weather are injurious to it the dry and wet seasons are doubtless more regularly marked at a distance from the sea but if any variation is felt in such situations it is from a want of rain and not from a superabundance of it the cotton plant requires that a great portion of the year should be dry for if much rain falls when the pot is open the wool is lost it becomes yellow decays and is rendered completely unfit for use the soil which is preferred for its culture is a deep red earth with veins of yellow occasionally running through it this becomes extremely hard after a long interval without rain the cotton plantations are yearly receding farther into the interior wherever the certain plains do not prevent this recession 
the plantations of this description which are formerly established nearer to the coast are now employed in the rearing of other plants the constant supply of new lands which the cotton plant requires for it is judged necessary to allow the land to rest for several years before it undergoes cultivation a second time may in some degree account for this perhaps too the rapid increase of the population upon the coast may have had some effect in forcing back those who plant an article of trade to give place to others who cultivate the necessary food for the inhabitants of the country the cotton is often sold by the planter in caroso that is before it had been separated from the seed to persons whose livelihood is obtained in preparing it for the export market but as the labor of conveyance is of course considerably increased while it is in the state the dealers establish themselves near to the plantations they recede as the planters recede some years ago a number of the machines for separating the cotton from the seed were to be seen within two leagues of hecife a few years after they were removed to guayana and now the principal resorts of the dealers are limoeiro and bon jardin places as will have been seen which are several leagues distant from the coast the lands are cleared for planting cotton in the usual manner by cutting down the trees and burning them and the holes for the seeds are dug in quadrangular form at the distance of six feet from each other three seeds are usually put in each hole in the british colonies it is found necessary to make use of eight or ten seeds the time for planting is in january after the primeras aguas or first waters or at any rate as soon in the year as the rain has fallen maize is usually planted among the cotton shrubs three crops and sometimes four are obtained from the same plants but the second crop is that which generally produces the finest wool the shrub has a pleasing appearance whilst it is in full leaf and is covered with its most beautiful yellow blossoms but when the pods begin to open and the leaves to wither its thin and scraggly branches are left uncovered and the plant much resembles a large black currant bush that has been left unpruned for a length of time the cotton is gathered in nine or ten months the machine for detaching it from the seed is simple and might be rendered still more so two small rollers are placed horizontally in a frame and nearly touching each other at each end of these rollers there are grooves into which a cord runs which is connected at the distance of a few yards with a large wheel to which handles are fixed and this is turned by two persons the rollers are so formed as to turn in opposite directions so that as the cotton is thrust against them with a hand it is carried to the other side but the seeds remain for the opening between the rollers is not sufficiently broad to allow them to pass footnote i have heard that the seeds would form a very good food for cattle if they could be completely freed from all particles of wool here lies the difficulty close footnote the machine which is used in the british colonies seems to be of the same construction in the main but it is still more simple for the rollers are made to turn by means of the feet of the person who holds the cotton to them footnote in lobat's time these machines were likewise worked by the feet of the person employed in thrusting the cotton against the rollers Close footnote. after it has undergone the above process some particles of seeds which have been accidentally broken still remain and of other substances which must be removed for this purpose a heap of cotton is made and is beaten with large sticks this is a most injurious operation by which the fibre is broken and as the value of the commodity to the manufacturer chiefly depends upon the length of the fibre no trouble ought to be grudged to avoid this practice the seeds adhere firmly to each other in the pod mr edwards speaks of this species in the british colonies and gives to it the name of kidney cotton saying that he believes it to be the true cotton of brazil footnote mr edwards calls the species of the cotton plant which is cultivated in the columbian islands the common jamaica of which the staple is coarse but strong it is difficult to clean owing to the brittleness of the seeds it is strange as mr edwards remarks that the british cotton planters should be acquainted with species of the shrub which produces finer wool and yet continue to rear this inferior quality 
Close footnote. The yellow or nankeen cotton is likewise to be found at Pernambuco, but it does not form an article of cultivation, being regarded rather as a curiosity. I have seen some species of wild cotton, of which, however, as I have neither note nor specimen, I cannot pretend to give a description. The profits which are obtained in favorable years by the planters of cotton are enormous, but frequently disappointments are experienced. Oftentimes a whole crop is totally lost, and instead of large returns, the year proves entirely unproductive, or, after a fair promise, the grub, the caterpillar, the rain, or the excessive drought destroys all hope until the following season. The other great agricultural object, the sugar cane, is not subject to these numerous and ruinous reverses, for even if the year is unfavorable, at least enough to pay the expenses may be expected. I have heard it urged that the market is very little affected by the supposed failure of a crop, but it must be remembered that in a country of such vast extent, one quarter may escape all mishap, whilst another is unfortunate. Footnote. The following is a statement of the export of cotton from Pernambuco from the year 1808 to 1813. It was furnished to me by my friend Mr. I. C. Pagan. In the year 1808, 26,877 bags. In 1809, 47,512 bags. 1810, 50,103 bags. 1811, 28,245 bags. 1812, 58,824 bags. And in 1813, 65,327 bags. From this it would appear that in saying, at chapter 1, that the export from thence at the present time is between 80,000 and 90,000 bags annually, I have overrated the real number, but it will be seen that the increase has been considerable from 1812 to 1813, and I know that it still continues to increase as rapidly, if not more so. Close footnote. The quality of the cotton which is produced in South America, either to the north or south of Pernambuco, is inferior to that of the province of which I am treating. The cotton of Sierra is not so good, and the cotton of Maranhão is still coarser. Cotton is the staple commodity of both these ports. Proceeding from Pernambuco to the south, the cotton of Bahia is not so fine, and the small quantity which is produced at Rio de Janeiro is not so good as that of Bahia. In treating of sugar and cotton, I have stated the chief points in which the planters in the Colombian islands and those of Brazil principally differ. Those of my readers to whom this subject is particularly interesting may be referred to the well-known work which I have consulted. Footnote. Edwards, History of the West Indies. Close footnote. The Mangiac Plants. The Mangiac requires good land and the same spot will not produce two crops successively. It must be allowed to rest for one or two years or more. The operation of planting it is simple, and differs in no respect from that which was practiced formerly by the Indians. Footnote. History of Brazil, Volume 1, page 233. Close footnote. The flour which is made from this fruit is called farinha de pão, or stick flour. Footnote. Mr. Southey says when the mangioc failed, what was called stick flour, in Portuguese farinha de pau, was made from the wood of the urucuri iba, which they cut in pieces and bruised, and this being less likely to corrupt than the mangioc, is now generally used in the Brazilian ships. Volume 1, page 233. The farinha de pau, which is at present used in these ships, is made from the mangioc, and the name of stick flower is by no means in opposite, for it always requires to be picked before it is used, to take out the bits of the husk and of the hardened fibers of the root which may chance to remain. But the name may have, and most probably has, commenced with the stick flower of the Urukuri Iba, and when the substance from which it was made was changed, the name still continued. I refer the reader to the history of Brazil for a further account of the mangioc. Close footnote. There are several species of the mangiac plant of which some are adapted to highlands 
and others to low and moist situations but when the plant is cultivated upon the latter hillocks must be raised else the root would decay cattle are fed upon the root and stalk these are first prepared by being cut into small pieces and exposed to the sun for several hours if this was not done the food would be injurious to them i have however seen some of the draught oxen that have become so habituated to it as to eat the root quite fresh without receiving any apparent injury in the manner that the human body becomes callous to the most violent medicines by long custom i had in my possession whilst i resided at jaguaribi one of these animals which generally once in the course of every week at least contrived to get out of the enclosure and pass part of the night in some neighbouring mangiac ground he was so dexterous in tearing up the stalk with a root attached to it that the marks of his footsteps alone made us quite confident of the nature of the thief whilst i was at itamaraca i lost a sheep which had drank of the juice of the mangiac the negroes and other persons were making farina and a trough stood under the press for the purpose of receiving the juice the sheep were attempting to come under the shed for the purpose of reaching some of the roots of which they are extremely fond one of them approached the trough which was filled with the juice and although it was almost immediately perceived and driven away still the effect of the small quantity which had been taken began to show itself in a very few minutes the animal tottered and fell rising again and again falling oil was poured down its throat in considerable quantities but to no purpose the body swelled to an enormous size and the animal was dead in about ten minutes after it had drank of the juice the insect which is mentioned by piso quoted by mr southey under the name of taparu and is said to be generated by the juice of the mangiac after it has become putrid i have often seen it is still known under the same name which however is not peculiar to this worm but it is likewise applied to maggots of every kind the juice is not kept for any purpose but it remains in the trough occasionally for some days owing to the carelessness of the person under whose care these things are placed of the deadly nature of this worm i never heard any mention the species of mangiac which is called manipeba is prohibited owing to the greater activity of its poisonous juice and it is now almost extirpated it had the advantage of greater durability underground those kinds which are usually planted decay if the stalk is broken off but the stalks of the mani pepa may be cut away and the root will still continue sound until on the following year a new stalk springs up i have heard it said that in the dry soils of the mata a few of the other varieties of this plant will allow the same treatment although the mangiac plant requires a dry situation still when the rains fall in january the crops fall short for it is in this month immediately after the first waters that the principal plantations of it are made the brazilians have a peculiar name for each part of this plant the root is called mangioca the stalk maniva the leaves manisoba and the juice manipuera there is one species of the plant of which the juice is harmless it bears the name of macacheira its root never grows to a great size and it is therefore rather planted as an article of luxury than as regular food from this species less juice is extracted than from the roots of equal dimensions of any of the other kinds of mangiac the rind of those species of mangiac which are in general use is of a dark brown color but there is one kind of which the rind is white the most expensive part of the process of making the flower of the mangiac consists in disengaging the rind from the root this is done with difficulty by means of a piece of a broken blunt knife a sharp pebble or a small shell which one of each person is supplied in this work a considerable number of persons must be occupied to furnish employment to the wheel which grinds the root this wheel is placed in a frame and a handle is fixed to it on each side by which it may be turned by two men one of them working at each of the handles a trough stands under the wheel and the wheel is cased in copper which is made rough by means of holes punched in it the sides of the holes are not filed smooth the mangiac is thrust against the wheel whilst it is turned with great velocity and being by this means ground it falls into the trough underneath 
from hence the ground pulp is put into a press that the juice may be extracted and after it has undergone sufficient pressure the pulp or paste massa is removed on to a hot hearth upon which a person is employed to keep it in continual motion that it may not be burnt when quite crisp it is taken off the hearth and on being suffered to cool is in a state to be made use of there is another mode of preparing the mangiac for food it is put into water in a panere or closed basket and is allowed to remain there for some days until the root becomes soft from which the mangiac when it is in this state is called mangioca moli it is prepared in this manner for the purpose of making cakes etc but not generally for food i tried to introduce the farina made from steeped mangiac among the slaves whilst i resided at jaguaribe the flour which was made from it was much finer than that which is obtained in the usual manner but the negroes did not like it so well and i did not think it wholesome for them on consideration and therefore the old way was continued the mangiac must have made a certain advance toward putrefaction before it becomes sufficiently soft to be bruised and this cannot fail i should suppose to be injurious the smell from the mangioca moli is extremely offensive and is one of the annoyances in walking the streets of hesifi in which it is sold the smell is however entirely removed after the farina has been some minutes upon the oven the cocoa tree the sandy soils of the coast in which this plant seems to delight would if they were not cultivated with it remain almost useless but from the produce which the cocoa tree yields they are rendered very valuable the lands which are occupied by this plant alone yield a settled income to the owners of them without much labor whilst the cultivation of any other requires considerable toil however the long period of from five to seven years which the tree requires before it bears fruit cannot fail to be considered as a drawback upon the profits which it ultimately affords and upon the great age to which it arrives however perhaps there are few trees of equal size that yield fruit in so short a period it is a most valuable production of which every part is appropriated to some useful purpose the brazilians say that it affords them both food and shelter of the trunk and of the leaves their huts are built of its fibrous roots baskets are made and cordage of the outward husk its fruit renders them meat and drink and an excellent oil is likewise to be obtained by skimming the juice which may be pressed from the pulp the cocoa is in general use in cookery among all ranks of people and it forms one of the chief articles of internal trade when a plantation of this tree is about to be established the ripe cocos from which the plants are to be reared are placed in the ground about twelve inches below the surface in long and almost united rows for the convenience of being watered they are frequently placed in this manner under the eaves of houses which saves much trouble for by the accumulation of water from the housetop each shower of rain produces sufficient moisture and the owner is relieved from any farther trouble in this respect at the expiration of five months the shoots began to make their appearance above ground and at the end of twelve months from the time that the cocos were first put into the earth the young plants may be removed they are then placed at the distance of eight or ten yards from each other upon the land that has been cleared for the purpose of receiving them as soon as they have once taken root and by far the major part of them fail not so to do very little care is necessary they must however be preserved tolerably free from brushwood at least during the first years and indeed at all times the fruitfulness of the tree will be increased if it is allowed its due space the carapato or castor tree this plant as well as the cocoa may be reared in sandy soils but it will flourish with more luxuriance upon those that are of a richer kind the oil which is extracted from the seed is in general use for lamps and other purposes but neither is it eaten nor known as a medicine it is however administered as an outward application it is given to animals that have drank the juice of the mangiac and is sometimes successful in forcing the poison back from the stomach the plant is much cultivated but it is frequently to be seen growing spontaneously brazil wood the wood from which is extracted the beautiful red dye which is so much esteemed in europe 
is i believe generally supposed to be peculiar footnote mr clarkson in his work on the impolicy of the slave trade page thirteen and fourteen mentions that a small billet was brought to england from the coast of africa among a parcel of barwood that it was found to produce a color that emulated the carmine which was deemed to be so valuable in the dyeing trade that an offer was immediately made of sixty guineas per ton for any quantity that could be procured Close footnote. to the country to which it has given a name footnote history of brazil volume one page nineteen close footnote it is often called in pernambuco from whence i imagine that it is exclusively exported baon da hyena or queen's wood owing to the circumstances of the trade in it being a government monopoly and it is exported to europe on account of the crown no care has been taken to prevent a scarcity of the wood and indeed its ultimate extirpation it is cut down unmercifully wherever it is met with by the officers who are appointed for this purpose without any regard being paid to the size of the tree no plantations have been formed of it and consequently it is now rarely to be seen within many leagues of the coast the labor which is required in obtaining it is now considerable for the weight of the wood renders its conveyance very difficult upon the backs of horses and this is the only manner in which it can be carried the pay which is given by the government to the carriers is below the usual rate for work equally laborious and therefore a wide source of oppression is afforded the carrier receives with his load a slip of paper declaring the weight of the wood which he is conveying this is to be presented by him at the intendencia da marina or dockyard at Recife, and he must await until the wood is again weighed and the paper again countersigned before he can return home these men are delayed sometimes for several days before they are permitted to return and they find that it is in their interest to make many presents to their inferior officers that they may be quickly dispatched here the old system of indifference to what is just still most glaringly continues this account of the treatment of the men who convey the wood i receive from several who have been employed in the business if the trade in the wood was to be laid open it would only tend to its scarcity still more speedily than under the existing system but as soon as it became scarce it would be rendered an object worthy of cultivation however as long as it is to be obtained in its wild state and enormous profits can be made the government will probably continue to supply the market on their own account every sugar plantation might cultivate a great number of these trees without any additional land being required to be cleared for the purpose of planting them the fences of the cercados or fields might be strengthened by the addition of the brazil inserted at intervals instead of other trees being used in this way i never saw the plant but i have heard it described in the following manner it is not a lofty tree and at a short distance from the ground innumerable branches spring forth and extend in every direction in a straggling irregular and unpleasing manner practice is requisite to obtain a knowledge of the tree for the valuable portion of it is the heart and the outward coat of wood has not any peculiarity the leaves are small and never cover the branches luxuriantly footnote labat is much enraged in his works of the voyage de chevalier des marchais à caen etc at the idea of the portuguese monopolizing the trade in brazil wood by persuading all the world that the only true wood came from pernambuco or fernamburg as he calls it he imagines that the brazil is the same as the logwood close footnote the tata juba or fustic this is a species of wood producing a yellow dye which is well known in england it is of spontaneous growth a demand has lately been made for it and destruction has followed wherever the plant can be met with the feijão or kidney bean is planted in april and may with the mandioc it is much used in the neighborhood of the coast by the free part of the population but it is not produced in sufficient quantities to form a common food for the negroes when it is cooked with the juice of the pulp of the coconut it makes a most excellent dish in the cotton districts it forms one of the chief articles of the negroes food milho or maize 
is planted with mangia and sometimes in the cane fields but as the best crop is obtained by planting it with the mangioc in january few persons sow it at any other time in the inland districts it is sown with the cotton and in such situations yields more plentifully than in the lands which border upon the coast boiled maize is a common breakfast for the slaves in the cotton districts the dish resembles thick pea soup and is far from being unpalatable if sugar or treacle is added the people call it angu gimilio the banana plant is too well known to take up much space here there are in pernambuco three species of it the banana corta or short banana this is a small fruit not exceeding two inches in length the banana comprida or long banana which is the plantain and lately the third species has been introduced and has obtained the strange name of the banana g quattro vincimes or four vincimes banana because the clusters of the fruit are so large that each cluster may be sold for four vincimes rather than five pennies i do not think that as much utility is derived from the plant as it is capable of affording it is not so generally used as a food by the negroes as it ought to be the banana corta with dry farina is a common breakfast among people of color the patatas of these there are several species but that which i had the most opportunities of seeing was the patata rocha or purple potato which is so called from the purple tinge of the pulp after it has been boiled this is the best of the tribe the taste is pleasant and would be still more so if it was not rather sweet the patata is a creeping plant and is reproduced from the roots or from the sprouts of the branches if the branches of roots that have been pulled up remain upon the ground and a shower of rain falls soon after they have been broken off their vegetation will recommence the patatas are at present planted more as a luxury for the planter's house than as food for the negroes but i do not think that there is any plant which is more capable or or even so capable of affording assistance to the mangioc as this and perhaps it might supply its place the mangioc should be supplanted if anything else could be discovered to answer the purpose of a staple article of food for it is uncertain in yielding its crops and requires the best land to neither of these disadvantages would i rather think the patata be found subject the european potato has been planted in several instances at pernambuco the first crop was as well tasted as the roots from which it was produced but the potatoes were small a second crop being obtained from the same family of roots has been swedish and on advancing the potatoes become still more similar to the patata of the country yet the plants appear to be totally different from each other for the brazil patata or potato is produced from a creeper tobacco is planted upon almost all the sugar plantations and by a majority of persons of the lower classes for their own use a considerable quantity is imported from the southern provinces of brazil into pernambuco the ants do not molest the plant but in the parts of the country which are much infested by these insects the peasants mix the seed of the tobacco with wood ashes before they strew with it the ground which they are about to sow the ants have an antipathy to the ashes and thus the seed is preserved rice is very little cultivated in pernambuco but at maranhão it forms the second object of trade the use of it in pernambuco is inconsiderable from the idea that it is unwholesome for the negroes and indeed i never met with any of the africans who preferred it to other kinds of food coffee and cacao are yet planted as experiments for their introduction into pernambuco is recent ipecacuana although this is at present only to be found in a wild state i have inserted it here for it must shortly take its place among cultivated plants the small quantity exported is procured by the indians and other persons of the same rank and habits of life in the thickest woods it thrives most in the shade the plant is destroyed also by many of the larger kinds of game to which it serves as food there are two species of it which are distinguished by the names of white and black ipecacuana the latter is that which is used for medicinal purposes in europe footnote labat is angry at a notion which was entertained in his time by some people that the black ipecacuana was only to be found near the gold mines in the interior of rio de janeiro 
he speaks of a third species of ipecacuana which he distinguishes by the epithet of gris and he likewise mentions the white kind both of these he says answer the same purpose as the black but a larger dose is required nouveau voyage etc tome six page twenty nine close footnote the white is used by the brazilians in colds and coughs and is taken to purify the blood after a fever ginger is indigenous but it is now rarely to be found in the wild state footnote vieira in his letters mentions a received tradition that emmanuel ordered all the spice plants to be rooted up lest the indian trade should be injured and the ginger was the only spice which escaped because it was underground he does not appear to have recollected the impossibility of carrying such an order into effect upon the continent history of brazil volume one note to page thirty two dr ajuda alludes to this order in his discurso sobre a utilidade da instituição de jardins etc and he adds that a few cinnamon trees at pernambuco escaped as well as the ginger page eight close footnote the white ginger is that which is in general use malagueta pepper is a small shrub which is to be seen under the eaves of almost every cottage the pods are of a bright scarlet color of about one inch in length and one quarter in breadth it is a hardy plant for although it droops under excessive drought it is seldom destroyed by it often are to be seen at the same time and upon the same bush the blossoms and the green and the ripe scarlet pods wherever the shrub springs up care is taken of it for the people of all ranks are from habit almost unable to eat their food without the malagueta the pods are bruised when about to be used and either form an ingredient in every dish or they are served up in all the sauces footnote on one article guinea grains or malagueta pepper the duty has been doubled not with a view of increasing the revenue but of operating as a prohibition of the use of it as it is supposed to have been extensively employed in the brewing of malt liquor the directors however have great reason to doubt the existence of the deleterious qualities ascribed to this drug as they find it to be universally esteemed in africa one of the most wholesome of spices and generally used by the natives to season their food fourth report of the directors of the african institution page sixteen if this article and the maligueta of brazil are the same i should be strongly inclined to agree with the report and indeed i conceive that it is not only harmless but extremely wholesome a detoxion of the pods is used among the peasantry as an injection in anguish disorders close footnote the pimenta de chero or scented pepper is likewise common but it requires more care and rearing and is a smaller shrub than the malagueta the pods are of a bright red in general but sometimes they are naturally of a pale yellow color they are round and about the size of a crab apple tea is stated to be indigenous in brazil a priest of considerable reputation as a botanist told me that he had discovered this plant in the neighborhood of olinda but afterwards again he informed me that he was afraid he had been too sanguine horticulture has of late years been rapidly improving and the markets of Recife are now well supplied with vegetables and roots. The gardeners are chiefly Portuguese, from the provinces of the mother country, or from the Azores. Peas, cabbages, and several other kinds of European vegetables and roots are to be purchased, besides others which are peculiar to the country, such as mandubims and yams. The European onion produces a small root of an oblong form, which is known in Pernambuco under the name of cebolinho, as the diminutive of cebola, an onion. The vine is to be seen in many of the gardens in the neighborhood of Recife and Ovalinda, and formerly there were a great many at Conception upon the island of Itamaracá, but a few now remain. No wine is made. The fruit trees are some of those which are common to the southern parts of Europe, such as the orange, the fig, and others, but no olives besides these there are the manga the jack and a numerous list some of which have been mentioned incidentally in the course of this volume but i have tarried already too long upon this branch of my subject 
and must now proceed to something else. End of section 9section ten of travels in brazil volume two by henry coster this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter six the free population the insufficiency of the population of portugal to the almost unbounded plans of the rulers of that kingdom has in all probability saved her south american possessions from the dreadful contests which are to be apprehended in the neighboring spanish colonies between the creole white inhabitants and those of color the struggle yet rages with exterminating violence between the descendants of europeans born in south america and the natives of old spain but when this is at an end another equally if not more destructive is to be looked for between the former and their countrymen of mixed castes the appeal which the creole whites have made to the people and the declarations which they have publicly set forth of directing their proceedings by their voice the exposure of those abstract principles of government which are so delightful in theory but so difficult of execution will most probably bring down upon their heads the destruction which has thus been courted in the portuguese south american dominions circumstances have directed that there should be no division of caste and very few of these degrading and most galling distinctions which have been made by all other nations in the management of their colonies that this was not intended by the mother country but was rather submitted to from necessity is to be discovered in some few regulations which plainly show that if portugal could have preserved the superiority of the whites she would as well as her neighbors have established laws for this purpose the rulers of portugal wished to colonize to an unlimited extent but their country did not contain a population sufficiently numerous for their magnificent plans emigrants left their own country to settle in the new world who were literally adventurers for they had not any settled plans of life and they were without families persons of established habits who had the wish to follow any of the ordinary means of gaining a livelihood found employment at home neither could portugal spare them nor did they wish to leave their native soil there was no superabundance of population and therefore every man might find occupation at home if he had steadiness to look for it there was no division in political or religious opinion there was no necessity for emigration save that which was urged by crimes thus the generality of the men who embarked in the expeditions which were fitted out for brazil were unaccompanied by females and therefore naturally on their arrival in that country they married or irregularly connected themselves with indian women and subsequently with those of africa it is true that orphan girls were sent out by the government of portugal footnote history of brazil volume one page two sixteen close footnote but these were necessarily few in number in the course of another generation the colonists married the women of mixed castes owing to the impossibility of obtaining those of their own color and the frequency of the custom and the silence of the laws upon the subject removed all ideas of degradation in thus connecting themselves still the european notions of superiority were not entirely laid aside and these caused the passing of some regulations by which white persons were to enjoy certain privileges thus although the form of trial for all castes is the same in certain places only can capital punishments be inflicted upon the favored race the people of color are not eligible for some of the chief offices of government nor can they become members of the priesthood from the mildness of the laws however the mixed castes have gained ground considerably the regulations which exist against them are evaded or rather they had become obsolete perhaps the heroic conduct of camarão and henrique diaz the indian and negro chieftains in the famous and most interesting contest between the pernambucans and the dutch and the honors subsequently granted by the crown of portugal to both of them may have led to the exaltation of the general character of the much injured varieties of the human species of which they were members familiarity between the chieftains of the several corps 
must be the consequence of their embarkation in the same cause when the war is one of skirmishes or ambuscades or continual alarm of assistance constantly afforded to each other a patriotic war against a foreign invader in which difference of religion exists and each party mortally hates the other on these occasions all men are equal and he only is superior whose strength and whose activity surpasses that of others the amalgamation of castes which are caused by this consciousness of equality could not have had a fairer field for its full accomplishment than the war to which i have alluded and the friendships which were formed under these circumstances would not easily be broken off although the parties who had been so united might have been in their situations in life very far removed from each other still the participation of equal danger must render dear the companions in peril and make the feelings which had been roused on these occasions of long duration they would continue to act long after the cessation of the series of occurrences which had called them forth the free population of brazil at the present time consists of europeans brazilians that is white persons born in brazil mulattoes that is the mixed caste between the whites and blacks and all the varieties into which it can branch mamelucos that is the mixed caste between the whites and indians and all its varieties indians in a domesticated state who are generally called caboclos and those who still remain in a savage state and are generally called tapuyas negroes born in brazil and manumitted africans lastly mestizos that is the mixed caste between the indians and negroes of slaves i shall speak by and by more at large these are africans creole negroes mulattoes and mestizos the maxim of the civil law partis sequitur ventrum is in force here as well as in the colonies of other nations these several mixtures of the human race have their shades of difference of character as well as color first we must treat of the whites the europeans who are not in office or who are not military men are generally speaking adventurers who have arrived in that country with little or no capital these men commence their career in low situations of life but by parsimony and continual exertion directed to one end that of amassing money they often attain their object and pass the evening of their lives in opulence these habits fail not oftentimes to give a bias to their dispositions which is unallied to generosity and liberality they look down upon the brazilians or rather they wish to consider themselves superior to them and until lately the government took no pains to remove the jealousy which existed between the two descriptions of white persons and even now not so much attention is paid to the subject as its great importance seems to require footnote the majority of the clergy of pernambuco both regular and secular are of brazilian parentage the governor is an european and so are the major part of the chief officers civil military and ecclesiastical but the bishop is a brazilian and so is the ovidor Close footnote. the brazilian white man of large property who draws his descent from the first donatory of a province or whose family has for some generations enjoyed distinction entertains a high opinion of his own importance which may sometimes appear ridiculous but which much oftener leads him to acts of generosity to the adoption of liberal ideas to honorable conduct if he has been well educated and has had the good fortune to have been instructed by a priest whose ideas are enlightened who gives a proper latitude for difference of opinion who tolerates as he is tolerated then the character of a young brazilian exhibits much to admire surrounded by numerous relatives and by his immediate dependents living in a vast and half-civilized country he is endued with much independence of language and behavior which are softened by the subordination which has been imbibed during the course of education that this is general i pretend not to say few persons are instructed in a proper manner and again few are those who profit by the education which they have received but more numerous are the individuals who now undergo necessary tuition for powerful motives have arisen to urge the attainment of knowledge i have often heard it observed and i cannot help saying that i think some truth is to be attached to the remark in the country of which i am now treating 
that women are usually less lenient to their slaves than men but this doubtless proceeds from the ignorant state in which they are brought up they scarcely receive any education and have not the advantages of obtaining instruction from communication with persons who are unconnected with their own way of life of imbibing new ideas from general conversation they are born bred and continue surrounded by slaves without receiving any check with high notions of superiority without any thought that what they do is wrong bring these women forward educate them treat them as rational as equal beings and they will be in no respect inferior to their countrymen the fault is not with the sex but in the state of the human being as soon as a child begins to crawl a slave of about its own age and of the same sex is given to it as a playfellow or rather as a plaything they grow up together and the slave is made the stock upon which the young owner gives vent to passion the slave is sent upon all errands and receives the blame of unfortunate accidents in fact the white child is thus encouraged to be overbearing owing to the false fondness of its parents upon the boys the effect is less visible in after life because the world curbs and checks them but the girls do not stir from home and therefore have no opportunities of wearing off these pernicious habits it is only surprising that so many excellent women should be found among them and by no means strange that the disposition of some of them should be injured by this unfortunate direction of their infant years as vegetation rapidly advances in such climates so the animal sooner arrives at maturity than in those of less genial warmth and here again education is rendered doubly necessary to lead the mind to new ideas to curb the passions to give a sense of honour and to instil feelings of that species of pride which is so necessary to a becoming line of conduct the state of society the climate and the celibacy of the numerous priesthood cause the number of illegitimate children to be very great but here the joda dos injetados and a custom which shows the natural goodness of the people prevent the frequent occurrence of infanticide or rather render it almost unknown an infant is frequently during the night laid on the door of a rich person and on being discovered in the morning is taken in and is almost invariably allowed to remain it is brought up with the children of the house if its color is not too dark to admit of this certainly as a dependent but not as a servant however a considerable tinge of color will not prevent it from being reared with white children these injetados or rejected ones as individuals who are so circumstanced are called are frequently to be met with and i heard a few exceptions to the general kindness with which they are treated public feeling is much against the refusing to accept and rear an injetado the owner of a house who is in easy circumstances and yet sends the infant from his own door to the public institution which is provided for its reception is generally spoken of in terms of indignation sometimes a poor man will find one of these presents at his door and he will generally place it at the landholder's threshold on the following night this is accounted excusable and even meritorious for at the great house the child has nearly a certainty of being well taken care of i have observed that generally speaking europeans are less indulgent to their slaves than brazilians the former feed them well but they require from the poor wretches more labor than they can perform whilst the latter allow the affairs of their estates to continue in the way in which they have been accustomed to be directed this difference between the two descriptions of owners is easily accounted for the european has probably purchased part of his slaves on credit and has during the whole course of his life made the accumulation of riches his chief object the brazilian inherits his estate and as nothing urges him to the necessity of obtaining large profits it continues the course that has been pointed out to him by the former possessors his habits of quietude and indolence have led him to be easy and indifferent and although he may not provide for the maintenance of his slaves with so much care as the european still they find more time to seek for food themselves that avaricious spirit which deliberately works a man or a brute animal footnote our wicked stage-coach and post-chaise system 
Close quote. Until it is unfit for farther service without any regard to the well-being of the creature, which is thus treated as a mere machine, as if it was formed of wood or iron, is, however, seldom to be met with in those parts of the country which I visited. Instances of cruelty occur, as has been and will yet be seen, but these proceed from individual depravity, and not from systematic, cold-blooded, calculating indifference to the means by which a desired end is to be compassed. Notwithstanding the relationship of the mulattoes on one side of the black race, they consider themselves superior to the mamalucos, they lean to the whites, and from the light in which the Indians are held, pride themselves upon being totally unconnected with them. Still, the mulattoes are conscious of their connection with men who are in a state of slavery, and that many persons, even of their own color, are under these degraded circumstances. They have therefore always a feeling of inferiority in the company of white men, if these white men are wealthy and powerful. This inferiority of rank is not so much felt by white persons in the lower walks of life, and these are more easily led to become familiar with individuals of their own color who are in wealthy circumstances. Still the inferiority which the mulatto feels is more that which is produced by poverty than that which his color has caused, for he will be equally respectful to a person of his own caste who may happen to be rich. Footnote. The term of senor or senora is made use of to all free persons, whites, mulattoes, and blacks, and in speaking to a free man of whatever class or color, the manner of address is the same. Dr. Pinkard says in his Notes on the West Indies, the title of Mrs. seems to be reserved solely for the ladies from Europe and the white creoles, and to form a distinction between them and the women of color of all classes and descriptions. Close footnote. The degraded state of the people of color in the British colonies is most lamentable. Footnote. I refer the reader to Edward's History of the West Indies, Volume 2. Close footnote. In Brazil, even the trifling regulations which exist against them remain unattended to. A mulatto enters into holy orders, or is appointed a magistrate, his paper stating him to be a white man, but his appearance plainly denoting the contrary. In conversing on one occasion with a man of color who was in my service, I asked if a certain Capitão Moore was not a mulatto man. He answered, he was, but is not now. Footnote. Era, porém, já não é. Close footnote. I begged him to explain. When he added, can a Capitão Moore be a mulatto man? Footnote. Pois, senhor, Capitan Moore, Boshi Ser Malato? Close footnote. I was intimately acquainted with a priest whose complexion and hair plainly denoted from whence he drew his origin. I liked him much. He was a well educated and intelligent man. Besides this individual instance, I met with several others of the same description. The regiments of militia, which are called mulatto regiments, are so named from all the officers and men being of mixed castes, nor can white persons be admitted into them. The principal officers are men of property, and the colonel, like the commander of any other regiment, is only amenable to the governor of the province. In the white militia regiments, the officers ought to be by law white men, but in practice they are rather reputed white men, for very little pains are taken to prove that there is no mixture of blood. Great numbers of the soldiers belonging to the regiments which are officered by white men are mulattoes and other persons of color. The regiments of the line, likewise, as I have elsewhere said, admit into the ranks all persons excepting Negroes and Indians, but the officers of these must prove nobility of birth. However, as certain degrees of nobility have been conferred upon persons in whose family there is much mixture of blood, this proof cannot be regarded as being required against the mulatto or mameluco part of the population. Thus, an European adventurer could not obtain a commission in these regiments, whilst a Brazilian, whose family has distinguished itself in the province in former times, will prove his eligibility without regard to the blood which runs in his veins. He is noble, let that flow from whence it may. 
footnote to this statement some explanation is necessary owing to the regulations of the portuguese military service privates are sometimes raised to commissions by the intermediate steps of corporals quartermasters and sergeants these men gain their incensees without any relation to their birth and though a decidedly dark-coloured mulatto might not be so raised a european of low birth would it is to enable a man to become a cadet and then an officer without serving in the ranks that requires nobility of birth Close footnote. the late colonel of the mulatto regiment of hesifi by name noguera went to lisbon and returned to pernambuco with the order of christ which the queen had conferred upon him footnote the son of this man is a priest close footnote a chief person of one of the provinces is the son of a white man and a woman of color he has received an excellent education and is of generous disposition and entertains most liberal views upon all subjects he has been made a colonel and a degree of nobility has been conferred upon him likewise the regent is sponsor to one of his children many other instances may be mentioned thus has portugal of late years from policy continued that system into which she was led by her peculiar circumstances in former times some of the wealthy planters of pernambuco and of the rich inhabitants of hesifi are men of color the major part of the best mechanics are also of mixed blood it is said that mulattoes make bad masters and this holds good oftentimes with persons of this description who have been in a state of slavery and become possessed of slaves of their own or are employed as managers upon estates the change of situation would lead to the same consequences in any race of human beings and cannot be accounted peculiar to the mixed caste i see mulattoes of free birth as kind as lenient and as forbearing to their slaves and other dependents as any white man marriages between white men and women of color are by no means rare though they are sufficiently so to cause the circumstance to be mentioned when speaking of an individual who has connected himself in this manner but this is not said with the intent of lowering him in the estimation of others indeed the remark is only made if the person is a planter of any importance and the woman is decidedly of dark color for even a considerable tinge will pass for white if the white man belongs to the lower orders the woman is not accounted as being unequal to him in rank unless she is nearly black the european adventurers often marry in this manner which generally occurs when the woman has a dower the rich mulatto families are often glad to dispose of their daughters to these men although the person who has been fixed upon may be in indifferent circumstances for the color of the children of their daughters is bettered and from the well-known prudence and regularity of this set of men a large fortune may be hoped for even from very small beginnings whilst i was at jaguaribe i was in the frequent habit of seeing a handsome young man who was a native of the island of st michael's this person happened to be with me on one occasion when the commandant from the certain was staying at my house the commandant asked him if he could read and write and being answered in the negative said then you will not do and turning to me added i have a commission from a friend of mine to take with me back to the certain a good-looking young portuguese of regular habits who can read and write for the purpose of marrying him to his daughter these kind of commissions encomendas are not unusual still the brazilians of high birth and large property do not like to intermarry with persons whose mixture of blood is very apparent and hence arises peculiar circumstances a man of this description becomes attached to a woman of color connects himself with her and takes her to his home where she is in a short time visited even by married women she governs her household affairs acts and considers herself as his wife and frequently after the birth of several children when they are neither of them young he marries her in connections of this nature the parties are more truly attached than in marriages between persons who belong to two families of the first rank for the latter are entered into from convenience rather than from affection indeed the parties on some occasions 
do not see each other until a few days before the ceremony takes place it often occurs that inclination necessity or convenience induces or obliges a man to separate from the person with whom he has thus been connected in this case he gives her a portion and she marries a man of her own rank who regards her rather as a widow than as one whose conduct has been incorrect instances of infidelity in these women are rare they become attached to the men with whom they cohabit and they direct the affairs of the house over which they are placed with the same zeal that they would display if they had the right of command over them it is greatly to the credit of the people of that country that so much fidelity should be shown on one side and that this should so frequently as it is be rewarded by the other party in the advancement of those who have behaved thus faithfully to a respectable and acknowledged situation in society it should be recollected too that the merit of moral feelings must be judged of by the standard of the country and not by our own institutions i have only spoken above of what occurs among the planters for in large towns man is pretty much the same everywhere the mamalucos are more frequently to be seen in the sertão than upon the coast they are handsomer than the mulattoes and the women of this caste particularly surpass in beauty all others of the country they have the brown tint of mulattoes but their features are less blunt and their hair is not curled i do not think that the men can be said to possess more courage than the mulattoes but whether from the knowledge which they have of being of free birth on both sides or from residing in the interior of the country where government is more loose they appear to have more independence of character and to pay less deference to a white man than the mulattoes when women relate any deed of danger that has been surmounted or undertaken they generally state that the chief actor in it was a large mameluco mamelucan as if they thought this description of men to be superior to all others mamelucos may enter into the mulatto regiments and are pressed into the regiments of the line as being men of color without any regard to the sources from which their blood proceeds of the domesticated indians i have already elsewhere given what accounts i could collect and what i had opportunities of observing the wild indians are now only to be met with at a great distance from the coast of pernambuco and although they are very near to maranhão and are dreaded neighbors i had no means of seeing any of them i now proceed to mention that numerous and valuable race of men the creole negroes a tree of african growth which has thus been transplanted cultivated and much improved by its removal to the new world the creole negroes stand alone and unconnected with every other race of men in this circumstance alone would be sufficient and indeed contributes much to the effect of uniting them to each other the mulattoes and all other persons of mixed blood wish to lean towards the whites if they can possibly lay any claim to relationship even the mestizo tries to pass for a mulatto and to persuade himself and others that his veins contain some portion of white blood although that with which they are filled proceeds from indian and negro sources those only who can have no pretensions to a mixture of blood call themselves negroes which renders the individuals who do pass under this denomination much attached to each other from the impossibility of being mistaken for members of any other caste they are of handsome persons brave and hardy obedient to the whites and willing to please but they are easily affronted and the least allusion to their color being made by a person of a lighter tint enrages them to a great degree though they will sometimes say a negro i am but always upright footnote negro sim porem gereto close footnote they are again distinct from their brethren in slavery owing to their superior situation as free men the free creole negroes have their exclusive regiments as well as the mulattoes of which every officer and soldier must be perfectly black there are two of these regiments for the province of pernambuco which consists of indefinite numbers of men who are dispersed all over the country these regiments are distinguished from each other by the names of old enriquez and new enriquez 
Footnote. Manumit Creole blacks are, I am nearly certain, admitted into these regiments. Close footnote. The name of Enriquez is derived from the famous chieftain, Enrique Diaz, in the time of the Dutch War. I have heard some of the most intelligent of those with whom I have conversed speak in enthusiastic terms of the aid which he gave to the whites in that struggle. I have seen some portion of one of these regiments in Hesifi, accompanying the procession of Our Lady of the Rosary, the patroness of Negroes. They were dressed in white cloth uniforms, turned up with scarlet, and they looked very soldier-like. They were in tolerable discipline, and seemed to wish to go through the duty of the day in the best manner that they were able. They acted with an appearance of zeal and the desire of excelling. Those of whom I speak formed a finer body of men than any other soldiers which I had an opportunity of seeing in that country. On gala days, the superior black officers in their white uniforms pay their respects to the governor, exactly in the same manner that the persons of any other caste, holding commissions of equal rank, are expected to go through this form. These men receive no pay, so that their neat appearance on such occasions bespeaks a certain degree of wealth among them. Neither are the privates nor any other persons belonging to these regiments paid for their services. Some of the whites rather ridicule the black officers, but not in their presence, and the laugh which is raised against them is caused perhaps by a lurking wish to prevent this insulted race from the display of those distinctions which the government has wisely conceded to them, but which hurt the European ideas of superiority. The old regiment of Enriquez was at the time that I resided in Pernambuco without a colonel, and I heard much discussion on several occasions among the Creole Negroes about the fittest person to be appointed to the vacant situation. Footnote. There was a rumor of the appointment of a white man as colonel of this regiment, and also of a white colonel for the Hesifi Mulatto regiment, and I was asked by several individuals of these castes whether there was any truth in the report. I cannot believe anything of this kind. The liberal policy which seems to pervade the council of Rio de Janeiro forbids that such a report should be believed, but if they should be true, most pernicious will be the consequences which may be expected to proceed from such a determination. Close footnote. The Creole Negroes of Hesifi are, generally speaking, mechanics of all descriptions, but they have not yet reached the higher ranks of life as gentlemen, as planters, and as merchants. Some of them have accumulated considerable sums of money, and possess many slaves, to whom they teach their own trade, or these slaves are taught other mechanical employments, by which they may become useful. They work for their owners, and render them great profits, for every description of labor is high, and that which requires any degree of skill bears a higher comparative value than the departments of which a knowledge is more easily attained. The best church and image painter of Pernambuco is a black man, who has good manners and quite the air of a man of some importance, though he does not by any means assume too much. The Negroes are excluded from the priesthood, and from the offices which the mulattoes may obtain through their evasion of the law, but which the decided and unequivocal color of the Negro entirely precludes him from aspiring to. In law, all persons who are not white, and are born free, class equally. Manumitted slaves are placed upon the same footing as persons born free. However, although the few exclusions which exist against the Negroes are degrading, Still, in some instances, they are befriended by them. They are unable, owing to their color, to serve in the regiments of the line, or in any regiments excepting those which are exclusively their own. But by means of this regulation, they escape the persecutions under which the other caste suffer during the time of recruiting. The officers and men of the Enrique regiments are so united to each other that the privates and subalterns are less liable to be oppressed by any white men in office, even than the soldiers of the mulatto regiments. Of these latter, the officers, having a considerable tinge of white, sometimes lean towards the wishes of the Capitan Moore or some other rich white officer, instead of protecting his soldiers. The men whose occupation it is to apprehend runaway negroes are, almost without exception, 
creole blacks they are called capitones do campo captains of the field are subject to a capitan mor do campo who resides in Recife and receive their commissions either from the governor or from this officer by these they are authorized to apprehend and take to their owners any slaves who may be found absent from their homes without their master's consent several of these men are to be found in every district employing themselves in such pursuits as they think fit when their services are not required in that calling which forms their particular duty they are men of undaunted courage and are usually followed by two or three dogs which are trained to seek out and if necessary to attack and bring to the ground those persons whose apprehension their masters are desirous of effecting the men who bear these commissions can oblige any unauthorized person to give up to them an apprehended negro for the purpose of being by them returned to his owner it is scarcely necessary to name the mestizos for they usually class with the mulattoes nor are they to be easily distinguished from some of the darker varieties of this caste a dark-coloured man of a disagreeable countenance and badly formed person is commonly called a mestizo without any reference to his origin yet one race of human beings remains to be spoken of but the individuals who compose it are not sufficiently numerous to permit them to take their place among the several great divisions of the human family which forms the population of brazil and therefore i did not rank this among the others which are of more importance still the ciganos footnote this word is without doubt derived from egyptianos i am told that the word gitanos is also used as a name for these people Close footnote. for thus they are called must not be forgotten i frequently heard of these people but never had an opportunity of seeing any of them parties of ciganos were in the habit of appearing formerly once every year at the village of pasmado and other places in that part of the country but the late governor of the province was inimical to them and some attempts having been made to apprehend some of them their visits were discontinued they are represented as being a people of a brownish cast with features which resemble those of white persons and as being tall and handsome they wander from place to place in parties of men women and children exchanging buying and selling horses and gold and silver trinkets the women travel on horseback sitting between the panniers of the loaded horses and the young ones are placed within the panniers among the baggage the men are excellent horsemen and although the pack horses may be overburdened these fellows will only accommodate matters by riding slowly upon their own horses and never think of dividing the loads more equally but they preserve themselves and the animals upon which they ride quite unencumbered they are said to be unmindful of all religious observances and never to hear mass or confess their sins it is likewise said that they never marry out of their own nation there are now several british merchants established at hesifi and a council likewise resides at that place but at the time of my coming away there was no protestant chapel no clergyman nor even a burial ground for our countrymen an act of parliament has i believe provided for the establishment of these things but no steps have been taken towards the accomplishment of the directions of the legislature without an outward appearance of religion how are we to expect that the people of brazil are to regard us as anything better than what we were represented to them as being in former times as pagans animals and horses pagoins bichos and cavallos this is literally true and although they are now aware that at any rate we have the forms of human beings that we have the power of speech and that we have our share of intellect in all the common transactions of the world still how are we to look for respect from them towards a set of men who have no appearance at least of possessing any religious feelings it should be recollected that we are living among a people who are deeply riveted to their own forms and ceremonies of worship whose devotedness to their church establishment surpasses every other feeling it is not thus that the british nation is to become respectable we may have relations of trade with these people 
but we must be content to be merely regarded according to our utility there can be no respect for our general character as a body of men none of that regard which would make us listen to in any great question which would make our opinions and our assertions dependent upon as coming from men of steadiness of religious habits nor can we be accounted as more than residents for a time we cannot be considered as an established community who are thus without any common bond of union who have not any general place of meeting who have not any one point to which all are directed we have no appearance of belonging to one nation as if we were brethren meeting in a foreign land to these political reasons for the establishment of a place of worship are to be added those which are of far greater importance those to which no christian ought to be indifferent i well know that it is not with the merchants that the evil arises but enough i will go no farther although i could tarry long upon this subject i wish however that i could have avoided the mention of it altogether i might have done so if i had not felt that i was passing by unnoticed an important subject upon which i have often spoken whilst i was upon the spot and there my sentiments are well known to most of those persons with whom i associated End of section 10. Section 11 of Travels in Brazil, Volume 2, by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, Part 1. Slavery. The general equity of the laws regarding free persons of color in the Portuguese South American possessions has been to a certain degree extend it to that portion of the population which is in a state of slavery and the lives of the slaves of brazil have been rendered less hard and less intolerable than those of the degraded beings who drag on their cheerless existence under the dominion of other nations the brazilian slave is taught the religion of his master and hopes are held out for manumission from his own exertions but still he is a slave and must be guided by another man's will and this feeling alone takes away much of the pleasure which would be felt from the faithful discharge of his duty if it was voluntarily performed the consciousness that if the directions were not willingly attended to the arbitrary will of the master would enforce their performance removes much of the desire to please obedience to a command is not required with any idea that refusal can possibly ensue and therefore no merit is attached to its accomplishment by him whose orders are obeyed nor does the slave feel that he is doing in any degree more than would be enforced if he had made any doubts the world has heard so much and from so many quarters of the enormities which have been committed by slave owners in the colonies with which england has had any communication both from her own possessions and from those of other nations that no doubts can be entertained of their existence that such evil deeds are of frequent occurrence i would not wish to suppose though that they are dreadfully too frequent is well known i had rather not be persuaded that man in so depraved a state is often to be met with that many civilized beings should have made such rapid returns to barbarism i have to say that in brazil too such instances of barbarity are spoken of that they do exist they are however of rare occurrence they are seldom heard of and are always mentioned with abhorrence but it is enough that instances should be recorded of the abuse of this absolute power of one man over another it is enough that this absolute power itself should be allowed to continue to render the system upon which it is founded an evil of such great importance as to sanction all exertions for its removal as to make any government overlook many inconveniences rather than increase the numbers of those human beings who suffer this dreadful degradation the indian slavery has been for many years abolished in brazil and the individuals who are now in bondage in that country are africans and their descendants on both sides or individuals whose mothers are of african origin and no line is drawn at which the near approach of the color and the blood of the whites entitles the child whose mother is a slave to freedom i have seen several persons who were to all appearance of white origin still doomed to slavery 
slaves however in brazil have many advantages over their brethren in the british colonies the numerous holidays of which the catholic religion enjoins the observance footnote a portuguese writer says when permission was given in portugal to work upon several of the holidays the same was not extended to brazil from a principle of humanity that the slaves might not be deprived of any of their days of rest Correo brasilense for december eighteen fifteen page seven thirty eight close footnote give to the slave many days of rest or time to work for his own profit thirty-five of these in the sundays besides allow him to employ much of his time as he pleases few masters are inclined to restrain the right of their slaves to dispose of these days as they think fit or at any rate few dare whatever their inclinations may be to brave public opinion in depriving them of the intervals from work which the law has set apart as their own that their lives may be rendered less irksome the time which is thus afforded enables the slave who is so inclined to accumulate a sum of money however this is by law his master's property from the incapability under which a slave labors of possessing anything which he can by right call his own but i believe there is no instance on record in which a master attempted to deprive his slave of these hard-earned gains the slave can oblige his master to manumit him on tendering to him the sum for which he was purchased or the price for which he might be sold if that price is higher than what the slave was worth at the time he was first bought this regulation like every one that is framed in favor of slaves is liable to be evaded and the master sometimes does refuse to manumit a valuable slave and no appeal is made by the sufferer owing to the state of law in that country which renders it almost impossible for the slave to gain a hearing and likewise the acquiescence in the injustice of the master proceeds from the dread that if he was not to succeed he would be punished and that his life might be rendered more miserable than it was before footnote the owner of a sugar plantation with whose sons i was well acquainted possessed a slave who had the management of the sugar boiling house during crop time and who was accounted by all who knew him and understood the business to be a most excellent workman this man accumulated a sum of money which he offered to his master for his freedom but it was not accepted and although the slave made great interest with persons of consideration in the country he could not accomplish his end his master loaded him with irons and he was made to work in the state he did not obtain his liberty till after his master's death when his widow received his money and manumitted him his trade of sugar boiler renders him large profits yearly and this injured man now lives in ease and comfort this instance of refusal and some others of which i have heard would make me doubtful of the foundation upon which the custom of manumitting is placed if i did not know how easily the laws relating to many other important points are evaded through the influence of wealth and power i did not see a copy of the law or regulation on the subject but i never met with any one who made a doubt of its existence i never met with any one who doubted that the slave had a right to appeal if he thought proper whether he would be heard or not was another question close footnote consequently a great deal depends upon the inclinations of the master who will however be very careful in refusing to manumit owing to the well-known opinion of every priest in favor of this regulation to the feelings of the individuals of his own class and society and to those of the lower orders of people and likewise he will be afraid of losing his slave he may escape with his money and the master will then run much risk of never seeing him again particularly if the individual is a creole slave footnote the major part of the slaves that abscound are brought back to their owners but some do escape and are never afterwards heard of they remove to some distant district and there remain as free men those who have once tasted the sweets of free agency for any length of time even if they are brought back to their masters scarcely ever remain longer than is requisite to seek an opportunity of eluding the vigilance of those whose business it is to watch them they soon brave the risk of another detection a young and handsome mulatto man of these unsettled habits once applied to me to purchase him he had by mere accident 
been discovered only a short time before by a friend of his master in the Sertown, where he had married a free woman and had been considered as free himself. He was brought back to his master, was sold to another person, escaped, returned, again fled, and had not, when I left the country, been heard of for a twelve month. Close footnote. In general, therefore, no doubts are urged when application is made for manumission by a slave to his master, who is indeed oftentimes prepared for it by the habits of industry and regularity of his slave, and by common report among the other slaves and free persons upon the estate that the individual in question is scraping together a sum of money for this purpose. The master might indeed deprive the slave of the fruits of his labor, but this is never thought of because the slave preserves his money in a secret place, or has entrusted it to some person upon whom he can depend, and would suffer any punishment rather than disclose the spot in which his wealth lies concealed. A still more forcible reason than any other for the forbearance of the master is to be found in the dread of acting against public opinion, in the shame which would follow the commission of such an act, and perhaps the natural goodness which exists in almost every human being, would make him shun such gross injustice, would make him avoid such a deed of baseness. A slave is often permitted by his owner to seek a master more to his liking. For this purpose a note is given, declaring that the bearer has leave to enter into the service of any one upon the price which the master demands being paid by the purchaser. With this the slave applies to any individual of property whom he may wish to serve, owing to have heard a good report of his character towards his slaves, or from any other cause. This is a frequent practice, and at least admits the possibility of escape from a severe state of bondage to one that is less irksome. A considerable number of slaves are manumitted at the death of their masters, and indeed some persons of large property fail not to set at liberty a few of them during their own lifetime. A deed of manumission, however simply it may be drawn out, cannot be set aside. A register of these papers is preserved at the office of every notary public, by which any distress that might be occasioned by the loss of the originals is provided against, for the copy, of course, holds good in law. A slave who has brought into the world and has reared ten children ought to be free, for so the law ordains, but this regulation is generally evaded and besides, the number of children is too great for many women to be benefited by it. Footnote. The following circumstances occurred under my own observation. A negress had brought into the world ten children, and had reared nine of them. These remained to work for their owners. The woman claimed her freedom, for the tenth child did not die until it had arrived at an age when it did not require any farther care from her, but it was refused. She was hired to a gentleman as a nurse for one of his children. This person did all in his power to obtain her freedom, but did not succeed. He purchased her and immediately had a deed of manumission made out by a notary public. When he returned home to dinner, he desired his wife to tell the woman that she was his slave, and in the course of the day the deed was given to her. When I left the country, her only fear was that, as she was free, her master and mistress might turn her away thus proving by her anxiety how happy she was. Close footnote. The price of a newborn child is five pounds, 20,000 mille hayes, and the master is obliged to manumit the infant at the baptismal font on the sum being presented. In this manner a considerable number of persons are set at liberty, for the smallness of the price enables many freemen who have had connections with female slaves to manumit their offspring and instances occur of the sponsors performing this most laudable act. Not unfrequently, female slaves apply to persons of consideration to become sponsors to their children, in the hopes that the pride of these will be too great to allow their godchildren remaining in slavery. Thus by their own exertions, by the favor of their masters, and by other means, the individuals who gain their freedom annually are very numerous, the comforts of slaves in different situations are widely disproportionate. Whilst some are doomed to an existence of excessive toil and misery from the nature of their occupations and the characters of their masters, others lead a comparatively easy life. 
it is true that in countries in which the workmen are free the daily labor is unequally divided but the wages are proportioned accordingly and as each man is a free agent he seeks that employment to which his body and mental powers are benefited the slave is purchased for a certain purpose and is to follow the line of life which his master has chalked out for him he is not to be occupied in that which he would himself prefer or at any rate his wishes are not consulted upon the subject the price for which a slave is to be obtained and the convenience of the purchaser are oftener consulted than the fitness of his bodily strength to the labor which it is his lot to be ordered to perform besides the obligation of following an unsuitable trade or at any rate of following one which he has not chosen he has to endure the still incomparably greater grievance of bearing with a tyrannical and inconsiderate or a peevish master whose commands are not to be called in question whose will is absolute and from whom the possibility of appeal is far removed and that of redress placed at a still greater distance masters are punished by the payment of fines for cruelty to their slaves if any account of such behavior should reach the ear of the ovador of the province but i never heard of punishment having been carried farther than this trifling manner of correction the emoluments which proceed from this mode of chastising the offenders weigh heavily in his favor the injury which the slave has received is not i am afraid the only cause which urges the exaction of the stipulated penalty of this the slave does not receive any part all slaves in brazil follow the religion of their masters and notwithstanding the impure state in which the christian church exists in that country still such are the beneficent effects of the christian religion that these its adopted children are improved by it to an infinite degree and the slave who attends to the strict observance of religious ceremonies invariably proves to be a good servant the africans who are imported from angola are baptized in lots before they leave their own shores and on their arrival in brazil they are to learn the doctrines of the church and the duties of the religion into which they have entered these bear the mark of the royal crown upon their breasts which denotes that they have undergone the ceremony of baptism and likewise that the king's duty has been paid upon them the slaves which are imported from other parts of the coast of africa arrive in brazil unbaptized and before the ceremony of making them christians can be performed upon them they must be taught certain prayers for the acquirement of which one year is allowed to the master before he is obliged to present the slave at the parish church the law is not always strictly adhered to as to the time but it is never evaded altogether the religion of the master teaches him that it would be extremely sinful to allow his slave to remain a heathen and indeed the portuguese and brazilians have too much religious feeling to let them neglect any of the ordinances of their church the slave himself likewise wishes to be made a christian for his fellow bondsmen will otherwise in every squabble or trifling disagreement with him close their string of opprobrious epithets with the name of pagan pagan the unbaptized negro feels that he is considered as an inferior being and although he may not be aware of the value which the whites place upon baptism still he knows that the stigma for which he is abraded will be removed by it and therefore he is desirous of being made equal to his companions the africans who have been long imported imbibe a catholic feeling and appear to forget that they were once in the same situation themselves the slaves are not asked whether they will be baptized or not their entrance into the catholic church is treated as a thing of course and indeed they are not considered as members of society but rather as brute animals until they can lawfully go to mass confess their sins and receive the sacrament the slaves have their own religious brotherhoods as well as the free persons and the ambition of the slave very generally aims at being admitted into one of these and at being made one of the officers and directors of the concerns of the brotherhood even some of the money which the industrious slave is collecting for the purpose of purchasing his freedom will oftentimes be brought out of its concealment for the decoration of a saint that the donor may become of importance in the society to which he belongs the negroes have one invocation of the virgin or i might almost say one virgin which is peculiarly their own 
our lady of the rosary is even sometimes painted with a black face and hands it is in this manner that the slaves are led to place their attention upon an object in which they soon take an interest but from which no injury can proceed toward themselves nor can any through its means be by them inflicted upon their masters their ideas are removed from any thought of the customs of their own country and are guided into a channel of a totally different nature and completely unconnected with what is practised there the election of a king of congo which i have mentioned in chapter thirteen by the individuals who come from that part of africa seems indeed as if it would give them a bias towards the customs of their native soil but the brazilian kings of congo worship our lady of the rosary and are dressed in the dress of white men they and their subject dance it is true after the manner of their country but to these festivals are admitted african negroes of other nations creole blacks and mulattoes all of whom dance after the same manner and these dances are now as much the national dances of brazil as they are of africa the portuguese language is spoken by all the slaves and their own dialects are allowed to lie dormant until they are by many of them quite forgotten no compulsion is resorted to to make them embrace the habits of their masters but their ideas are insensibly led to imitate and adopt them the masters at the same time imbibe some of the customs of their slaves and thus the superior and his dependent are brought nearer to each other i doubt not that the system of baptizing the newly imported negroes proceeded rather from the bigotry of the portuguese in former times than from any political plan but it has had the most beneficial effects the slaves are rendered more tractable besides being better men and women they become more obedient servants they are brought under the control of the priesthood and even if this was the only additional hold which was gained by their entrance into the church it is a great engine of power which is thus brought into action but in no circumstance has the introduction of the christian religion among the slaves been of more service than in the change which it has wrought in the men regarding the treatment of their women and in the conduct of the females themselves a writer of great reputation on west indian affairs states that the introduction of the marriage ceremony among the slaves of the colony of which he treats would be utterly impracticable to any good purpose and again that he who conceives that a remedy may be found for polygamy by introducing among them the laws of marriage as established in europe is utterly ignorant of their manners propensities and superstitions Footnote edwards history of the west indies volume two page eighty two and one forty seven close footnote is it not that by the masters these things are considered to be of little importance and therefore unworthy of much trouble as long as the work is done little else is thought of where the interest of the master is concerned the manners propensities and superstitions will soon be overcome i hope that at the present day such opinions do not generally exist all men in the same state of barbarism treat their women in the same manner the evil lies not with a race of beings but in the dreadful situation to which this one is reduced why therefore not attempt to improve and to benefit the individuals of which it is composed the slaves of brazil are regularly married according to the forms of the catholic church the bans are published in the same manner as those of free persons and i have seen many happy couples as happy at least as slaves can be with large families of children rising around them the masters encourage marriages among their slaves for it is from these lawful connections that they can expect to increase the number of their creoles a slave cannot marry without the consent of his master for the vicar will not publish the bans of marriage without this sanction it is likewise permitted that slaves should marry free persons if the woman is in bondage the children remain in the same state but if the man is a slave and she is free their offspring is also free a slave cannot be married until the requisite prayers have been learnt the nature of confession be understood and the sacrament can be received upon the estates the master or manager is soon made acquainted with the predilections of the slaves for each other and these being discovered marriage is forthwith determined upon and the irregular proceedings are made lawful in towns there is more licentiousness among the negroes as there is among all other classes of men footnote the base the most abominable practice of some masters and mistresses 
and of the latter oftener than the former increases the bias which these miserable these uneducated beings must be expected to have towards licentiousness females have been punished because they have not increased the number of their owner slaves this is a fact but it is almost too much to believe on which side does the extreme of depravity lie Close footnote. the passion of love is supposed only to exist in a certain state of civilization and this may be granted without at the same time declaring that negroes are incapable of lasting attachment without supposing that the regard of each sex is mere animal desire unconnected with predilection that species of affection which is heightened until personal possession is almost forgotten doubtless is not felt by human beings who are in a state of barbarism but still a negro may be attached he may fix upon one object in preference to all others that this is the case i can vouch i have known and have heard of many instances in which punishments and other dangers have been brave to visit a chosen one in which journeys by night have been made after a day of fatigue in which great constancy has been shown and a determination that the feelings of the heart shall not be controlled footnote the following circumstances occurred within my own observation a negro woman applied to a planter to be purchased for which purpose she had brought a note from her master she was accepted and a bargain was concluded between the two persons however the day after she had taken up her abode upon the estate of her new master she came to him and falling down upon her knees said that she had a fellow-slave who wished likewise to serve him and she begged him to purchase her companion the new master spoke to the owner of the slave in question on the subject but he refused to sell him and the master rested in this manner but on the third day he received a visit from the owner offering the slave for sale adding that the man had refused to work and had threatened to hang himself and as he was a gabum negro he much feared that he might put his threat in execution the price was soon fixed and on the following morning the man made his appearance he proved to be a most excellent slave close footnote the great proportion of men upon many of the estates produces of necessity most mischievous consequences a supply is requisite to keep up the number of laborers the women are more liable to misconduct footnote the following occurrences took place upon the estate of a wealthy planter to the south of hesifi and the anecdote was related by the owner of the plantation himself a negro complained to his master of the infidelity of his wife she was immediately questioned and other inquiries being made and the truth of the statement respecting her conduct being proved she was tied to a post to be flogged her husband was present and at first he rather received pleasure from the sight of her sufferings but he soon stopped the driver's hand and going to his master begged him to order her to be unbound and that he would pardon her for he added if there are to be so many men and so small a number of women upon the estate how is it to be expected that the latter are to be faithful para que senor tem tantos negros y tan pocas negras close footnote and the men imbibe unsettled habits but if an adequate number of females are placed upon the estate and the slaves are trained and taught in the manner which is practised upon well-regulated plantations the negroes will be as correct in their behaviour as any other body of men and perhaps their conduct may be less faulty than that of other descriptions of persons who have less to occupy their time though their education may be infinitely superior that many men and many women will be licentious has been and is still the lot of human nature and not the peculiar fault of the much injured race of which i speak i shall now state the manner in which africans are transported from their own country to brazil and the disposal of them on their arrival in south america the characters of the several african nations with which the ships are loaded the condition of those who are employed in hesifi upon the sugar plantations in the mata or cotton estates and in the sertão or cattle districts as the voyage from the coast of africa to the opposite shores of south america is usually short for the winds are subject to little variations and the weather is usually fine the vessels which are employed in this traffic are generally speaking small and are not of the best construction 
the situation of captain or master of a slave ship is considered of secondary rank in the portuguese merchant service and the persons who are usually so occupied are vastly inferior to the generality of the individuals who command the large and regular trading vessels between europe and brazil these slave ships footnote the ships which are employed in this trade oftentimes fill some of their water casks with salt water when they leave brazil that they may serve as ballast and on taking their live cargo on board upon the coast of africa the salt water is replaced by that which is for the use of the additional number of persons on one occasion a vessel had proceeded for some days on her voyage from africa towards brazil with a full cargo when the discovery was made that the cask had not been filled with fresh water the coast of either continent was too distant to enable the vessel to reach one or the other before the greatest distress must be experienced and therefore a most shocking expedient was resorted to a great number of the negroes were thrown overboard this misfortune was accidental and occurred unintentionally and a man must have been in a similar situation before he can declare that he would not act as the portuguese did on this occasion but the circumstances arose from the nature of this execrable trade Close quote. were formerly crowded to a most shocking degree nor was there any reason of preventing this but a law has been passed for the purpose of restricting the number of persons for each vessel however i more than suspect that no attention is paid to this regulation that means are made use of to evade the law on the arrival at hesifi of a cargo of slaves the rules of the port direct that they shall be disembarked and taken to st amaro which is an airy spot and sufficiently distant from the town to prevent the admittance of any infectious disorder if any such should exist among the newly imported negroes and yet the place is at a convenient distance from the purchasers st amaro being situated immediately opposite to hesifi upon the inland bank of the expanse of waters which is formed by the tide on the land side of the town however like many others this excellent arrangement is not attended to and even if the slaves are removed for a few days to st amaro they are soon conveyed back to the town here they are placed in the streets before the doors of the owners regardless of decency of humanity and of due attention to the general health of the town the smallpox the yaws and other complaints have thus frequent opportunities of spreading it is probable that if the climate was not so very excellent as it is this practice would be discontinued but if it was not put a stop to and the country was subject to pestilential complaints the town would not be habitable in the daytime some of the streets of hesifi are in part lined with miserable beings who are lying or sitting promiscuously upon the footpath sometimes to the number of two or three hundred the males wear a small piece of blue cloth round their waists which is drawn between the legs and fastened behind the females are allowed a larger piece of cloth which is worn as a petticoat and sometimes a second portion is given to them for the purpose of covering the upper parts of the body the stench which is created by these assemblages is almost intolerable to one who is unaccustomed to their vicinity and the sight of them good god is horrid beyond anything these people do not however seem to feel their situation any farther than that it is uncomfortable their food consists of salt meat the flour of the mangia beans and plantains occasionally the victuals for each day are cooked in the middle of the street in an enormous cauldron at night they are driven into one or more warehouses and a driver stands to count them as they pass they are locked in and the door is again opened at daybreak on the following morning the wish of these wretched creatures to escape from this state of inaction and discomfort is manifested upon the appearance of a purchaser they start up willingly to be placed in the row for the purpose of being viewed and handled like cattle and on being chosen they give signs of much pleasure i have had many opportunities for seeing slaves bought for my particular friends at hesifi lived opposite to slave dealers i never saw any demonstrations of grief at parting from each other but i attribute this to the dread of punishment if there had been any flow of feeling
and to a resigned and rather despairing sensation which checks any show of grief and which has prepared them for the worst by making them indifferent to whatever may occur besides it is not often that a family is brought over together the separation of relatives and friends has taken place in africa it is among the younger part of the assemblage of persons who are exposed for sale that pleasure is particularly visible at the change of situation in being removed from the streets of the town the negroes of more advanced age do whatever the driver desires usually with an unchanged countenance i am afraid that very little care is taken to prevent the separation of relations who may chance to come over in the same ship and any consideration on this point lies entirely with the owner of the cargo footnote i was present on one occasion at the purchase of some slaves the person who was choosing those which suited his purpose singled out among others a handsome woman and a beautiful boy of about six years old the woman had been a slave at loanda upon the coast of africa and she spoke a little portuguese whilst the selection was going on the slave dealer happened to leave the room but after it was concluded he returned and seeing the persons who had been set apart to be purchased said he was sorry the woman and child could not be sold for they formed part of a lot which could not be separated the purchaser inquired the reason of the formation of a lot in this instance and was answered that it consisted of a family the husband wife and three children the dealer was then requested to point out the individuals which composed it and they were all brought together how few slave merchants would have acted in this manner the whole family was present during the greatest part of the time but there was no change of countenance in either the husband or the wife both of them understood the portuguese language the children were almost too young to know what was about to happen and besides we spoke in a language which they did not understand that the parents did feel deeply the separation which they must have apprehended as being on the point of taking place i have not the slightest doubt because i frequently saw these slaves afterwards and knew how much they were attached to each other and to their children but whether it proceeded from resignation from despair from fear or from being ashamed to show what they felt before so many strangers there was no demonstration of feeling negroes may have feelings and yet not allow the standers by to know what they feel close footnote a species of relationship exists between the individuals who have been imported in the same ship they call each other malungos and this term is much regarded among them the purchaser gives to each of his newly bought slaves a large piece of baize and a straw hat and as soon as possible marches them off to his estate i have often in travelling met with many parties going up to their new homes and have observed that they were usually cheerful anything is better than to sit at the door of the slave market in hesifi the new master too does everything in his power to keep them in good humour at first whatever his conduct may afterwards be toward them the slaves which are usually brought to pernambuco are known under the names of angola congo hebolo angico gabon and mozambique these last have only been imported of late years owing i rather imagine to the difficulty with which slaves have been attained on the western coast of africa caused by the vigilance of the british cruisers in that quarter and the vexations to which some of the slave ships have been liable from detention although they were ultimately suffered to proceed on their voyages the angola negroes make the best slaves many of them have been in bondage in their own country and therefore to these the change is for the better some of them have even served the whites in the city of Luanda, which is the principal Portuguese settlement upon the coast of Africa. But others were free in Angola, and consequently to these is allotted a life of disappointment and vexation whenever they remember their own country. The Negroes from Angola are, however, usually tractable, and may be taught to perform the menial service of a house or stable without much pains being taken with them and they often show great attachment fidelity and honesty footnote an instance occurred at liverpool of the attachment of some of these people to their master at the commencement of the direct trade from brazil to great britain some small vessels came to liverpool 
manned in part with slaves owing to their masters being ignorant that their arrival upon british ground would make them free however the men themselves were soon made acquainted with this circumstance and many of them availed themselves of the advantages which were to be thus obtained one of the men belonging to a small bark left his vessel and having entered himself as a seaman on board some other ship returned to persuade three of his companions to do the same but he was answered that they were well treated where they were had always been used kindly and therefore had no wish to try any other way of life these three men returned to brazil in the bark and i have heard that they were set at liberty by their master on their arrival there i hope it was so when the advocates of slavery relate such stories as these they give them as tending to prove that slaves in general are happy anecdotes of this kind demonstrate individual goodness in the master and individual gratitude in the slave but they prove nothing generally they do not affect the great question that rests upon grounds which are too deeply fixed to be moved by single instances of evil or of good Close footnote. the angola negroes are those who most commonly exert themselves to purchase their own freedom the congo negroes partake much of the same character of the angolans being equally tractable but they are steadier and are particularly adapted to the regular routine of field labor they are less quick in their movements than the angolans and do not seem to be so spirited and courageous they obtain in a short period a knowledge of the portuguese language the hebolos can scarcely in person be distinguished from the two former being stoutly made and not tall they have a black skin but it is not shining and the features are flat they seem to be a branch of the angolans and congos but they are more obstinate and more subject to despond than the others these three tribes appear to have belonged originally to the same nation for many parts of their character are similar their persons are of the same mould and the dialects of each sufficiently resemble each other to be understood by all the three End of section eleven Section twelve of Travels in Brazil, Volume two, by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section twelve, Chapter seven, Part two. The Anjico Negroes show many marks of being of another nation. They make good slaves if they are well treated and are yet preserved under due control. They are difficult to train and bear a heavy yoke impatiently there is in them much independence of character if they dared to show it there is also much cunning and the desire and capability of overreaching their persons are tall and well formed their skins are of a glossy black their eyes are expressive and their countenance plainly denote that it is not by their own will that they will continue in slavery they are not however numerous great neatness is shown by them in their household arrangements and they often exert themselves to obtain money but they are less careful and prudent than the nations of which i have already treated all the angico negroes have three gashes on each cheek which are cut in a circular form from the ear to the mouth footnote mr edwards mentions some of the gold coast negroes or those of the adjacent countries and gives as an instance the chamba negroes who follow this custom Close quote. the gabao or gaboon negroes have not been very long introduced and from the well-known general character of the nation they are sold at a reduced price i have heard many persons state that they are cannibals footnote whilst i resided at jaguaripe i heard the two negroes of this nation had murdered a child of three or four years of age the son or daughter of their master and that they had been caught in the act of preparing to cook part of the body the men were carried down the hecife but the person who informed me of these circumstances did not know what punishment had been inflicted upon them Close footnote. they appear to be in a still more savage state than any of the former mentioned nations and are much given to despondency and consequent suicide indeed ten and even twenty that have been purchased together have in some instances in the course of a short period all died from despair or have put an end to their lives in a more summary manner it is with difficulty that the gaboons can be taught to perform any labor above that of the simplest description 
and sometimes they remain for years unbaptized from the great trouble which is required in making them articulate any sounds to which they have not been accustomed yet it is rather that they will not be taught than that they cannot learn for i have heard many planters say that if a gabon negro can be made cheerful and be induced to take an interest in those persons who are around him and in his occupations he becomes a most useful and intelligent slave the gabon negroes are tall and handsome and their skins are very black and shining the features of many of them are good being much less flat and blunt than those of their countrymen in general the mozambique negroes are a poor and ugly race of beings languid and inactive and subject to despondency their color inclines to brown but still they have completely the negro features as the price of these slaves is much below that of any other description of negroes some of the planters have taken them on trial but they are said to have many of the bad qualities of the gaboons without their hardiness a negro will sometimes tell his master that he is determined to die and too often the effects of his resolve begin shortly afterwards to be perceived he becomes thin loses his appetite and dies almost a skeleton one of the means which is very generally said that these miserable beings employ for the purpose of destroying themselves is that of eating considerable quantities of lime and earth which either produces emaciation or dropsy but it is strange that a habit of eating lime and earth should be contracted in some instances by african and likewise by creole children and as frequently by free children as those who are in slavery this practice is not treated as if it were a disorder but it is accounted a habit which by attention from those who have the charge of the children in watching and punishing them may be conquered without the aid of medicine i know of some instances in which no medical treatment was deemed necessary but the individuals recovered by means of chastisement and constant vigilance it is a subject upon which i was often led to converse and i discovered that most of the free-born families were acquainted with the practice from experience among their own children or those of their neighbors and that they always considered it as a habit and not as a disease among adults however slaves are infinitely more subject to it than free persons footnote i merely state what is the general idea upon the subject in that country without giving an opinion upon the general question mr edwards says that it is a disease and not a habit history of the west indies volume two page one forty one labat is of the opinion that it is a habit and not a disease nouveau voyage etc tome two page eleven close footnote pernambuco has never experienced any serious revolt among the slaves but at bahia there have been several commotions footnote there was one in eighteen fourteen and another in february of the present year eighteen sixteen close footnote I believe that Bahia contains fewer free people than Pernambuco in proportion to the number of slaves, but I cannot avoid attributing the quietude of the latter in some measure to the circumstance of a few of the Gold Coast Negroes being imported into it, whilst at Bahia the principal stock of slaves is from that part of Africa. It is by the Nina Negroes in Bahia that the results have been made, and by the Coromantes in Jamaica in 1760 footnote edwards history of the west indies volume two page sixty four close footnote these are i believe the same people under different names and they are represented as possessing great firmness of mind and body and ferociousness of disposition the obeya men of the colombian islands and the mandingueros of brazil are evidently from their practices the same description of persons the religion which the brazilian slaves are taught has likewise a salutary effect upon this point for it tends to lessen or entirely removes the faith which was previously entertained by the africans respecting the incantations of their countrymen the superstitions of their native land are replaced by others of a more harmless nature the dreadful effects of faith in the obia men which sometimes occur in the british colonies are not experienced in brazil from the mandigueros belief in their powers is certainly not extinguished 
and indeed even some of the creoles imbibe a notion of the efficacy of their spells but the effects of these are not generally felt footnote the negroes who are obtained in the province of senegambia are known to the west indian planters by the general name of mandingos history of the west indies volume two page fifty there is a sort of people who travel about in the country called mandingo men these are mohammedans they do not like to work they go from place to place and when they find any chiefs or people whom they think they can make anything of they take up their abode for a time with them and sometimes make grigris and sometimes cast sand from them for which they make them pay correspondence of mr john kizzle in the sixth report of the directors of the african institution page one thirty six close footnote the slaves who are employed in hesifi may be divided into two classes household slaves and those which pay a weekly stipend to their owners proceeding from the earnings of some employment which does not oblige them to be under the immediate eye of the master the first class have little chance of gaining their freedom by their own exertions and are subject to the caprice and whims of their superiors but some are manumitted by the kindness of those whom they have served and the clothing and food which is afforded to them is generally better than that which the other class obtains the second class consists of joiners shoemakers canoemen porters etc and these men may acquire a sufficient sum of money to purchase their own freedom if they have the requisite prudence and steadiness to allow their earnings to accumulate but too often the inducements to expend them foolishly are sufficiently powerful to make these people swerve from their purpose they generally earn more each day than the master exacts and have besides the sundays and holidays as their own and if the slave feeds and clothes himself to these are added the sundays of every week footnote mr edwards says in jamaica the negroes are allowed one day in a fortnight except in time of crop besides sundays and holidays for cultivating their grounds and carrying their provisions to market the protestant church enjoins the observance of three or four holidays and the catholic church of above thirty close footnote i think that allowing largely for him to supply everything requisite for his support and decent appearance and yet something for what may to a person in such a rank of life be accounted luxury a slave so circumstanced may in ten years purchase his freedom if his value is great it is because his trade is lucrative so that these things keep pace with each other the women have likewise some employments by which they may be enabled to gain their liberty they make sweetmeats and cakes and are sent out as cooks nurses housekeepers etc creole negroes and mulattoes are generally accounted quicker in learning any trade than the africans the superior attitude to profit by instruction is doubtless produced by their acquaintance from infancy with the manners customs and language of their masters from the little experience however which i have had and from the general remarks which i have gathered from others who might be judged better acquainted than myself with slaves i think that an african who has become cheerful and seems to have forgotten his former state is a more valuable slave than a creole negro or mulatto he will be generally more fit to be trusted far from the latter submitting quietly to the situation in which they have been born they bear the yoke of slavery with impatience the daily sight of so many individuals of their own caste who are in a state of freedom makes them wish to be raised to an equality with them and they feel at every moment their unfortunate doom the consideration with which the free persons of mixed castes are treated tends to increase the discontent of their brothers who are in slavery the africans do not feel this for they are considered by their creole brethren in colour as being so completely inferior that the line which by public opinion has been drawn between them makes the imported slave feel towards the creoles as if they had not been originally of the same stock miserable objects are at times to be seen in hesifi asking alms in various quarters of the town aged and diseased some of these persons have been slaves and when from infirmity they have been rendered useless their masters have manumitted them and thus being turned away to starve in their old age or in a crippled state their only resource is to beg in the public streets 
these instances of gross injustice and depravity in masters are not many but that they should occur is sufficient to cause the aid of law to be called in that the existence of them should be prevented the sugar plantations which belong to the benedictine monks and carmelite friars are those upon which the labor is conducted with the greatest attention to system and with the greatest regard to the comfort and ease of the slaves i can more particularly speak of the estates of the benedictine monks because my residence at jaguaribe gave me daily opportunities of hearing of the management of one of their establishments and although sugar works were not erected upon the estate in question still the number of negroes which were upon it was fully adequate to this purpose besides in some years canes were planted upon it which were to be ground at some neighboring mill the frequent communication likewise which there was between the slaves of this plantation and those of the other estates belonging to the same convent upon which sugar is made enabled me to ascertain that all the establishments are owned by the benedictines are conducted in the same manner the slaves of the jaguaripi st bento estate are all creoles and are in number about three hundred the children are carefully taught their prayers by some of the elder negroes and the hymn to the virgin is sung by all the slaves male and female who can possibly attend at seven o'clock every evening at this hour it is required that every person shall be at home the young children are allowed to amuse themselves as they please during the greatest part of the day and their only occupation for certain hours is to pick cotton for lamps and to separate the beans which are fit for seed from those which are rotten and other work of the same description when they arrive at the age of ten or twelve years the girls spin thread for making the coarse cotton cloth of the country and the boys attend to the horses and oxen driving them to pasture etc if a child evinces peculiar fitness for any trade care is taken that his talent should be applied in the manner which he would himself prefer a few of them are taught music and assist in the church festivals of the convent marriages are encouraged as early as the age of seventeen and eighteen for the men and at fourteen and fifteen for the girls many of these unions take place immediately after their entrance into this state the people begin to labor regularly in the field for their owners oftentimes both boys and girls request the manager to allow them to commence their life of daily toil before the age which is pointed out by the regulations of the convent and this occurs because they are not permitted to possess provision grounds of their own until they labor for their masters almost every description of labor is done by piecework and the task is usually accomplished by three o'clock in the afternoon which gives to those who are industrious an opportunity of working daily upon their own grounds the slaves are allowed the saturday of every week to provide for their own subsistence, besides the sundays and holidays those who are diligent fail not to obtain their freedom by purchase the provision grounds are never interfered with by the monks and when a negro dies or obtains his freedom he is permitted to bequeath his plot of land to any of his companions whom he may please to favor in this manner the superannuated slaves are carefully provided with food and clothing footnote one of these old men who was yet however sufficiently hardy to be often in a state of intoxication and would walk to a considerable distance to obtain liquor made a practice of coming to see me for this purpose he would tell me that he and his companions were not slaves to the monks but to st bento himself and that consequently the monks were only the representatives of their master for the due administration of the saint's property in this world i inquired of some others of the slaves and found that this was the general opinion among them close footnote none of the monks reside upon the jaguaribe estate but one of them comes from olinda almost every sunday and holiday to say mass upon the other benedictine estates there are resident monks the slaves treat their masters with great familiarity they only pay respect to the abbot whom they regard as the representative of the saint the conduct of the younger members of the communities of regular clergy is well known not to be by any means correct the vows of celibacy are not strictly adhered to 
this circumstance decreases the respect with which these men might otherwise be treated upon their own estates and increases much the licentiousness of the women i have seen upon these plantations many light-coloured mulatto slaves but when the approximation to white blood becomes considerable a marriage is projected for the individual with a person of darker tint no compulsion is made use of to oblige any one to marry and therefore many of the slaves contrary to the wishes of their masters remain single the monks allow their female slaves to marry free men but the male slaves are not permitted to marry free women many reasons are alleged in favor of this regulation one is that they do not wish that a slave should be useless in the way of increasing the stock of the plantation likewise the monks do not wish to have a free family residing among their slaves for obvious reasons which must be the case if a man marries a free woman they have less objection to a man because he is during the whole day away from their people or is perhaps employed by the community and thus in part dependent upon it and he merely comes to sleep in one of the huts besides a stranger is contributing to the increase of the stock the jaguaripe estate is managed by a mulatto slave who married a person of his own color and she likewise belonged to the convent her husband has purchased her freedom and that of her children he possesses two african slaves the profits of whose labor are entirely his own but he is himself obliged to attend to the business of the plantation and to see that the work of his masters is properly executed this man has offered his two africans in exchange for himself to the monks but they tell him that the jaguaripe estate could not be properly managed without his assistance and much against his inclination he continues in slavery this is one of the strongest instances of man's desire to act for himself nicolau enjoys the entire direction of the estate and every comfort which a man of his description can possibly wish for when he moves from home he is as well mounted as the generality of the rich planters he is permitted to be seated in the presence of his masters and indeed is allowed all the privileges of free men and yet the consciousness of being under the control of another always occupies his mind and leads him to desire the possession of those privileges as a right which he at present only enjoys by sufferance footnote an old slave who had been invariably well treated for he had never deserved punishment was asked by his master if he wished to be free he smiled but said nothing the question being repeated he answered that of course he wished to be free the master then told him that his deed of manumission should be drawn out the same day upon this being said the slave shook his head saying why do you say such things to laugh at your old black man however as soon as he was persuaded that it was true he began to dance about like one who was mad and for some minutes could answer no questions nor could any directions be given to him close footnote slavery however in this less intolerable state exists in only a few instances and although a great many of the planters certainly do treat their slaves with considerable regard and attention to their comforts still upon none of the estates excepting those of the religious communities which have been mentioned is the complete system of rendering unnecessary a constant supply of new laborers made the primary object the end to which all other considerations must give place next to the plantations which belong to the convents stand some of those of the rich brazilian owners who go on quietly if not systematically here the labor is not in general done by piecework nor do the laborers provide for their own subsistence and the slaves are sent to the field at an earlier age than they ought and earlier than is practiced upon the convent states some of the plantations however which are owned by individuals do give the saturday of each week for the slave to support himself footnote the saturday of each week is not sufficient for the slave to provide for his own subsistence unless the labor of his master is done by task work in which case he may manage to finish this in due time and to work a little each day upon his own provision grounds he may indeed be able to live by assisting the saturdays through the labor of his sundays and holidays even if the labor of his master is not done by piecework but this is not just for to the sundays and holidays he has a right as his own even if his master supports him but slavery and justice seldom go hand in hand Close footnote. 
corporal punishments are resorted to contrary to the custom of st banto and carmo estates and though great cruelties are not often committed footnote a planter with whom i was acquainted was once seen by a person who happened to call upon him occupied with three of his companions in flogging four negroes the men were tied at a short distance from each other to four posts and as the operation continued there was much laughing and joking for as they lashed their miserable victims they cried out here is to the health of such and such a person it is some comfort to be able to say that this wretch has been ruined and that his ruin has been caused by his treatment of his slaves which has occasioned the death of some and the escape of others from his power in a less melancholy manner another man on ordering a slave to work in the sugar mill was answered that he was sick and could not go but the master persisted the negro went saying you will then kill your slave and vexed with the treatment which he received now and had suffered on other occasions he placed his head near to one of the wheels for it was a watermill by which it was suffered from his body i could mention many anecdotes of this description indicative of individual blackness of heart such as have been related of all nations who have had to do with slaves but few will suffice neither of these stories which are above related occurred in the great and preeminent instance of depravity of which the scene was the mata and which has been mentioned in a former part of this work in that case fifty-five slaves were consumed in less than fifteen years Close footnote. still the mode of punishment produces much suffering much misery much degradation confinement and privations would i rather imagine be more efficacious the pride of the slave who is obliged to appear abroad with his back covered with scars is at first much hurt but the shame of being seen in this state soon wears off and then all hopes of reform may be given up he will continue in his faults and be indifferent to the stripes which he must occasionally undergo for committing them i have been requested by slaves who had been often so treated to punish them with the whip and not to make them endure the misery of sitting in the stocks in solitary confinement but the punishment is suffered in private no exposure is occasioned by it it would appear strange that the slave should prefer corporal punishment and this would seem to denote that this class of men possesses none of those feelings of shame of which i have spoken but i am convinced that these are as deeply implanted in the negro as in any other race of human beings where a slave has often been punished with a whip and sees many of his companions and acquaintance undergoing the same punishment frequently the knowledge that it is what he himself has before borne and that so many are thus treated takes away the horror of what he would otherwise feel at the kind of chastisement this proves the debased states the very low ebb to which human nature may be brought the additional rigor which thus the slave seems to consider confinement to be would be a recommendation to some persons and perhaps the feeling is in the main right for if the crime is great the punishment should be adequate and by this means of confinement no degradation of the human being is occasioned hopes may be entertained that the time which is given for reflection and the depression of spirits which is produced by the loneliness of the situation may bring about a correction of error but by the whip angry and vindictive feelings are excited or despair is the consequence and in either case the owner will be injured in the former by a determination to continue in fault and in the latter by the death or inaction of the sufferer the objection which is principally to be urged against the mode of chastisement which i have accounted the least prejudicial to the slave considered as a rational being is to be met with in the loss of time which is incurred by confinement a due length but i think that this would be much more than compensated by the loss of health and of character which the negro suffers in undergoing punishment by the whip and even of time during the period that the slave is recovering from the stripes iron collars chains and other punishments of the same description are likewise made use of and are liable to the objection of rendering callous the sense of shame i have observed and have often heard it remarked that scarcely any of the slaves who receive frequent correction ever gain their freedom through their own exertions the bad dispositions and inclinations of many and the indifference which is produced in others by severe punishments 
sufficiently account for this fact footnote might not an act be passed for the british colonies obliging the master to manumit his slave on the fair value of the individual being tendered however this is not a place for discussion Close footnote. the creole slaves are usually employed as tradesmen and household servants even upon the sugar plantations this is the case where they are not more numerous than what are necessary to fill these departments to the africans the field labor is chiefly allotted the negroes are sent to work as the sun rises and far from being more capable of exertion in the early part of the morning than under the midday heat the africans are inactive and languid until the increasing power of the sun removes the chill which they receive from the cool morning air they frequently leave their huts wrapped up in their coverlids of bays seemingly much distressed by the cold the negroes breakfast about eight o'clock and for this meal half an hour or less is allowed and some masters expect their slaves shall breakfast before they commence their work in the morning that is before sunrise the time which is allowed for dinner is from twelve o'clock till two when the laborers again continue their labor until half past five o'clock they are now generally speaking expected to pick a small bundle of grass for the master's saddle horses in some of the neighboring provision grounds but if this is not requisite the work continues until sunset about six o'clock on the arrival of the people at home in the evening they are sometimes required to escape the rind from the mangiac for about one or two hours but as none of the principal estates make a practice of selling the flour of the mangiac and only prepare the quantity which is necessary for the subsistence of the slaves this labor only occurs about once in every week or less frequently in crop time the work is only discontinued on sundays and holidays and as is practiced on board vessels at sea the negroes relieve each other at stated hours the field negroes are attended by a fetor or driver who is sometimes a white man but more frequently a free mulatto is employed for the purpose it is the practice likewise of some of the planters to appoint a creole or even an african slave to the situation upon a fetor who is a slave more reliance is to be placed than upon a free person of color for the slave fetor becomes responsible to his master for the work which is to be executed and is therefore careful that every one shall do his duty it is a remark generally made that the slave fetodores require to be watched that they may be prevented from being too rigorous towards those whom they are appointed to command their behavior is usually more overbearing than that of freemen and next to the slaves the european fetores are the most tyrannical it is likewise frequently observed that even manumitted africans who become possessed of slaves which occasionally occurs treat them in a severe and unfeeling manner that nothing is softened but rather rendered more violent by a remembrance of their own sufferings experience and trouble too often leads those who have suffered to the infliction of equal or greater hardships when opportunities for so doing are afforded the human being becomes callous he is tormented and torments with the same indifference medical attendance is not so well provided for as it ought which proceeds rather from the small number of practitioners in the country than from the negligence of the planters indeed due attention in this respect is so much and so evidently their interest that this alone independent of any feelings of humanity would make them seek every means of obtaining proper advice for their slaves footnote i met with the following passage in a work of much reputation among the affairs of the british sugar lands the circumstance wherein the slaves in the west indies seems most indebted to their owners liberality are i think those of medical attendance and accommodation with sick would not a man take his horse to a farrier if anything ailed him Close footnote. i do not think that the food which the slaves receive is in sufficient quantities or of equality sufficiently nourishing for the labor which they are required to perform and it would be undoubtedly much too scanty if the days of intended rest did not supply them with an addition to the stock of provisions which the master affords i have in another place stated 
that the vegetable part of the food of the sugar plantation negroes is chiefly the flour of the manja the animal food is generally the carne do sierra salt meat which comes from rio grande do sul and sometimes salt fish supplies its place the clothing which is given to the slaves by the master consists of a shirt and drawers of the cotton cloth of the country and a straw hat a piece of baize and a mat are likewise afforded to them but these things are not renewed as often as a due consideration to their comforts would demand although the negroes are fed by their masters still as lands are to be had in abundance the slaves are permitted to plant whatever they think fit and to sell the produce to whom they please many of them rear pigs and poultry and occasionally a horse is kept from the hire of which money may be obtained footnote horses are usually marked upon the right haunch with the private mark of their owners but the beasts which have been bred by slaves are marked on the left haunch or on the shoulder blade this proves among many other corroborating circumstances that though the law may prohibit a slave from possessing property custom has established a practice which is better adapted to the present state of the country Close footnote. the newly imported negroes are usually sent to work too soon after their arrival upon the estates if proper care is taken of them they may indeed be employed in almost any description of labor at the end of eight or ten months but not much before this period damp situations should be avoided and they ought not to be sent out in the morning earlier than eight o'clock and they should breakfast before they leave home by these precautions the loss of many slaves might be prevented and they should be followed without any deviation at least until the new negroes have been for a twelvemonth in the country to which they have been transported footnote the plan of distributing the newcomers among the old established negroes to be taken care of by them as is practised in jamaica has not been adopted in brazil i think the effect of this must be good for thus each established slave takes an interest in one of his newly arrived companions the new slaves too may be sooner reconciled to their situation by the interest which is shown in their behalf and their wants may be known to the master with more ease the law which was passed at rio de janeiro in 1809 mentioned in chapter 16 for preventing executions for debt upon the property of sugar planters may have one beneficial effect the slaves cannot unless the master pleases be sold separately from the estate for the purpose of paying debts the master cannot be forced to dispose of them unless the debt amounts to the value of the estate and thus the slave is advanced in some slight degree toward the condition of a serf close footnote end of section twelve Section 13 of Travels in Brazil, Volume 2, by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 13, Chapter 7, Part 3. I have represented slavery in what I conceive to be the state in which it usually exists upon the plantations, but any comforts which the human beings who are so circumstanced enjoy, and any respite from severe labor, is so entirely at the will of the master that the instances in which the fate of the slave is hard almost beyond endurance are dreadfully too frequent some planters follow the system of performing certain kinds of work during the early part of the night besides making the negroes labor for the full usual time during the day for instance the whole of the labor of making the mangiac flour preparing with the feet the clay for making bricks and earthenware also building mud walls besides removing bricks firewood and so forth from one place to another this extra work is called gingingu i even knew of one instance in which the field labor was continued until twelve o'clock at night by the light of large fires which had been kindled on several parts of the ground for this manner of proceeding there was no reason excepting that it was the master's pleasure so to act for the season was favorable and not too far advanced to have continued the work in the usual manner and yet have accomplished the planting of the field in proper time of cruelty i could say much but i have gone far enough and must not enter into farther details upon this part of my subject the relation of such misdeeds 
does more harm than good they serve as examples for those who have unprincipled minds and unfeeling hearts and who may consider them as paths in which they may tread because others have trodden in them rather than as precipices which ought to be avoided the power which is entrusted to an individual is too great abuses must arise the system is radically bad and every possible means should be put into action for its extirpation i am acquainted with the owners of a few estates who profess to purchase any slaves however bad their characters may be if they can obtain them below the usual price the persons of secondary rank who possess only a few slaves and have not the means of punishing them if they misbehave which exist upon the great estates dispose of those of their negroes who act improperly to the rich men who will purchase them there is an estate in the matha of which the owner is known to buy any slave however ill-disposed he may be provided he can obtain him at a low price this man manages to keep his estate in the best order possible everything goes on regularly upon it he even prefers purchasing creole slaves to africans although the former are invariably more difficult to manage is a man of determined character on the arrival of one of these new slaves he takes him to the prison of the estate and shows him the stocks the chains the whips etc saying this is what you are to expect if you continue in your evil practices then a hut is given to the slave and also clothes and other articles of comfort all of which are in a state of greater neatness and are afforded in larger quantities than are usually bestowed upon the slaves of other plantations on one occasion the negro struck the fetor for which he was immediately confined until the matter could be investigated the free man was found to be in fault and was turned away the negro suffered a certain degree of punishment for striking a superior but he was ultimately appointed to the situation of fetor having before held that of second driver if this planter did not rule his people with great severity when guilty his estate would soon become a den of thieves and murderers for it is well known of what bad materials his gang of slaves is composed he is of mixed blood but is nearly related to some of the first families of the province it is well that a man should appear who is willing for the sake of a trifling difference in the price for which he may obtain his laborers to take the trouble and undergo the risk of person and of property in controlling a set of uneducated men who cannot consequently have any principle of action and whose habits are of the worst description according to present circumstances he is of service to the country for these fellows are kept quiet but what a dreadful state it is that the institutions of a country should be so framed that there should exist in its centre a body of human beings of which many of the individuals are criminals men who certainly never will be punished by the laws of the country though punishment may or may not be inflicted by the person to whom they are subservient the slaves of the cotton estates undergo as may be supposed the same kinds of punishments and are subject to the same species of treatment as those who have already been spoken of their management as in other parts is conducted on the whole in a more lenient or a more rigorous manner according to the dispositions of the owners they are however liable to greater privations from the nature of the country in which they reside and they do not enjoy the benefit of crop time which is so favorable to the negroes of the sugar plantations food is not so easily obtained in parts which are so distant from great towns and from the sea-coast and greater difficulty is experienced in the sale of the mangiac the beans and the maize which the slaves raise upon their own provision grounds still the negroes of the cotton districts sometimes gain their freedom by their own exertions for as cotton is a most lucrative plant and yet may be cultivated and brought to market with little or no expenditure of money those of the slaves who plant regularly and gather their trifling quantities frequently in the end meet with the reward of their labors this is not the case with the sugar cane for in cultivating this plant assistance is necessary much work being required to be done within a given time owing to the seasons in planting it and to the nature of the cane when it ripens and there is likewise the difficulty of having it ground and of receiving the proceeds etc 
in the manufactory the slave has not his property under his own eye it passes through the hands of many other individuals and as there is no personal respect for the owner of the property nor any means of redress in cases of injustice the slave has only a poor chance of being properly dealt with the above circumstances being those to which the culture of the sugar-cane is subject it is scarcely ever planted by slaves on their own account the cattle districts employ few slaves and these are occupied at home for scarcely any of them unless they are creoles are deemed capable of undertaking the more arduous employments of pursuing the cattle breaking in horses etc the slaves remain in the huts to attend to the less enterprising occupations the climate of the sertão is accounted well adapted to the constitutions of the africans sickly negroes are often purchased at reduced prices by persons who reside in the interior under the idea that the climate will soon re-establish their health the circumstance of the non-existence of the chigua or bishu footnote bishu means an animal in the common acceptation of the word but the insect which is commonly in other countries called the chigua is known at pernambuco only under the name of bishu Close footnote. in the plains of the sertão is of much importance for this insect is extremely injurious to some of the negroes notwithstanding every precaution the feet have in some instances been destroyed by them the chigua has more effect upon the flesh of some persons than upon that of others and the subjects who are thus violently attacked by this insect are sometimes only preserved from being crippled by the removal to a part of the country in which it does not exist the dryness of the air and soil of the sertão generally removes agues of long standing and likewise a complaint which frequently proceeds from the ague and is called amareladaum or yellowness the africans are seldom attacked by the ague but they have often the amareladaum in the black settlements beyond the plains of the sertão bordering upon the mountains where cotton is planted and from which the plains are in part supplied by food the number of negroes is becoming considerable i have had opportunities of conversing with negroes from the sertão and have invariably found that they preferred their residence in the cattle districts even to a removal into the country bordering upon the sea the diet of the sertão negro is preferable to that of the plantation slave so that this circumstance independently of all others would make the former be well aware of the superiority of his situation fresh beef and mutton are the usual food of the sertão slaves but upon the plantations these are rarely served out the most dreadful complaint to which negroes are subject more than any other descriptions of men is that which in the colombian islands is known under the name of yaws and in brazil by that of bobas i had opportunities of seeing it and most loathsome is the sight of the individuals who are afflicted with it the body becomes covered with large ulcers the patient is reduced to a mere skeleton and is rendered generally for a time quite helpless the facility with which it is communicated to others increases the distress of the patient for every precaution must be taken in separating the sufferer to some distance from the other slaves the adult who recovers from it seldom enjoys as perfect health as before the negroes say that it gets into the bone every change of weather is felt by those who have had the disorder although they are again accounted in health and in some cases the use of one or other of the limbs is occasionally lost for a time a certain diet must be observed for many months after the disorder has apparently left the person who has had it for the purpose of preventing a relapse and sometimes a deviation from this even some years after will cause violent pains in the joints the following circumstance occurred under my own eyes a child belonging to one of my neighbors whilst i resided at jaguaribe was in the practice of coming to amuse itself with some of the children of the plantation he had this disorder upon him and soon afterwards the son of a laborer caught it all this was not made known to me until a slave of eight years of age was reported to me to have the bobas 
and shortly afterwards an old man, the father of this child, likewise fell ill. In the course of a short time, notwithstanding every care was taken, other persons were afflicted with the disease. A surgeon was applied to, and he prescribed mercury to all the patients. An infant of a few months old, which afterwards caught the disease, underwent the same treatment. The children who had arrived at a certain age all recovered, and until the period of my departure they had never experienced any return, nor had felt any bad effects from it. The old man still labored under it, but was recovering. The growth of the infant was stopped by the disease, and very little hopes were entertained of saving its life. This horrible disorder is contracted by inhabiting the same room with the patient, and by inoculation. This is effected by means of a small fly, from which every precaution is oftentimes of no avail. Great numbers of the insects of this species appear early in the morning, but they are not so much seen when the sun is powerful. If one of them chances to settle upon the corner of the eye or mouth, or upon the most trifling scratch, it is enough to inoculate the bulbus if the insect comes from a person who labors under the disease. The same person can only have the bulbus once. The scars which it leaves upon the bodies of the negroes have a most disgusting appearance, for the wounds have in some cases been of such long standing, and have penetrated so deep as to have changed the color of the skin, which becomes of a most loathsome white color. Footnote. Dr. Pinkard, in his notes on the West Indies, mentions the mercury was used for the complaint at Rubisi, with very little success. Mr. Edwards doubts if medicine of any kind is of use in this disease. This writer likewise states that he had heard of the Gold Coast Negroes inoculating their children with a complaint, and also the notion which they have of the disease getting into the bone. Bolingbroke says no effectual cure has, I believe, ever been found for it. Salivation will drive it in, but sulfur and other opening medicines are now preferred to induce its coming out. And again, there are black women who inoculate their children for this disorder. Its violence is thereby lessened. Voyage to the Demerare, etc., page 54. Close footnote. However, deep wounds of any description have the same effect upon the negro skin. There are considerable numbers of white persons and of color who possess two or three slaves, and share with them the daily labor, even of the field. These slaves are, generally speaking, Creoles who have been reared in the family, or Africans who have been purchased very young for a trifling sum of money. They are frequently considered as part of the family, and share with the master the food for which both are working. These slaves appear on gala days well dressed, and they have a certain air of independence which shows that they think themselves to be something more in the world than mere drudges. The difference of the feeling of one of these men towards his master, and that of the generality of the slaves who are owned by great proprietors, is very striking. The former will not suffer in his presence a word to be spoken against his master, whilst the latter cares not if he hears every injurious epithet made use of, the slaves of small proprietors are not so liable to imbibe many of the faults to which those of wealthy men are subject, and they possess more pride, a greater wish to act honorably, a greater dread of being upbraided for a fault. Upon large estates the assemblage of so many persons tends to deprivation, and the wide distance which there is between the slave and the master tends to produce a greater feeling of inferiority. But among the small proprietors, the difference of rank is infinitely less, owing, among other causes, to the assistance which they receive from each other in their daily occupations. Footnote. A small proprietor in Brazil is a man who possesses from two to ten slaves. A large proprietor, upon an average, in the part of the country of which I speak, possesses from twenty to sixty slaves. Close footnote. From the vastness of the country it might be supposed that if a slave escapes from his master, the chances would be against his return, but this is not the case. The Africans particularly are generally brought back. They are soon distinguished by their manner of speaking the Portuguese language, and if any of them cannot give a good account of himself, he will not be allowed to remain long unmolested. 
for the profit arising from the apprehension of a runaway slave is considerable besides the manumitted african generally continues to reside in the neighborhood of the estate upon which he has served as a slave so that when a man of this description that is an african comes without being known to settle in a district suspicion immediately arises that he is not free the manumitted creoles remove to where they are not known because they do not wish that the state in which they were born should reach their new place of residence an african must have been brought to brazil as a slave and therefore his situation of a free man proves that his character is good or he could not have obtained his liberty but a creole may have been born free and consequently his former state as a slave he wishes to conceal creole slaves and more especially mulattoes often do escape and are never afterwards heard of by their masters but even these are sometimes brought back a case of great hardship occurred at hesifi a short time before i left that place a negro and his wife had escaped and as their master had not received any tidings of them for sixteen or seventeen years he supposed that both of them had died however one day there arrived at his door in hesifi a number of capitans do campo with several persons in custody he soon recognized his negro and negress and was told that the five young persons who were with them were their children and consequently his slaves these poor creatures had been brought up until this period of their lives with the idea that they were free and thus a young man of sixteen and his sister of fourteen years of age were at the season of joy and gladness to commence a life of misery the master confined them all until he could dispose of them to some slave dealer which he soon accomplished and they were shipped from hesifi for maranhão i never heard how the discovery had been made that these people were not free oh system accursed which thus stamps the hopes and prospect of a whole life some of the negroes who escape determined to shun the haunts of man they conceal themselves in the woods instead of attempting to be received into some distant village as free persons they form huts which are called macombos in the most unfrequented spots and live upon the game and fruit which their places of retreat afford these persons sometimes assemble to the number of ten or twelve and then their dislodgment is difficult for their acquaintance with the woods around give them the advantage over any party which may be sent to attack them footnote a slave belonging to a colonel of militia who was a planter of great wealth was in the frequent practice of concealing himself in the woods for some days at a time on being brought back he was punished and soon again ran away and this behavior continued for some time in one of his rambles he met his master who was riding alone in one of the narrow roads of the country the slave placed himself in the middle of the path saluted his master as if he had been only slightly acquainted with him and addressing him begged that he would give him some money the colonel was much alarmed and granted his request upon which he was suffered to proceed but was admonished to be silent upon the subject the slave was soon taken but he continued to run away to be brought home to be punished and again to go through the same proceeding so frequently and for so many years that at last his master allowed him to do as he pleased indeed he was somewhat afraid of a second meeting in the woods when he might not perhaps be treated so courteously he has obstinately refused to sell the negro as the negro objected to serving him because he knew that the slave wished to be sold to some one else and from a notion which some of the planters entertain of not choosing to dispose of any person whom they have owned unless by manumission Close footnote. sometimes a whole neighborhood is disturbed by one of these communities who rob the provision grounds steal calves lambs and poultry and stories are told of the gabon negro stealing children footnote. there was a boy of twelve years of age of african birth who belonged to jaguaripe this child often inhabited the woods for several days together he killed a calf on one occasion and separated the quarters of the animal by means of a sharp stone he was discovered by the dropping of the blood from the field to the hiding place as soon as the owner of the calf found the boy he wished of course to take him to his master 
but the boy laid himself down upon the ground and refused to stir the man bound him to a tree and went home to fetch a horse upon which he placed the boy and tied him there he walked after him to jaguaribe driving the horse on before the boy was punished but a few hours after he had been flogged he said to one of his companions well at least i had the honor of being attended by a pajem or page the usual word for a groom this happened under a former tenant of jaguaripe a short time before i left that plantation the same boy fled with another of nearly the same age both of them being about fourteen years of age they had been absent some days when late one evening an indian laborer brought them both home the children had thrown off all clothing and had made bows and arrows suited to their own size with which they were to kill poultry rats etc as food their appearance was most laughable but it was distressing it was soon known that they were found and many of their companions and other inhabitants of the plantation assembled to see and to laugh at these terrible negros tomato or bush negros the boys had been well treated by me and therefore the propensity to continue in practices which had commenced under severe usage could be their only inducement to prefer the woods now close footnote the slaves of maranao are in a less favorable state than those of pernambuco on the whole but the system which is followed respecting them is radically the same their food is usually rice which is said to disagree with most of the nations which come from africa and the treatment which they receive upon the estates in that part of the country is said to be more rigorous but of this i cannot myself speak for i had no opportunities of judging negroes who are decidedly of incorrigible character are shipped from pernambuco to maranhão and though the cause for which these transportations are made is well known they are often sold to great advantage nothing tends so much to keep a slave in awe as the threat of sending him to marignan or to para that the general character of persons who are in a state of slavery should be amiable and that goodness should predominate is not to be expected but we ought rather to be surprised at the existence of that degree of virtue which is to be found among those who are reduced to a situation of so much misery slaves are much inclined to pilfer and particularly towards their masters this is very frequent indeed many of them scarcely think they are acting improperly in doing so footnote one of the men in my possession used to say on being tasked with any theft to steal from master is not to steal furtar do senor now a furtar close footnote drunkenness is common among them footnote strange notions exist on this subject several nostrums are in repute for the curing of this habit but that of which the fame stands the highest is earth that is taken from a grave dissolved in water and given to the negro without his knowing what he is taking close footnote a direct answer is not easily obtained from a slave but the information which is required is learnt by means of four or five questions put in various ways the necessity for this is frequently caused by stupidity or from ignorance of the language in which the slave is addressed rather than from any wish to deceive it is in their behavior to their families and companions that the good part of the human being is displayed and natural enough is it that it should be so the negroes show much attachment to their wives and children to their other relations if they should chance to have any and to their malangos or fellow passengers from africa the respect which is paid to old age is extremely pleasing to witness superannuated africans upon the estates are never suffered to want any comforts with which it is in the power of their fellow-slaves to supply them the old negroes are addressed by the term of pai and mai father and mother their masters likewise add this term to the name of their older slaves when speaking to them that the generality of the slaves should show great attachment to their masters is not to be expected why should they the connection between the two descriptions of persons is not one of love and harmony of good producing gratitude of esteem and respect it is one of hatred and discord of distrust and of continual suspicion one of which the evil is so enormous that if any proper feelings exist in those who are supposed to benefit from it and in those who suffer under it 
they proceed from our nature and not from the system it will be seen from the above statement that the slaves of those parts of brazil which i have had opportunities of seeing are more favorably situated than those of the colombian islands but still they are slaves and in this word is included great misery great degradation great misfortune End of section 13section fourteen of travels in brazil volume two by henry coster this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight in policy of the slave trade few persons in great britain have now any doubts of the inhumanity of the slave trade and none would presume to come forward as its defenders it is a great moral evil perhaps the greatest in the world from which england has at last been delivered but her work is not yet done other nations continue to transport the natives of africa from their own shores to those of south america and even when her efforts have succeeded in persuading them to forbid this trade the plan of abolition must be followed up in her own colonies she must atone for the crimes which she has committed and prove to other nations her sincerity in the cause by her zeal in rooting out a most execrable system with all prudent and possible expedition in brazil there are several excellent men who still entertain the idea that the africans are saved from death by the slave dealers and that if they were not purchased by europeans their countrymen would murder them this was the opinion in england a few years ago and therefore we cannot be surprised that the brazilians should still consider it as being founded upon truth it is their interest so to think or at any rate they imagine that it is their interest and they have no books or other means by which they might be undeceived to the planters i feel that scarcely any arguments would be of avail they imagine that without slaves their estates must decay and therefore they fortify themselves under the notion of the humanity of the trade by which they obtain their supplies if the chief body of the priests could be convinced as to its cruelty of the effect which this trade has to render still more prominent than they would otherwise be the bad qualities of the natives of africa in their own country and to check everything that is good of its direct tendency to increase the manifold evils of the state of society existing in the parts of that continent which are the resort of slave dealers if the clergy could be made to believe that by their voice they were sanctioning one of the most shocking systems under which the world has ever labored i know that their aid would be given to abolition i am aware likewise of the weight which their opinions carry with them among other descriptions of persons one of the chief arguments with the priesthood is the advantages which the africans receive from their entrance into the catholic church how much better would it be to teach them the christian religion upon their native soil without all the miseries to which they are subjected by their transportation another opinion has also been adopted which induces the brazilians to suspect the motives of great britain in urging their government to abolish the trade they say it was from policy alone that she abolished the slave trade because her colonies were fully stocked and that now she wishes to accomplish the abolition among other nations who are not so well provided with laborers that they may not rival her transatlantic possessions and ultimately surpass them by the increased number of workmen Footnote the investigador portugues and the correio brasilense two portuguese journals published in london have arranged themselves on the side of justice humanity and sound policy the former of them has been translating dr thorpe's pamphlet respecting the colony of sierra leone and has given portions of it in each number i hope the editors will be aware of the necessity of fair play and will next proceed to translate the special report of the directors of the african institution in answer to the charges preferred against them by dr thorpe i know no more of the matter to which either of the pamphlets relate than what i have gathered from them and from mr macaulay's letter to his royal highness the duke of gloucester but let there be fair play let each side be heard and judged this is due to the african institution owing to the until now unimpeached characters of its leading members 
by so doing the editors of the journal would prove most decidedly their sincerity in the cause of abolition Close footnote. it is clear that those who hold out that upon such principles as these the abolition was effected in england know nothing of its history for if they did they would soon see from what pure motives the zeal for the prohibition of the slave trade proceeded they would read of the exertions and perseverance of clarkson the great apostle in this cause and they would be convinced that the eloquence of wilberforce could only emanate from the most disinterested sources it would be perceived that these two individuals whose names will forever be connected with the famous law to the passing of which they contributed so materially were followed by a train of advocates in this glorious struggle whose aid was afforded under circumstances which were as little liable to suspicion as the conduct of their great leaders the proofs of the unstained principles upon which this act was carried through parliament are so decisive that a plain statement of facts would convince all those who were not previously determined to believe the contrary the government of brazil has a difficult part to act it rules a numerous body of slave owners who are scattered over a very extensive country in which the authority of the sovereign will only of necessity be loosely recognized the possibility of resisting his commands does exist and though his mandates are issued in the style of despotism still he must be careful not to go too far for he is not the means of enforcing obedience to his edicts in the chief provinces if any one of them chose to withdraw its allegiance the government would be i rather think inclined to follow the example of the chief powers of europe but it must not be precipitate the people must be prepared for the change and have time given them to think upon a subject which under their present impressions is supposed to injure them so materially it is at bahia that the slave dealers and planters have shown themselves most violent in favor of the slave trade it is from this place that the most extensive traffic is carried on to the coast of africa in the province of bahia there are great estates possessing two three and four hundred slaves the owners of these are consequently rich and they possess power over the free population as well as over their own immediate dependents it is in that quarter that the greatest inclination to resist whatever its people does not relish has been experienced petitions containing forcible language have been presented to the government at rio de janeiro against the abolition and against the proceedings of the british cruisers stationed off the coast of africa by which several slave ships have been captured footnote the cry against the injustice and tyranny which is said to have been exercised by great britain in the employment of her naval superiority has been removed at least on this score for a sum of money was agreed to be paid by great britain to the government of brazil for the purpose of reimbursing those of its subjects whom it might judge to have been unjustly treated the captures of which complaint was principally made were effected under the impression that all ships which bore the portuguese flag to the coast of africa for slaves ought to be of portuguese build this was a mistake arising from misunderstanding the treaties which were concluded between the two powers in eighteen ten close footnote the government of brazil may and ought to be persuaded by all peaceable and friendly means which independent states possess of urging each other to do its utmost in accomplishing the much to be desired end but still whatever our wishes may be and however much the inclinations of the portuguese ministry may coincide with them they must consult the state of the country over which they rule a brazilian writer who has published several pamphlets at rio de janeiro with the permission of the region has spoken against the trade as far as it is possible under present circumstances slavery he styles a terrible cancer in the body politic which tends to impede the increase of the white race and as he rather quaintly expresses himself to africanize the new world footnote observações sobre a prosperidade do estado pelos principios liberais da nova legislação do brasil page sixteen close footnote this is not the only place in which the same writer speaks of slavery and of the 
trade in these terms a portuguese writer of much reputation among his countrymen says if we have never feared the power of the government neither ought we to hesitate in combating the erroneous opinions of the people confident that although he who opposes himself to the prejudices of a nation renders his name odious still he may be quite certain that posterity will do him justice footnote Correio Brasilense for december eighteen fifteen page seven thirty five close footnote another journal of equal reputation states that it is a great evil for the chief strength of an empire to consist in the number of its slaves and if brazil had once reflected that each negro which she exports from africa is necessarily an enemy whom she is nurturing she would perhaps not have dared to employ them at all or at any rate she would have made use of them in smaller numbers footnote investigador portugues for june eighteen sixteen page four ninety six close footnote i hope that other individuals of the same nation will see the subject in the same light and will give their assistance in leading their countrymen to a knowledge of the equity humanity and good policy of abolishing this detestable traffic the ruin of brazil is predicted the decay of its agriculture and of its commerce are supposed to be inevitable from the want of laborers if the trade is prohibited this is generally asserted wherever i have been without the least consideration without a thought being given to the possibility of employing the free population of the country in daily labor it is said that if africans are not to be obtained everything must be at a stand and the country can make no progress this argument against the abolition the brazilians bring forward even with much less plausibility than the planters of the colombian islands in these the number of free persons of color is comparatively very small whereas in brazil a great proportion of the population consists of free persons in the lower ranks of life in some parts of the country which i have visited the free people preponderate considerably and in none of those districts which i saw do i conceive that the slaves outnumber the free people in a greater proportion than three to one it will have been seen from foregoing chapters that the sugar plantations are not largely stocked with slaves and that no estate is without some portion of its lands which are occupied by families who are in a state of freedom the villages too contain free persons almost exclusively and even in the large towns the major part of the mechanics are free the slave trade is impolitic with regard to brazil on the broad principle that a man in a state of bondage will not be so serviceable to the community as one who acts for himself and whose whole exertions are directed to the advancement of his own fortune the increase of which by regular means adds to the general prosperity of the society to which he belongs this is an undoubted and indisputable fact to which every person assents owing to the self-evidence of its truth and which must be still more strongly imprinted on the mind of every one who has been in the habit of seeing the manner in which slaves perform their daily labor their indifference and the extreme slowness of every movement plainly point out the trifling interest which they have in the advancement of the work i watched two parties laboring in the same field one of free persons and the other of slaves which occasionally though very seldom occurs the former are singing joking and laughing and are always actively moving hand and foot whilst the latter are silent and if they are viewed from a little distance their movements are scarcely to be perceived even if brazil had only to depend upon its slaves for the increase of its agriculture and population it would still be better for that country in the main to put a stop to the introduction of africans but in that case although its advancement would necessarily be progressive it would be slow every african who enters the country is an enemy of which the state is sanctioning the introduction besides brazil is not in want of them and even if that country made the greatest possible use of every individual whom it at present possesses which it does not and yet urgently and necessarily required an additional number of hands to continue the cultivation of the lands the transportation of africans is the worst manner of obtaining them even in a political point of view if however upon africans alone 
its advancement was to depend many years must pass before any great change would be seen in its riches and power and consequently in its progress to the rank of a great nation brazil is however in a far different situation her free population is numerous and the time seems to have almost arrived when this part of the community would take its proper place in society in spite of existing regulations footnote i met with the following passage in a work of high and deserved reputation the romans notwithstanding their prodigious losses and the incessant wars which they carried on for centuries never experienced any want of men in the early periods of the commonwealth but were even able to send colonies abroad out of their redundant population afterwards in the time of the emperors when the armies were generally kept in camps and garrisons where a soldier is perhaps the healthiest of all professions the roman population in italy had greatly diminished and was visibly declining every day owing to a change in the division of property and to the pernicious and monstrous increase of domestic slavery which had left the poorer classes of free citizens without any means of subsistence but public charity essay on the military policy and institutions of the british empire by c w pasley captain now colonel in the corps of royal engineers note to page five o five in the work in which the note appears it is introduced for the purpose of proving that the total average population in any country can never be affected by the annual number of deaths but depends solely and exclusively upon the means of subsistence afforded to the living i have transcribed it inasmuch as the author of it states that domestic slavery was one of the causes of the decrease of population in italy and though the pernicious effects of slavery do not act to the same extent in brazil it does undoubtedly prevent the rapid increase of the numbers of the people of color and if the trade in africans continues much longer it will tend to stop the increase altogether of the persons of mixed blood that the increase of the free population of color ought to be encouraged no one will deny they are the pillars of the state the bulwark from the strength of which brazil becomes invincible Close footnote. so much do i imagine this to be the case that i think the abolition of the slave trade would scarcely be felt at pernambuco after the first moment and even any sensation which might be caused would rather be produced artificially than necessarily the rich slave owners would immediately rival each other in the purchase of the africans who might happen to be on sale and thus an increase of price would be produced but the number of free persons is quite adequate to fill up any vacuum which it is supposed would be caused in the country by a stop being put to the supply of the important part of the population constituent as society is in civilized states the poor must depend upon those who are sufficiently wealthy to give them employment and again the latter must depend upon the former for the execution of their projects but the situation of brazil excludes the lower ranks from the aid of those who are above them and deprives the rich of the assistance which they might receive from the labor of the poor the peasant is under the necessity of planting for his own subsistence without possessing the capital which is requisite for the undertaking if the crop fails he remains totally destitute the exertions of a number of individuals each occupied singly in clearing and cultivating separate plots of land cannot accomplish so easily or with so much perfection the work which might be done by the united efforts of the same number of persons even if the slave trade was to continue for a considerable length of time the natural order of things would probably have their course and free laborers would be employed upon every well-regulated estate conjointly with the slaves the lower ranks of people would become too numerous for each family to be able to possess a sufficient quantity of land for its own support and this would oblige them to hire themselves to those who could afford to pay them the planters would see the advantages of hiring their workmen and thus without any care or attention to this important subject by the government of the country would the labor of free men be admitted by the separation of labor into small spots of cultivated ground if cultivated it can be called as is practiced at present great portions of land are wasted 
and only a few families can possibly exist upon the extent of surface each working for itself which would give bread to a much greater number of persons if they were employed conjointly if the labor was paid for by one who wished to obtain a good crop from the land could pay for the work which was requisite and give the necessary attention to its culture this would bring together and render useful to each other the first class of people who enjoy considerable wealth and the third class who do not possess anything the second class consisting of small planters who live comfortably have a decent house three or four slaves a horse or two and some other trifling property would not be affected in the least by this change in the application of labor of the class which is immediately below them the secondary people who cannot afford to increase their number of slaves and yet are not able to accomplish their objects in planting with those which they possess frequently hire free laborers under the present system the labor of free persons is not placed to the greatest advantage their time is misemployed in performing alone with great difficulty what would be done easily if several persons were occupied together this is particularly apparent in a new country where the obstacles which are to be surmounted in preparing lands for culture are so numerous and of such magnitude if a man is aware that the obtaining of his daily bread depends directly upon the exertions of each day it is probable that he will be careful in making use of the present moment and not put off until the morrow what will so materially benefit him and as he knows that his comforts depend upon his regular exertions he will be more inclined to go through his daily occupations with punctuality but if his gains do not correspond with the work which he does daily the probability is that some carelessness will be perceived and he will from trifling causes delay the performance of a task until a future moment the hire which a laborer in the service of another man receives is only rendered to him if he has performed his allotted work otherwise the time is lost no good fortune no lucky season can reclaim it but if his profits are expected to be meted to him rather from the richness of the land which he has cultivated from a favorable season from the excellence of the seed or from these causes combined or from others which are not under his control he will more willingly stay idling at home or accept an invitation to a merry-making labor is not pleasant men in general work from necessity and therefore some stimulant is requisite to urge them to exertion this occurs in any climate and holds good still more frequently in one which naturally inclines to the indulgence of indolent propensities footnote i am aware that this is not the case with all nations but although it may not be correct when speaking generally its application to the people of whom i am treating will not i think be found to be erroneous Close footnote. if all men were free the capital which is required in the establishment of a plantation or the great exertions which under existing circumstances must be used to answer the payments which are to be made for the property obtained on credit would not be so necessary or at any rate the experiment of entering into schemes for planting would not be so dangerous as it is at present if the chief expenditure was not incurred in property which is so precarious and at the same time so valuable as slaves in the purchase of any other description of livestock to speak in creole language the risk lies in diseases of the body only and in those alone to which bodies they are inured to the climate are subject but you transplant the negro from his native soil which to him is the best in the world and you have his wounded and desponding mind to heal the vexations and privations which he must undergo are to be combated his mind as well as his body must be kept in health or little service will his master receive from him the loss which is occasioned by untimely deaths would not if free men were employed thus fall directly upon the planter the time which is passed by the runaway slave in the woods or residing in temporary freedom at some distant village would not be so much property unemployed the expenses attendant upon sickness and the loss of time proceeding from the same cause would be incurred by the patient and the place of one individual would be occupied by another the constant anxiety of the planter which is caused by the habits of his slaves and from other reasons inseparably connected with the system by which one man rules a body of his fellow-creatures who are at the same time his property 
would be removed. The owner of an estate might have some rest. His attention need not be entirely given up to the management of his affairs, which must now be the case, if he has a wish to advance his fortune, and a due regard for the preservation in an able state of the beings through which means this is to be accomplished. Too true it is that men become callous to the constant round of intelligence which is communicated by the manager, of slaves sick, blamed by accident, making their escape, etc., and the accounts of their recovery and return are received with the same unconcern. Punishment is ordered for crimes and misdemeanors with the same insensibility. All these things, of course, and as such, are endured quietly. In a country which is afflicted with the dreadful disease of slavery, cruelty is frequent, and whilst the punishment of misdemeanors which have been committed against the master are generally immediate and proportioned to their bearing upon the interests of the superior, it is difficult to compass the chastisement of great crimes against the community. It is the interest of the master to conceal from the superior authorities those actions of their slaves which might subject them to the loss of their services. Instances have occurred in which the law itself has swerved from its direct line of justice, that the owner might not be injured by the execution or transportation of the slave. It is for the benefit of the wealthy man, who ought to be the dispenser of justice, to act contrary to what it is his duty to do, to counteract the principles of rectitude, to screen from their deserts the evil deeds of a great portion of the population of the country in which he resides. He is silent concerning his neighbor's property, that like forbearance may be practiced towards himself if he should require it. But the crimes which slaves commit without the knowledge of their masters are those which, although they may be afterwards known to the owners, have been committed without their concurrence, are not the only evil actions into which this class of men may be led. The owner himself, who has not the courage to revenge his own quarrels, may command that his purpose shall be accomplished by one of the wretched individuals over whom he rules. This has absolutely happened. The general tendency which is produced by slavery, taken in every point of view, is to rouse all the bad qualities of him who rules and of him who endures. By this system a government permits the demoralization of its people, and that the property of its subjects be laid out in a most disadvantaged manner. A great number of individuals must be supported whose benefit to the state is much decreased by the situation in which they are placed, and another class in society is prevented from taking its due share in the general advancement of the country. End of section 14. End of Travels in Brazil, Volume 2, by Henry Coster, with the exception of Chapter 9, The Treaties of Friendship and Alliance, and of Commerce and Navigation, between the crown of Great Britain and Portugal, signed at Rio de Janeiro on the 19th of February, 1810, and this work's appendix.